for six years. One of the things that I wanted to do is make sure that, that myself as a new director and the staff were really in sync with what the board wanted us to be doing and you know have good dialogue about things uh, you know, on a pretty substantive basis to make sure that we're in good communication, we're doing what you expect of us, and we've got good things going on. So that was where sort of the, the genesis of this annual sort of full day workshop came through. It was just a good point for us to really informally touch base. There's no action at this meeting. Um, it is open to the public. I don't see anybody out there, but um, just to kind of touch base, go through, through some things. And uh, at the end, we've got sort of an open dialogue on anything that you think we ought to be focused on. And again, just a great opportunity to get to know each other a little more, especially because we have 40 board members uh, this year that we didn't have last year. So that's all I have is some introductory remarks. Uh, we got plenty of breaks uh, built in um, and uh, hopefully they'll take quite as long. So I don't think some of these will take the full time. We've got a lot of the agenda. So um, that's it. But again, I really appreciate it. It means a lot to us as the staff to make sure we're doing what you all expect of us. So anything for you, Mr. Nickel? No, thanks for everyone showing up. I appreciate everybody's participation and everybody getting together. And I think most importantly, it's just great to see everybody's face. Cool. So with that, the first thing we get to uh, subject you to, uh, Vaughn, <laughs> is uh, your required annual board and commissions open meetings and open records training uh, that all boards and commissions are required to do. So we're going to knock that out. I think Chaz will get a pass since he's an elected official and he gets that training, I'm sure, from Adams County. So I think he'll be, uh, he'll be checked off as good. But uh, again, I know this is old uh, repeat for those of you who have been here before, but good stuff for the rest of you. And, uh, you know, before Pavon goes, just make sure that, that we really work hard to make sure we comply with all of those. We're very open. We advertise our meetings, we put them everywhere. So we'd like to think we're pretty good at that, but we'll knock this out and we'll go from there. So Pavon, thanks for making the truck out. We really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Dave. And uh, thanks everyone for having me. Um, for those of you who don't remember, my name is Pavon Nelson. Um, I'm an assistant attorney general um, with the transportation unit, and I'm here to work with you you folks on, on the job. And so today, um, I'm going to be going through the annual best practices training. Um, and under state law, um, boards are required to obtain training on certain issues every year. Um, and so today, I'm going to be briefly talking about your statutory powers and duties, um, briefly talk about conflicts of interest, and then discuss CORA, the Colorado Open Records Act, and the Colorado Open Okay, so under state law, um, these are some of the statutes that delineate what the Air and Alpha Board is about, what its duties are, what its powers are. Um, so under state law, um, the board has the following duties. It's to advise the director on aviation matters, to establish procedures for the administration and distribution of monies credited to the aviation fund, um, seek recommendations of the director for the distribution of monies, to establish policies for the growth and development of aviation in the state, to provide statewide aviation needs to be included in the Department of Transportation statewide transportation plan, um, and to set a budget for the position. Um, you folks also have the power of distributing certain federal funds under certain um, guidelines, which are delineated in this section of 4310 105. Um, also, you have the power to acquire by gift um, or eminent domain land, which, in your opinion, may pose a potential hazard to navigable airspace. Um, and so, if that happens, you have the power to do it and you know, drop that. I don't believe in the division's history we've ever um, executed any eminent domain to acquire land. I don't know that that's one of the obscure things you all are allowed to do, but I don't think we've ever. Let's start. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a neighbor to support. Okay. <laughs> okay. Awesome. <laughs> like, 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 awesome. You heard that we started recording. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> right. yeah. But again, it has to be a hazard to navigable airspace. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, so if, if you folks have any questions about your statutory powers or duties, just let me know. I don't want to blow too much on that since I'm sure you don't know. Um, the next topic is common of interest. Um, and under state law, board members who receive uh, no compensation under the per diem allowance, which is due, shall not perform an official act which may have a direct economic benefit on a business or under other undertaking in which such member has a direct 
or substantial financial interest. So under state law, you can't, should not perform a, a beneficial act, which would economically benefit the business substantially. Um, as or rather, would economically benefit a business in which you have a substantial financial interest. Under state law, there's a voluntary dis disclosure process that you can use to still engage in the official act. So first, you have to make a written disclosure to the Secretary of State, which adequately describes your financial interest. And then immediately before taking any vote or official action, you have to state on the record the fact and, and summarize the nature of your interest. Um, so that's sort of the state law on official conflict of interest. Um, but for sir, some of you folks who don't know, I, before joining the HS office, I was in commercial litigation um, with various law firms. So I come with things with a particular sort of perspective on mitigating litigation. Um, and so even though the conflict is, these are the co conflict of interest laws in Colorado, I think it's important of, and maybe it's a better practice to avoid the appearance of impropriety. Um, don't fall into the trap where you have to explain yourself. Um, so I would encourage folks to avoid the appearance of impropriety. And uh, perhaps a better approach is to abstain from taking official action if it's going to benefit you economically, just to avoid intentional litigation risks. When you say you, is that from July work for Denver National? For awarding a grant pretty, to Denver International, is what I kind of now, kind of just smart practice to not take away. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think it's also, you know, where you personally have a direct financial interest. In it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I understand that your organization may benefit from this, um, but, you know, if you're going to be talking to someone who may have to direct income from an action, I, you know, you can take the two step voluntary disclosure process, but I think a better practice is to avoid the Appears they're trying to try to stay in Pavon, and, that's historically been the board's uh, practice for any of our members who are airport directors or elected officials that represent an airport. They will we'll call out their abstention when we put something on the agenda. Okay. And the other thing that we do uh, is uh, every January we have a conflict of interest form that we have to decide the state and conflict of interest. They know at that time to keep us on file every year. Great. So we'll um, do that in January for all. All right, so let's move into CORA. Um, you know, in our country, in our state, um, we don't do policy making in secret. Um, and so CORA is one of the, the statutes that we have in Colorado to ensure government transparency. Um, and under CORA, it's the public policy of the state that all public records shall be open for inspection by any person at reasonable times, except at the state. And again, the purpose of this statute is to assure that the government are shielded, the government workers are shielded from uh, public eye. So let's talk a little bit about what that means. Um, so again, under CORA, all public records shall be open to, to inspection. So what's a public record? It includes all writings made and maintained or kept by, a, by the state, any agency, institution, nonprofit corporation, or use in the exercise of functions required or authorized by law. So writings under CORA is pretty broad and it covers almost emails, um, phone records, um, phone recordings, things like that. Um, made, maintained, or kept for the use of functions um, required by law. So keep those concepts in, in mind as we, as we go through that and I'll describe and then we're going a little bit more specificity. Um, under CORA, certain things are by statute not public records, and it's a long list that uh, a lot of it is relevant to the work we folks do. Um, but I wanted to highlight certain things. Um, work product prepared for, uh, for elected officials um, is not a public record, it can be um, withheld. Um, so if you're advising an elected official on sort of things, we, we can withhold it under CORA. Um, and certain information security plans and its reports are also not public records. Okay, so public record again, so public records, the definition is broad and it includes internal and external communications, um, such as that might take stack um, place between staff and board, between board members, between the board and members of the public, between the board and the agency. Um, and there's no limit. 
limitation on the means of communication. It includes hard paper documents, electronic records, uh, recordings. So it's very broad. That being said, uh, CORE was not intended to cover information held by a government official in a private capacity. So just because you're a board member doesn't mean that everything you produce is now a public record of CORE. Um, I have some examples of some cases, uh, Colorado Supreme Court cases, uh, discussing this. Um, the Witt case, they held that a personal diary wasn't a public record because it wasn't kept in the, in the commissioner's capacity as a county manager. Or you know, Denver publishing uh, explicit emails between government officials and not public records because they weren't intended for use in the performance of their public functions. Um, and in the Ritter case, uh, the governor's cell phone records weren't public records since they were paid by the governor's capacity. Um, so I, you know, I just wanted to highlight that just to, to indicate that core is fairly broad because it doesn't cover everything. Um, it's certain private document producing in your private capacity wouldn't be covered as a public record. Um, but that being said, you know, again, doing this from a litigation risk mitigation perspective, assume that that the documents you produce related to your work on the board are covered on the court, are public records, and would be subject to uh, uh, disclosure. I always tell clients, think because CORE exists, whatever you write anything, expect it to appear on the front page of the news. It could be disclosed. Does it cool. pass the front page test? Right, exactly. exactly. Um, even under CORE, even if something is a public record, uh, there is a basis to deny inspection under, under certain circumstances. If it's contrary to a state statute or order, um, or if there are reasons in the public interest, such as uh, law enforcement investigations or certain other things related to the statute. I want to highlight a few things um, that come up a lot in uh, core requests following CI. Um, one is the deliberative pro process privilege. Um, under this government privilege, um, communications between government officials can be protected. Um, essentially to protect the frank exchange of ideas and opinions um, in government decision making. Um, so this privilege, which would allow us to record documents under CORA, covers material that's pre-decisional, that is, you know, generated before an official decision is made and delivered, which reflects give and take of the consultant, consultative process. Um, is that limited to one-on-one -on -one or a broadcast position or, or discussion? So if it's between officials, uh, even if it's a large group, it could potentially be covered under the deliberative process privilege if it's pre-decisional, if, if folks are talking about the decision. Um, and it's um, and it's deliberately it's talking about that as you know, so it's not one on one multiple, but just has to satisfy those criteria. Um, yeah, and so if we assert this, um, your attorneys, me and, and my my colleagues, are going to have to produce a privilege on explaining why we hold these documents. Just to give you a background. Yeah, so real world, Yvonne, is if we decided to, let's call it a committee, to deliberate an issue or a specific task or, or what have you, then we could bring forth the outcome of that committee. It, are those records, I mean, generally when you do committees, sometimes you may have to do minutes yeah. or what have you, right? So then that's available, but we could actually meet. Now, the big question is, is does that have to be published that committee meeting you published um, that we're meeting as more than one board member, correct? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, so it, it, you've highlighted sort of a couple of issues. A, yeah, yeah, tension between CORA and right. the open meeting slot. Okay. Um, in the circumstances you're describing, if it's communications between board members, I think that's covered by the open meeting slot. Okay. And in that case, you have to publish notice. Yep. You have to publish <laughs> And we'll discuss that. Are you going to talk about open meetings? Okay. So, yeah. uh, so again, from a from a litigation risk, to mitigate litigation risks, assume 
under the Open Meetings Law, if you have these type of communications with other board members, that it's, it needs to be a public meeting, and there needs to be notice, and it needs to go to public meetings. But if, it's, if, you, if you created a document that said, here's our agenda for the year, and sent it out to us, and one of them was, you know, it was, it was draft, and you sent it out and said, hey, let's get into the eminent domain game. <laughs> so we, yeah. we can say, well, you know, yeah, yeah. let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah, but then, you know, that's, that's, good. that's a good point, Ken, because it's there are tensions between Cora and Open Meetings Law. Um, here on the side of not skirting the line or falling in a gray area, so assuming that's in circumstances. But we'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, all right. And another privilege that, that we can use to shield um, Cora documents is the attorney high privilege. Um, for those of you who don't know, the attorney client privilege protects confidential communications between clients and their attorneys that are being enforced in public any legal matters. Um, so, if you have a legal question and you come to the AG's office and you discuss it, that would be privileged and it would not be subject to disclosure. And would you have to post that though as under executive? No, under, right, if it was an executive. So you would post it saying that we are meeting with the attorney with you under this CRS provision that allows for executive. Right. Yeah, if it was sort of um, let's say you personally had a legal question that you wanted to run by me, right? Or you shot me an email. Yeah, that would be attorney high privilege. Gotcha. That would be protected under court. Okay. Um, but if the board wanted to get together and discuss legal issues with me or some of my colleagues, call an executive session. <laughs> And we'll talk about this other time, Carl. Sorry. No, no, I think this will get there. <laughs> my, my question is again, two of us follow the, the, the former where we meet with you under court, but not more than two. Right. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, this is a long way of saying if you have a legal question, you can always come to me. Um, and that will be protected under the privilege. So if the board is sort of meeting together, we need to do that in the executive session. Um, okay, and there are other reasons to, to deny it, but we talked about the main one. Um, under CORA, usually the person who requests documents can can ask for an explanation about um, why we're denying um, access to it. Um, so we'll have to explain our rationale when we decide to pull documents under CORA. Um, but again, with the exception of deliberative process claims, which I've talked about briefly, um, we don't have to produce a privilege law. And we don't have to create new documents um, to provide something to people who are interested. Sort of the difficult thing about Quora is we're supposed to produce documents within a reasonable time. And under the statute, that's presumed to be 3.2 days or less. Um, so that could be an issue depending on the scope of the request. Um, under statute, that period can be extended by 7 or 8 days under a finding of extenuating circumstances. Under statute, extenuating circumstances um, involve certain delineated things. The most common is that the request involves such a large volume of records that the custodian cannot reasonably prepare about the record within three days. Um, but if the person is requesting one document, you can't use extenuating circumstances to extend the time. Um, so this this is this is an issue for this comes up a lot in, in the transportation units for with CDOT because we get a lot of core requests. We have to do it at a very short amount of time. And oftentimes people request a very large amount of documents. Um, so we often have to ask for some scenario circumstances and extension and it becomes an issue. So that's sort of the, the drawback of core. It's very good in terms of government transparency, but it can often play a large burden on the agency and the board if people request a lot. Do you, because a lot of times that can be used as a weapon of a public agency, and I've seen this happen many times, I'm sure DIA, <laughs> and, and so what happens is can you, if there is a request like that, does the state of Colorado return and say, okay, if you want us to research this, then you're gonna pay an hourly rate or fee for our time to provide this information. And a lot of times when you respond that way, then they kind of shut it down. Yeah, so does so, Colorado do that? Yeah, I mean, okay. under statute, you, you can 
request fees yep. um, to, to progress the documents. Um, in my experience so far, the transportation unit we haven't done that, but it's really possible. Yeah. Um, and and like, like you said, it's, it can often be used as a cudgel. Um, so yep. I have in active litigation matters where we get hit with core requests almost any day. Um, so it's so cool. Um, that's, you know, so, but it sort of is what it is. Um, you know, um, the, the legislature as General Assembly has a public policy in a certain way, and that's just how we have to deal with it. So there are certain remedies that the statute lays out. Um, if access to documents is denied, the person who requests them can go to court um, and ask for the court to issue an order forcing the agency or the rule to release the documents. If they prevail, they'll be entitled in to court costs and reasonable attorney fees, um, which can get expensive if anybody just has to deal with attorneys and hire attorneys. Um, on the flip side, the agency uh, or the board can go to court itself and ask the court for an order saying that the documents are not um, subject to public disclosure. And under that, those circumstances, it wouldn't be any of these things. Um, so, you know, going back to your example again, you know, if someone comes to us, asks for documents, we ask for fees, we give them the documents, if they aren't happy, they can go to court. So there's a there's a bit of negotiation often that's involved before uh, just to avoid going to court and getting court enmeshed in those issues. With all that being said, um, <clears throat> here's sort of a few sort of practical takeaways I wanted to tell you before about Laura. Um, as I mentioned before, keep in mind that the materials um, produced may be subject to disclosure in Quora. Then think about it being posted on the front page. Um, and CDOT has certain document retention policies that I encourage folks to, to uh, look at those if they're interested and you can ask me uh, for help on that. If you receive a core request, um, please keep me in the loop. CDOT has a uh, Quora um, officer who often deals with receiving and then ensuring that core requests get sent to the correct people. Um, sometimes uh, we're not in, we're not kept in the loop sometimes. Uh, you know, if, if you receive a core request, just circulate it to me, um, just so I'm aware about it. Um, you'll often be required to search your records to see if you have documents responsive to the that core request. If you don't see anything that's responsive, and that's the end, and we'll let the, respond, the requester know that the responsive documents exist. But if responsive documents exist, you'll collect them and send them on to the core officer and me. Um, flag any issues that you're concerned about, if there's privacy issues, this record of requests, um, if you think it implicates any privileges or not, um, just so that we'll be aware. And then the core officer and the AG's office will request an extension if necessary, review the documents, and produce the ones that are core eligible. Um, any questions on core? Second bullet uh, makes the point that uh, keeping the AG in the loop, I'm assuming that there is never a an attorney client relationship developed for any of the board members in our official capacities? No, so so yes, so as, as a board member in your official, official capacity, we're your attorneys. Um, okay. So we represent you. And so yes, there would be an attorney client, client relationship and privilege that would attach to those communications. If there were an outside entity that came in and wanted to sue me for some reason, you know, on this board doing something. Would, would the state then uh, be considered my attorney? Yes. Okay. The AG's office would represent you. You got our back. That's right. I love it. That's right. But Blount, I have a question on this as well. Yes, sir. Um, so you talked about like there being a retention policy. Let's say emails are supposed to be deleted after five years or whatever. Right. What happens if you don't delete those emails and then people are requesting information for prior to that that you actually still have? You have to produce them. You do. Yeah. You can't just go press the lead. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so don't keep your stuff in one track. So, so again, that's, that's, that goes back to the concept of litigation, of litigation risk or mitigating litigation risk. Okay. If that happens, you just delete evidence that goes into destroying evidence. Right. Which will we'll get into okay. deeper issues. So please don't do that. Perfect. If it exists, just, just produce it and, and you know, we'll let the chips fall where they may. If there's a good 
is this person holding it or they're not happy. So, so, so just to be clear, is that we are obligated in our capacity, essentially emails or any kind of communication that we should keep that information for five years is what you're saying? No, so okay. my time is wrong. If I made up a five. Yeah, that was sort of a hypothetical. What's yeah. the what's the what's what's our obligation as in our capacity frame? I will have to get back to you. About okay. Specific. I I will forward you. See not some of the talking about that. And there's no uh, there's no color in terms of whether it's through our CDOT email address or our personal e email or business email address. If it has anything to do with our capacity, that's where we probably need to kind of set that into a folder just in case. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. And I know one thing regarding that, Ken, I know a lot of you have a state email address that forwards to your personal address Correct. as well. So I know CDOT has a policy that if it's in your CDOT email for a certain time period, it does delete it, I believe, over yeah. time. That's, yeah. I think, their policy. But if it goes to your personal email, I don't know. If, I mean, it's a completely separate record. That just would be good information to know when you get back to us just so we Thank God we don't really do anything right. that's highly controversial. So, yeah. One question on that too. Um, on our website, um, for instance, like this meeting and tomorrow's board meeting, uh, we record them and then I, I put those on the website, uh, including the minutes. Um, is it advised that we, once we figure out what that retention policy is, advised to just. The board is forever. Oh, it is forever. The board is forever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't remember. That's the one. Yeah. And I don't remember where a uh, specific email address is set up for, for each board member. Yeah. Okay. I probably but they just forward to your, you don't actually log into a state email. They just forward to whatever personal email address you get. And I guess the question is should should we be using just that state email address and not our personal? And that's why I went. I would say no because I think it retains it anyway when it goes to your state email address. So, so we don't have account. to worry about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll get you some of the document retention policy. Um, and if anyone has any further questions, uh, Laura, I'm here. You should be an email. I'm your attorney. That's privilege. Um, all right. So let's move to the open meetings law. Um, I think this is another another statute to ensure transparency in government. Um, and under, under the law, it's declared to be a public of, uh, matter of statewide concern and public policy of the state. The recommendation of public policy is public business and may not be conducted in secret. Um, again, transparency and allowing us uh, ensuring that citizens are aware of what their decision makers are doing. So, under the statute, a meeting is defined as any gathering convened to discuss public business in person, by telephone, electronically, or, or other means of communication. So, what we're doing now is a meeting. Um, if you call a board member on the phone, that's a meeting. If you shoot the uh, board member an email, that's a meeting. Um, if you meet with a board member in person over coffee, that could potentially be a meeting. So the open records law, the definition of meeting is, is broad. It includes any type of communication or any gathering to discuss public business. But the key is to discuss the business because if I wanted to go have a beer with Mark, just socially, there's nothing wrong with that. Correct. As long as we're not talking business. Correct. So in that circumstance, just don't talk business. And we'll talk more about what public business is okay. and all that. And chance social gatherings are considered meetings. Um, but you know, I just wanted to put that out there. It's fairly broad. Yeah. So, so I, I, you know, the, the definition of talking, I thought if it's one on one, um, and we have a, a discussion about um, about business, that that's different than if it's three of us to having having a conversation. Is there is there some differentiation on the number of people? It, it is, and 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 the slide. Okay. All meetings of two or more wow. members of a state public policy, at which any public business is discussed. Or which any formal action may be taken are that declared to be public meetings and open to the public at all times. That's interesting. A little bit uh, challenging. Let's say George invites all of us to take a tour of the IA. 
we're going through the new building and, and everything along that line. But the conversation pops up to, well, what do you guys think about this uh, your grant that uh, we're requesting for the new runway? Isn't that a, a formal meeting that, that we should not be doing? I mean, I guess I'm trying to get at the clarification. Yeah, that under the statute that will be considered. And with that, you would have to do a public notice, take minutes, all that. So if, I, if, if Dave emails the board, we have to do a public notice that he's shooting an email. To and that's where my question is, because we're having a lot of conversations yeah. by email. Right. And so I, I, I don't think Dave is a, a, he's not a member of the board. Um, it would be a meeting if, if two or more board members are just part of this. Oh, okay. But, I see what you're but, well, and also, too, that's where my role or our role is, is that Dave will have generally we will have conversations about upcoming meetings and, and you know to kind of keep things in order so we can manage our actual public meeting more efficiently yeah there's nothing wrong with that that's why you have our roles on the board i mean the majority of emails from dave are informational and going back and forth yeah. but but there has been conversation you know and where we've responded but it's it's cc to the entire board and so i'm right. curious because uh, on the school board that I'm on, that's a, you know, that's a no-no, so a yeah. big time no-no. That's so, so under the open meetings law, that if you, if you even if it's an email blasted out all the board meetings, if it's discussing public business, that would fall under the definition. So, yeah. So, so the line of demarcation here is yeah. informational versus you know, conversation. Yeah. And so again, to determine whether or not public business is discussed, of course, look at the policy making responsibilities and power of the board. So that goes back to my, my previous slide earlier on about what your statutory duties and powers are as board members. If the meeting or the discussion would touch upon that, potentially be a meeting to discuss public business that would be subject to the open meetings. So to be clear, though, is obviously if Dave is utilizing one board member to, as he's putting the agenda together, kind of sort some things out for actual business, that's fine. Um, yes. But he sends why um, mem mostly he's very good about sending all of us informational what certain airports doing, what George is doing, whatever it is. It's just informational that's in the media or the press. Generally speaking, that's all he's really doing when he sends emails to all of us at the same time, other than the agendas and the board packets. And actually, Caitlin does that. So, yeah. And so, I mean, so Dave, Dave, you know, he's the director of the division. Right. He's not a board member. He's just keeping you apprised of things that are going on. Right. That's not a meeting. I wouldn't listen to that. Right. For example, if, if, you folks say you and Shake and Trinity decide to go on a back and forth about a particular policy matter that's implicated in the agenda that could potentially fall under the open meetings law. Um, so just keep that in mind. And, and again, my perspective is mitigating potential litigation risks. So, you know, try to avoid gray areas. I know it's, it's difficult and, and, and the statute is very broad, but keep in mind that in those circumstances, it could potentially be considered. Um, subject for the fire code. Well, it's common sense. Is that what you're saying? We have to use common sense. <laughs> also, I, I mean, the, the, I'm sorry. And so I it stepped on you. You were going to answer his question. I apologize. I, well, I just was saying, I mean, Chip's example is not hypothetical, right? Like, we, I bring council members from the city of Denver out for tours to sure. the city of Denver. Or the city airport, and we've had two senators come from the airport. I think, you know, or, or we want to go see the remote tower. You know, there are a bunch of new board members, and we want to go and educate ourselves. I think we we should be able to do that. With or, or are we saying that if even two of us are involved, that we should notice that? Or, um, or is it more like, hey, let's have sun? You know. Like, have sunshine of the public in mind as long as we're not you know deliberating well how are you going to vote on this grant or that grant is coming up on the agenda we should be educating ourselves i just i'm trying to get a sense of where the bright line is so that we're not I mean, let's use the 
There are no calories in the gym. Which is a great example because that's a very practical right? one. Right? That we, we, ga we gather to go. Right. It's a guide for and, me to go and educate myself about the. And, and in those instances, oh, when we know you're all coming, we will notice it. Yeah. Okay. It's more of the just as a precaution. Right. Right. Yeah. It's more of the women in aviation event when three of you show up right. that right. we should notice that we don't know about. But that was she yeah. social encounter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and there we have to be careful. You know, it, it's an invariable in, in the remote tower example that we're going to talk about the implications of that and the other things that we that we're responsible for covering. So it should be. It, it, it should be, you're right, George, you know, we got to keep the sunshine for the public, so, you know, yeah. we just have to be careful. And I think it came in, whatever we said, I think that's, that's a best practice, that's, that's excellent, you know, you know, it's, it's relatively easy just to know there's something going on and to give a brief agenda, I, you know, we're going to DIA to look at the um, remote tower thing, maybe discuss that, that sort of initiative, just to make sure it's all open, and you know that, that there's no uh, open exec meeting spot issues. So I think that's a very good practice. If we do that, does yeah, technically does that mean that the public can attend? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you may have to invite that. themselves. Yeah. The only exception I think might be if you go back to a security issue where you have to get pre-vetted to go into a facility. Yeah. Uh, remote tower is not one of them yet. But, but I think we would have to or to go to DIA. Yeah, to go to DIA if you were going to do a you're going to go into a security sterile area or whatever, they're going to ask us for information. Yeah. Question about noticing: Is it acceptable under today's laws that Caitlin, if we're going to get together and go to Fort Collins or what have you, that the venue for posting that is on the website, on the official website? Is that acceptable? You don't have to put a little piece of paper on our front door here. Or... Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Online, it's, it's okay. It's, it's good. That's great. Yeah. We still do because she lives right down the street. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and internally as a staff, we do try to protect you guys with Cora. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of times where we'll ask Dave, like, hey, how many people are going there? And, yeah. and we'll have those conversations. Every sure. once in a while, we're like, shit, that's, that's <laughs> coming up soon. Yeah. yeah. We need to post it. Yeah. So, but those conversations do happen on our end of staff. That's <laughs> and that, that, that notice is a 24 hour requirement, yeah. right? That's Correct. 24 hours. So nothing less than 24 hours. Good. Or nothing more. Um, and I mean, going back to your sort of question, George, I, I, I know there's like, a lot of times it's a lot of bright line rules, but there's often a little bit of gray on either side. And that's why people got together. Right. Like, that's why we have the court system or whatever. Um, so it's, it's kind of, it's, it's not as, you know, my, my inclination would be just to, you know, if there's going to be a, a, a meeting of, of two or more folks and there's a, a situation where some public like policy matter involving the, the power will, will come up. A good practice just to notice that. But I have this, I have this slide a little bit to talk about how courts have described the line. Um, if there's a meeting to discuss a rule, regulation, ordinance, and formal action, that's a public meeting. Um, if there's a meeting held for the purpose of discussing a pender, pending measure or action, that would be a public meeting. Um, let's say uh, some of uh, the board members. There's a state agency that convenes a meeting uh, to discuss an issue that several of you attend. That's not a public meeting for your purposes because you are the ones that convene the meeting to talk about your particular issue. Um, and then another circumstance that's come up in the, in the case law is there's an email discussion between uh, the Public Utilities Commission members and the governor staff and legislative staff about a pending bill. Um, those were considered meetings because legislation or drafting legislation was at the tower of that particular um, So again, you know, going back to your the board statutes um, to talk about your power of meetings. Um, you know, if, if the meetings get touched upon one of those things, they, they potentially could be considered a public meeting. So keep that in mind. Okay, let's talk about notice a little bit. Notice needs to be full and timely. Um, it's it's interpreted, you know, in an objective matter in the light of an ordinary number of community. Um, the open meetings law imposes no requirement that specific advance notice be given or formal actions are not taken. Notice is sufficient as long as items actually considered at the meeting are reasonably related to the subject matter indicated in the notice. And the posting must occur no less than 24 hours prior to the meeting. Notice should include the date and time, the location, the agenda, and the 
specific gender information they want. Minutes. Um, minutes should be prepared for all meetings and open to public review. Um, and minutes uh, of meeting during which an executive session is authorized shall only reflect the topic of the executive session. And again, this goes back to what we discussed earlier. Email discussions between members uh, regarding public business are, are subject to public discussion. Under CORA. Okay, so executive session. Um, an executive session is a meeting of the board without the public. It can only be used for discussions of specific topics. No formal action can be taken during the executive session. And it, it serves as an exception to the public business law. An executive session is limited, and, and, and the board can only discuss topics that were announced during the open public. Certain examples of topics that can be in the executive session conferences with an attorney representing the state public body concerning disputes um, that are subject of pending or imminent court action. Matters required to be kept confidential under federal law or, or state law. Um, details of security arrangements and investigations. Um, determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations with employees or employee organizations. Um, and <coughs> issues concerning the uh, dismissal, discipline, promotion, promotion of uh, a public official in the state. Um, so, again, from, from my perspective of, of reducing risks, um, I think. The board should consider executive sessions to be the exception rather than the rule and only use for specific issues. You know, if there's pending litigation and, and you want to discuss it with me or any other issue attorney, that could be a, an appropriate thing for um, an executive session. But you know, I don't I don't want the board to get up any hot water in uh, the open, open meetings law. So you know if, if you think an executive session is necessary. Let's discuss it beforehand. Um, let's consider it for the exception rather than the rule. If so, comes right over the last six years, the only thing we've done an executive session for is my review and the review of all of you. Donald, is there um, an electronic recording requirement for executive sessions? Yes. Yeah, so, is that coming? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, well, you're ahead. All right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, again, um, you know, they're confidential, the attorney client privilege is especially confidential, but executive sessions are open in yeah, our yeah. discussion with the attorney. And, and, and how, how is, where does that recording go? I don't know what we do with our school board, but where, how, how, is, how is that, how is that uh, archived? So the executive session uh, comes to me on an MP4 file that I keep in a folder and then after it expires, yeah. I yeah. And what's that? 30 days, 90 days? Again, I don't, I don't know. Uh, typically, it's been 60 before we come on with our executive sessions. That's I'm, I'm only asking that's for awesome. my other role, yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> well, me too. <laughs> so but I think your advice so is good. Cool. Anytime, I, I, same thing. I mean, I think we, anytime we are contemplating, it is an exception. Anytime we are doing an executive session, it's always coordinated through the attorney. Right. That's the best way to do it. Because yeah. you want to specifically list the CRS code associated with that when we do post it on our agenda. That's, that's you're absolutely right. Okay. Um, okay, and again, in the executive session, um, adoption of any policy um, or formal action cannot be taken. And no additional matter, matters other than that what was discussed in the order can happen. Okay, so what was not a meeting? What what does not count as a meeting? Chance meeting? Social gatherings at which discussion of public business is not the central purpose. Or other events in which public business is not the same purpose. So again, just you know, meeting up for coffee, where it's not public business is not the same purpose of the probably not public business. Well, the chair. awesome Colorado Operators Association meeting in Telluride. Right. Right. Um, but it was posted. It was posted. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, attending your daughter's play. Not not a um, let's keep that in mind. If it's just a chance of gathering, it's fine. But again, just best practice if you think public business is going to come up, um, if they think you're going to be discussing if there are powers of the board or policy that falls under the board's power, it might be just be safe, be on the safe side. In a 
parking lot driving a big blue car. <laughs> um, there are certain consequences that can attach if Bill Bunini's law is not followed. Um, a decision of the board can be invalidated by the board. Um, potential removal from the board. Um, there's negative publicity or litigation. Um, and all the costs associated with that. And then the release of otherwise confidential information. For example, joint executive session that was improper, what was discussed during that executive session will be subject to disclosure. Um, so, so again, there are consequences that can attach if the law is applied or is it followed. So be on the same side. Um, and you know, if you think public business can be discussed between two, two or more of you, it would be the safer and better practice to make sure that that meeting is noticed and the public has an opportunity to attend. Okay, I talked about a lot. Um, sorry it wasn't that exciting, but I think it was <laughs> educational. Um, if, if you have any questions, um, just let me know. I'll move around. Um, thank you, Alex. Thank you. I'm curious, have you ever seen a complaint from the public? on a chance meeting, overhearing a conversation. Has that happened before where someone has I haven't seen that and I haven't seen any case case law yeah. like that. Um, okay. Not that we could do it. I just yeah. thought that'd be interesting. I will say if you do if any of you do happen to get in your role as board member of an official core request, please send it to me yeah. so I can keep CDOT's core officer in the loop because they track all of those and track the timelines and set this reminders and do all of that. We don't I think we've only gotten two or three formal core requests here. We get lots of requests for informal things like how much money did you give to Telluride last year for fuel disbursements? That's not a core request, we just respond. But we did get a detailed one through a CDOT channel about the grant in Erie. They wanted to see everything related to a specific product and through drawdowns, checks, and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So um, we don't get very many of those here. Most of them are just informal requests for data that's just pointed to the website or send it to them. So yeah. we're not taking they were very uncontroversial relative to a lot of the rest yeah. of the state government. Yeah, and, 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 and if you get any sort of court, sure. please report it to me too, yeah. just so I can be in the loop and, and make a stink if I get some. I know I see it very, a lot more regularly. Just this is not one for all. So yeah, I'll check and make sure. Yeah, right. okay. It's 90% of the time we don't have to do anything with it. We might have one mm -hmm. place or less that I'm looking for, but it's, it's definitely a lot more common just with. Not that, not that gotcha. So, okay. Um, I'll talk to you. That was great. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I'm, so, I was the core officer at the airport. And it's really fascinating to see. When you think about core, you think about you know, Denver Post and media organizations, but I've been fascinated to watch how Cora has become almost a, a fishing tool for legal and, and, and businesses, you know, look for opportunities and trying to figure different things out. I don't think the public really understands how much work goes into just sort of responding to companies that are fishing for information using the core. One hundred percent. And even even in pending litigation I have. Yeah. In litigation you have the discovery process and there's a process to get the information from your side. A lot of times our adversaries just do core. I want it in three days. Give me all the documents, give me all the emails, directories, ads from this particular time frame. And you're just, you're just sitting there and you're just sat there as well. It's like, I'm just trying to finish the finishing book. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, we're about out of time. So we have guys programmed for a break until 10 30. If you've got to get to call, check emails, all over the restroom. Sorry, sorry. I got required. That was going on. I got a text for that. That's hilarious. Yeah. You will, baby. Coming down the pipe. Well, you know, up in the San Juan. Yeah. Now that we're thinking about it, yeah. 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 Y
So we'll jump right into the agenda. I think the first thing we have up um, is an update uh, and a briefing from Bryce on our revenue forecasting model. Um, I know we've got several, again, new board members. Um, the way we come up with the revenue forecast that we share with all of you that you're going to approve every January um, is not just something we pull out of the hat. There's actually a lot of data and analysis that goes in behind the scenes to try to make it as accurate as we can. Um, which is our biggest challenge because everything we do is based on our revenue. And unlike an airport, we don't have any direct control over our revenue. It's strictly influenced by outside uh, factors. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Bryce and he'll kind of run through with you how we track and uh, forecast our revenue. Uh, and that will tie into all the statewide initiatives, budget amendments we're going to talk about and things like that. So Bryce, sure. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dave. Um, so just as I go through here, if you have questions, please just let me know. I know there's a lot of data out there, but what I did this year as we rolled into the new fiscal year is kind of revised the workout uh, warehouse. So I have pretty much all of our forecasts and stuff on one sheet. So that's why there's so much, not all of it's super relevant, but I'll just kind of touch on it here. Uh, as you know, our biggest driver of revenues is sales tax from fuel generating at Denver International. Uh, in, in the background, we have a time where we put all the sales tax numbers in for all airports every month, and all the excise tax. And so there's a constant flowing percentage of what that number is. Uh, in the last calendar year, it's been about 74%. The board's been as high as 78%. It makes sense with COVID that commercial traffic was down, GA traffic was up in many spots. So the, the percentage went down. The model reacts to that as it happens, basically. So as it projects that out, it takes that factor into it. But when it comes to actually, okay, what do we think it's going to be? We take that big chunk and use that to, to drive the forecast. So that's where a lot of this is coming from. Uh, the team at Denver is, is awesome. They're, they're always willing to get the information and data. So they send me uh, kind of their projected flight departures here, you know, month over month trending. So I can watch that as well. We don't have that specifically tied into anything yet, but it's good information <coughs> on kind of building uh, relationships into potentially future forecasts as well as just try to make it more accurate. Uh, the, the, where we do get the numbers from that we do use right away on short-term forecasts is from uh, the fuel providers at Denver, uh, basically the pipeline company there. They send me every month, hey, this was last month's actual fuel flow. This is what we're projecting for the month ahead. Uh, I'm working with a contact there since they had some turnover who's trying to get me more data into the future. Like I said, once, once we have that, I'll start analyzing, okay, how accurate is it? How can I implement it? But from a short-term perspective, we get that pretty good. So that's what typically our, our, our last forecast that we would give you, you see from the every month on the reports, they're usually pretty close unless there's a reason for a variance. And I always kind of outline that. Uh, the other big driver obviously is fuel prices. Uh, when I started the division here a little over five years ago, one of the first things I did was kind of do an analysis of the EIG forecast data that's put out towards historical accuracies. And we can kind of identify some trends of, you know, long-term roughly 13% overvalued to what the market has been. So we have really those numbers kind of built in on column F here, you'll see a few different color codings um, for short-term revenues, we just use, okay, this is what the fuel revenue or the jet price fuel forecast is for three months out. We just kind of use that number. For months four to six, we take their number and actually take six and a half percent off of it. The forecast, so we're leaning on that conservative side. And then six months out and longer, we actually take the 13% off of what they're forecasting. Again, historically since 1983, that's the number that they're typically over projecting. Uh, and then they are historically slow to react. You've already heard me say this in board meetings. Yeah, hey, oils. Well, we had it a year ago, well, a year and a half, I guess, back in March when it hit negative for a day. Um, you know, it was down in the 20s and 30s. And so then when they forecast, they're saying, okay, it's going to take three years until we're back at $60 a barrel. We know that didn't happen. And it's not super plausible at that point, but. We still use the data slip that they're putting out and then any qualifications we have on that, we kind of, we relate to the board. Uh, so essentially we have that kind of conservative nature already built into the forecast. 
And that's where, when we do see a downturn, oil all of a sudden drops $20 a barrel in a week. Okay, yeah, it's a problem, but we're not scrambling because we've already forecasted that out. Hey, okay, we're, we've already got that buffer built in. And then, you know, a little history lesson, the reason we do that, so we never run into issues with our revenues all of a sudden collapsing where it's, it's catastrophic if you can't recover from it. Even when COVID happened, uh, we were pretty quick on it. We jumped on it, communicated out to you guys what, what the plan is going to be from a forecast perspective. Uh, and then Todd and his team had all the hard work of adjusting their grant programs and stuff like that. Uh, and when we talk about forecasting, we do have that kind of worst case. And I know we'll get to that later with the contingency. Um, I will just reemphasize, we've all heard me say it before, we can't build a forecast ever planning for an event like COVID because we would have such a ridiculous cash balance on that. It's, it's just not plausible. So we do have our worst case forecast, which is like uh, 35 million gallons of flow in Denver each month of fuel and $40 barrel of oil, which it's not super plausible long term for that to be there, but that's where we have it set up so we can make plans. As far as forecasting revenue, like I said, we track our forecast accuracy, uh, the flow month over month, so year over year, when you see those numbers. Uh, right now, kind of a key one to look at here is, is the logic. Typically, we just roll with month over month trends. You know, December came in at this, we know historically it's dropped a little bit in January. We have the percentages all tied based on the historical data. And it's gonna drop even more in February, we're gonna see that jump in March. Then we get the April jump in May, jump in June, jump in July. Uh, so we use that on a normal period we did for years there. And I know the one year we were within a percentage and a half of what we had forecast. It was the only quote unquote normal year we've had in the last five. Um, but what this allows us to do, and the reason I have these kind of color coded, because of COVID, we had to change that up. You know, we were talking about, hey, this is this is the numbers we're getting. We think it's going to come back quicker, but we're still going to show this number. And that did happen. Uh, even when we had the model say, okay, we're going to hit $12 million in revenue last year. That's what it was telling us in October after nobody had flown in the summer. We kept saying, well, it's probably going to come up. So I do apply logic to that as well with the data, which too good or which too bad kind of thing. Um, and it did come back faster than anticipated. Uh, so for the rest of this fiscal year, we've kind of, I've left the forecast basically showing 75% of 2019 number flow at Denver International. I said at the start, that might be a little optimistic, but then we kicked into that in March, I believe, and it was closer to 60 or whatever it was. Uh, but I, yeah, right here, there, you know, we were in the 68, 62, 65. But the last couple months here uh, in June, they were about 80% of flow. July, it was 85. Uh, they were forecasting for this month that they're back to 94% of fuel flow in Denver that they were in 2019, which is, is incredible. Um, so I, I know those numbers are outpacing the way we have our forecast, but again, that would be the whole Delta variant and everything like that. So we're leaving it at that through this calendar year, uh, that's 75%. So I suspect that the short-term revenues here are gonna be a little higher than we're forecasting and then we're fine with that we just don't want to have to keep moving it every month right now the plan is once january hits as long as there's no big swing in the fuel flow we'll go back to the month to month trending we'll basically wipe 2020 off the map we'll wipe 2020 21 off the map and go back to the historical trending that we had seen from the previous years as far as okay january to february flow is this and you guys see that data on the financials that I put out every month where we kind of have the last three years. Uh, and the consistencies were remarkable uh, month to month. I mean, there's, I think in the three year data points we had from 2016 to 2018, there was one month that didn't follow the month trend. And it was, uh, hmm. it, it dropped a little bit instead of going up a little bit. Other than that, I mean, they were perfectly linear. Uh, different percentages, but up and down, they were pretty, pretty consistent. So it's a great, great way to look at it. We plan to go back to that as soon as it makes sense. If this changes and it's like, well, we're not seeing the month here, we did see that drop, I'll communicate any changes that we have with that, obviously. Um, by next summer, we'll, they're, they're adding 39 gates there. Yeah. Uh, air, yeah. Airlines are, I, I know I've been freaking out about uh, TSA lines. I don't know if you remember. 
how does that factor in into your forecasting or your scouting? No, so the great thing when that happens, uh, obviously, let's, let's pretend it's a world where all of a sudden there's 40 gates open. Mm -hmm. So let's say it happens in, in March, you know, or February to March, instead of going from here to here, it's going to go from here to here. The great thing about the model going month for month is it's then going to take that data point and it's not going to drop down here to compare. It's going to, it's going to extrapolate again that, okay, March to oh, April, right, up or down. Yeah. So that's where having it percentage based. So, yeah, there will be one month where I don't capture. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but then I'll come to you guys and say, okay, our revenue was up fifteen percent higher than I thought it was. Here's why: <laughs> yeah. the fuel at Denver yeah. is going nuts. That's the logic <coughs> behind it. Uh, so right away, once we move that month to month, it's going to capture that immediately. Uh, if I was ever to modify something, I'd like it was uh, said back in two thousand nine, the division. United had been filing it correctly. The division had a, basically a check cut to over about $10 million from United on sales tax that hadn't been collected. Something like that happened. Obviously, I'm not going to have the forecast. All right, we're up here now. Let's keep going. Uh, we would adjust that and then add that context if there's anything unusual like that. Usually, those filing catch ups that happen are very small, you know, maybe, maybe $10,000 of impact, which really doesn't show up on here. Um, the airlines are a lot better now. I know back when I started in Southwest, especially, you would sometimes about file in a month. So you'd have the, the big swings. And, and then from a cash balance perspective, and our, our cash balance used to do that with those because it was inconsistent. I, when we give you guys the cash balance on there, we adjust it somewhat. If Denver has a cash check that we set up for sales tax, that could swing the balance one to two to sometimes two and a half million dollars itself. So we always make sure, okay, why is our cash balance a million dollars high? They have a cash That's check. Here's what the check is, adjust that source so an actual cash balance and not having to say, okay, this is why, and showing that kind of peaking valley. And that $10 million windfall sounds like a great deal, but it's really not. Mm -hmm. I mean, we should have caught that, and you know, that was before any of this. We should have caught that, and honestly, yeah. if they would have caught that, and realize that that's why they got the $10 million. The crash that happened with the division's finances in 2016 right. would have happened in 2009. It was pure luck. <laughs> that's that's all that in. was is using sort of the limited state of execution. Yeah, because that's when oil oil prices plummeted yeah, again right. and the adjustment hadn't been made to see it coming, but they had $10 million cash influx that they weren't counting on, so that they didn't through that lesson, that. So Bryce, clearly you do have an excellent um, partnering with D with Den yep. on this. So if that same scenario were to happen again between you and Den, you probably would have caught that scenario, correct? With those airlines? I track every single month okay. at Denver, all of the filings from each individual fuel provider. Okay. And then if something is missing or looks wonky and you'll see i have a few of them highlighted here yeah i touch base with the department of revenue uh every yeah. february usually because that's when the previous calendar year's numbers are through and say i've got this issue this issue this issue this company had it. this vendor hasn't filed this one uh and, and basically get them looking into it i i don't have the ability to change, no, change I, southwest for example and try to find one um so i Every month, it's right here. Every month. So basically, that's it. what you're doing is you're essentially auditing exactly those figures yeah, so you good. can collect those. Precisely. So, um, can you, for all of our purposes, can you give us a little bit of background as far as how we collect our revenue? Is you know, I know there's the percentage sales tax, and then there's a per gallon. And yep. So can you kind of we get do that uh, again. Our, our biggest income yep. driver is sales tax, uh, which is two point nine percent of fuel sales, but commercial fuel sales, unlike a lot of states, commercial airlines are not exempt. And that is why we have such a healthy funding model that other states are a lot of the envy of. Uh, so again, that, and that's where Denver is obviously the big driver of that. The other revenues we get from fuel sales tax is uh, six cents per gallon on avgas that's, mm -hmm. that's sold. Of that six cents a gallon, four cents it goes right back up the door to the airports. And of that sales tax collected, 65% goes right back to the airports. And then the, the third one is uh, abject fuel uh, for GA and private and things like that. Of that, we get collect four cents per gallon. All four of that goes right back up the airport. 
You mean aviation fuel, 100 mobile jets? Yes. Okay, not average jet. Okay. Out, out jets, how it's reported. Okay, so it's four <laughs> cents for 100 mobile jets, six cents for, uh, for, uh, yes. for, for jet. Yeah. No, six no, cents backwards. Okay, backwards. six yeah. cents for ad gas, four cents for jet, yeah. plus we get the sales on jet of 2.9%. <clears> Correct. <throat> now, on the 2.9%, is that on that fee, basically the wholesale price? Yeah, the 2.9%, yep. so that's, and that's where, obviously, the price of fuel factors into that. Yep. Uh, but that's where the amount of gallons flowing out is the biggest factor. Uh, and then we tie in the average jet fuel cost uh, into that. So that, that revenue coming in is, is, is the more. So the 2.9% the on each gallon of gas. No, my, my point is, is that on that fee, obviously, that's, that's what the actual airlines are paying. So there probably is a slight retail aspect to it but you know that it, my question is is that 2.9 percent to wholesale price mm -hmm. that's sold to airports or is it the 2.9 percent of the, the retail price that's charged to the end user? Yes. The retail price. Yeah. okay so that's the airline price which is unbelievably low because yeah. that's something i just aha moment now that i sell fuel is the fact that um because we have two aspects we have our retail price and then we have our contract price through our fuel provider. Well, they only pay sales tax <laughs> on the actual con their cost basically mm -hmm. because, and then the rest of it's the into plane fee that the individual airport will do, and that's not taxed. Correct. Okay. That's great. I mean, that's interesting. So, so Bryce, the, the, this model is cool. I mean, it's, you can tell it's very robust, yeah. and it's tracking the eight hundred pound gorilla. What about the other 25% or so of, of Avgas and Jet that sold it um, at Jet A that sold it at all the other airports in um, Colorado? Are you tracking and predicting, make, using the same kind of model to make pr I'm, predictions I'm, on what's happening? I'm, I'm or not, simply because that- it doesn't, it's, not re it, it, it's not relevant enough? It's not relevant enough. Um, and, and that's risky. I am indirectly in that when we put in, uh, Tony does, the bulk of all this work, you know, she'll she'll put in the exact amount that each kind of airport got in Avjet, Avgas, sales yeah. tax for the month. We have all that data coming in, and that's where we get that percentage. Okay, Denver sales tax is X percent of our rent. As that ebb and flows, that's built into this. You're just applying it to the other. Yes. So we use the one that that I watched like a hawk there, like I said, every vendor yeah. and stuff, because that's 75% of the driver. The other 25% or whatever that percentage is. That adjusts, you know, like I said, Colorado Springs all of a sudden is pumping out 30% of our revenue. Obviously that Denver percentage is coming down, but the way that it applies that logic from the Denver forecast revenue to our forecast of sales tax, yeah. it would automatically capture that. Okay. Now I have had airports every once in a while, actually half of this month, um, I don't like which one it was, but they had an abnormal amount of sales tax come through and they'll reach out to me and, and they're like, what, what happened here? So I, I can easily pull up and do that same kind of thing. What it was is Alpine Wings basically hadn't filed with them for two years. So they had exactly. two years of the filings come in. I mean, it was $6,000, but to them, when they're usually getting $250, that's a big jump. Uh, so that was one to, to catch there uh, for sure. Again, so whenever they reach out, they're getting a lot better. If something looks weird, just shoot me and hey, this is right, and then I can investigate. And the pricing estimates that you're getting, you get, get those from the fuel uh, fuel providers, right? The, I don't. Lady, right? The, the we don't actually use the price of fuel in the model. We use the price of jet fuel coming in just to track that as we forecast future prices. Yeah, that, and that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, about. and that comes straight from the EIA forecast, the, the federal. Okay, okay, that's my question. You, you have it at uh, a broader independent uh, yes. or nationwide yeah. and, um, and that's what model. Said, model. And, then, and again, when, okay. we, when we use that, you know, I did the analysis years ago over the last 20 years, how accurate it was, so that we can apply that logic and build that conservative nature of the forecast. We don't have any regional anomalies, I guess, in that in that forecasting. That's that answers. We have, and, and again, because it's sales tax on the gallons that are flowing. Right. Uh, the, the biggest thing is, is having that data from the people that are turning the taps on essentially 
ever. Is there any exemptions in the state of Colorado on fuel? There is. I, I know the Air Force Base uh, has. There's quite a few. I, I'm not going to be the most first one here. So like uh, Medivac. No, uh, they pay the, the biggest one uh, is uh, one uh, if you are flying a DC six. <laughs> really? What? You do not have to pay the app gas tax. So that basically, if you're a 121 carrier, right. and you're still using a piston powered airliner for some reason. That's you don't awesome. pay the excise tax. So I don't know <laughs> where awesome. that came from. Uh, the other one is if you operate a turbine powered aerial agricultural aircraft off of a private airstrip that you own, you are exempt from the sales tax. Oh, really? So if you're a crop duster out there at Perry and that's all you do, you don't have to pay for it. So there you go. You do pay the excise tax, but you don't pay the sales tax. That's right. amazing. But that's a very small amount of yeah, but that, it just seems to me in the past that there were scenarios where <laughs> um, like Mayo Aviation, I was remembering the story at Centennial Airport where Mayo Aviation had they were flying a lot of medevac flights and somehow they were working something that wasn't there, which oh. was an exemption oh. of the sales tax. Yeah, and there may have been that went away. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, That's good. quite the opposite here in Colorado. The vast majority of states exempt commercial air carriers from paying any tax. Georgia being one, notably, and Utah, two Delta yeah, yeah. states. Colorado's uh, kind of a unicorn where you know we continue to do that. And I think you know it, it speaks back to the disbursement formula where we're not robbing Peter to pay Paul. We're not taking airline money and putting it into all GA. They get 66% of our money back. And then I would assume it's still the case under Phil's leadership that. Uh, that they're using that to credit the airline's airfield operating costs. Okay. So they get a direct benefit for that. So I think sometimes the airlines would get that. They think we're taking their money and shipping it elsewhere, but most of our money goes right back to, to the bigger airports. Sure. Uh, do you anticipate in the future adding as a separate entity, uh, Colorado Springs and Grand Junction, just because of their increase in commercial ops? I sincerely hope they grow enough percentage wise to have that impact where I have to. Uh, but right now it's all moving at the same rate. Right now it, it all moves kind of the same um, and it's all in the 25% right now. Essentially, yeah. So it, it's encumbered in that. Um, it's, it's something that I, I talked about recently here is maybe starting to kind of monitor the spring specifically as, as their commercial services pick up just to be able to, to grab it. Hey, why is it not even filed here in Colorado Springs for? two months things like that uh, so that's something that's definitely on my short-term radar uh, spring specifically junction uh, further down the road but uh, it, it's on the radar and especially if, if they get to that point where they're taking up a large enough percentage to, to yeah. that for sure. Good. So. do you have the information from history uh, and I'm just thinking that when you were talking about that is um, the great history when Western Pacific was out of springs and their mass volume increase. It, was that even, do you have access to any of that information? That would have been late 90s. I very much doubt it. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, this is, I, I say overall that this is a incredible, uh, where we are today, thanks to you, Bryce, and, and the team, is the, the uh, how you're able to track this and the data that you're using and the interpolation and the, how that compares and what have you is, that's never happened before. In I think the history of the division of aeronautics, you never had that kind of strength. Right. Financial, the financial management was always sort of the weakness of, of, of CDOT or of the division of aeronautics. And what you have done, and, and again, I think it's a hell of a statement is that we were able to get through last year, which was nobody could have forecasted that basically as a bump in the road. Be, thanks to your conservative approach and your management. So I, I mean, my hat's off to you and everyone um, on how you have tightened up. I mean, yes, those were some bad days that you know, Todd and, and everybody can attest to though in those days, but the way you're managing now is really ensures that that is something that we should never have to deal with again, which is excellent. Yeah, so I, great job. And thank you, I appreciate that. But yeah, even with COVID happened, I took immediate steps. Again, it was a scenario beyond the worst case of Don and his team. And the partnership, and a partnership <laughs> with the genius minds at DIA too. And I'll so tell you that was that was a miracle. There, I remember not there are some the people there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we went over and visited with uh, Greg Hegarty, the senior VP of finance, and we sat down and said, hey, what has the division ever asked from you data-wise? They said nothing, which blew yeah. me away. 
Yeah, we had never gone to our biggest source of revenue to say, can you share what you have? And they said, absolutely. And that's been key. It just kind of blew me away that nobody would have ever asked for that. That's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And and they're right there. about giving me context to like when you're sending your six month forecast. It's like, hey, this month is good, especially if you cover. This month is, it's a reliable number. It's definitely not a good number. (laughs) Uh, Next month is probably coming down after that. Who knows? They said, United has an adjusted flight, so they're still sort of full, but we know it's not. So they're great about giving me logic to it as well, so I can yeah. be aware of that and apply. Well, and that's what's nice is you're, you're nimble, and so is DIA in those terms of adjusting for those gross yeah. or, or declines. Yeah. So that's uh, we were, we, it was kind of a, through through the last calendar year there, we just, our last fiscal year, through COVID, through the heart of COVID and everything like that, our division cash balance actually went up almost there. Yeah, a big chunk obviously is Fed's matching 100%. percent that not spent out of it, but just the fact that Tom's team could quickly adjust to right. the, cha- the rapidly changing world in front of us. Well, there. we were a benefactor of that as well. So yeah, tell you right. So yeah. that's huge. Hey, Bryce, remind me what MOM is. Month over month. Oh, month over month. And Bryce, so, I think the one thing you've not talked about as well is that three year statute of limitations on some of that. Oh, stuff yeah. too. Because I, I know once in a while that you have a conversation with Dave and I to say, hey, there's this, this money. I was, I was about to jump on that. There. Okay. <laughs> um, the, uh, the one other thing I did want to cover is with fuel flat filings, there's a three year statute of limitations where if a company hasn't filed for three months, DOR has essentially three months to give them a notice that, hey, you owe this money. So as long as they give them that notice, that they have it and, and they still have to pay it. And I know they're still chasing uh, Frontier when Frontier was pumping their own fuel. Yeah. Uh, most of that past three years here, they're still fighting with that. Yeah. It's not a huge amount. When you we mean see Frontier a is hesitant to give you that's amazing. shocking. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Uh, you know, if that happened, and it's only for a few months, it's not yeah. like it's a whole deep. So when that happened, we might see a little bump, but they said don't don't plan on seeing it anytime. So when that happens. I will be glad to tell you why our cash forecast um, came in a little high. Firstly, there's some times where, wow, that was a big filing. Uh, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And I identify those as well. Nice. I do let the viewer know, hey, is this number correct on your end? Are we expecting an adjustment here? Uh, we did have one that expired this past year uh, with Southwest to, I think it was about $450,000 higher than Nice. What I thought it should have been based on fuel flow, and there wasn't anything else. I suspect it's just the way that they file and that they were catching up previous little ones that hadn't been filed and lumped it into one. DOR either couldn't or wouldn't give me that detail, and they're great about giving me details. So I'm assuming they couldn't differentiate that and just kind of left it. Um, but that has expired. So if you look back to this time last year, our reserve on the contingency, which I know is the next thing on there, was about a million and a half. And that was just covering, hey, we might have to push this extra 500K back out the door if they adjust that. Term limits on that have expired. Nice. DOR has confirmed with me that that's not on their radar. So there's no chance of that going out. So that reserve number we have on the contingency is back out of the building. So again, the, the other side of that coin that we do watch. And that happens obviously less frequently. Usually yeah. people are overpaying. But with that being said, I mean, nice thing about that, when that stuff happens, Bryce comes to us and we're like, hey, yeah. there's there's some weird money here. Yeah. We'll protect it until we don't have to. But again, we knew that from the time it started to the day it expired. So yeah. it's just nice that we can make those determinations on what to do with it. So. Well, and I think too is the, your, the conservative approach too is even though things are rebounding faster, you're just basically holding that into your fund. And then that can contribute to our fund decisions that we'll get to make about next year yep. is when we make our decisions about discretionary grants and what have you is that, okay, we did better, but you're not adjusting on the fly because all of a sudden we had a couple of great months is yep. you're just going, okay, we'll just take that extra revenue. We'll hold that into our account. And yep. then as we carry into the next year, we make some good fund decisions for the next grant cycle. Um, take that into account then but not if we're not anticipating something that may not may or may not happen which i like we don't want we're not reactionary we don't want to be reactionary to anything exactly that we should be able to avoid. and that's huge and that's <laughs> and that's and, and honestly that's another that's a big big change that's a kudos yeah you've got that yeah very nice 
So, and again, I know there's a lot of data here, you know, showing versus 2019 numbers and stuff at Denver, because uh, that's obviously relative as the forecast ties in. But uh, whether it's now or any time in the future, if you have questions about anything, I'm always happy to answer. Uh, I think Scott's not here today. He's, he's always in my ear about stuff, which is great. Yeah. So, uh, any, any other questions as it pertains to how we're forecasting revenue or doing anything like that? Right on time. Yeah, nice. nice work. Uh, well, he's going to get to keep yakking because we're going to roll. Well, all oh, so we're we're going to get to the contingency fund projections. That's next thing that okay. we're rolling right I into. You're good. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so contingency. Uh, I'll just quickly kind of go through what the contingency model looks like, talk about our grant program, uh, touch base on, on what it means. Like I mentioned earlier, our worst case contingency that we have is a prolonged period at only 35 million gallons of flow in Denver and $40 barrel oil. Uh, so as we look forward to 22 and 23, and the only reason we only look kind of current year plus one from a, from a contingency model perspective, we all know the price of oil and everything like that is completely unreliable as we look into the future. So everything in the future basically just takes that 23 number and flatlines it. So we can adjust to that. The 23 number, if you look at our projected revenue on here, uh, we're showing the 33 million that we're currently projecting for FY22 right now. And that might, number might be, it, it bounces up and down and continues to kind of creep up as things get back to normal. You see the 23 number is at 21 million. We think, what in the world's happening on here? That's where we project that worst case scenario. So effectively for the next 12 months, we always keep, okay, here's our forecast. Anything past 12 months out, we say, okay, here's worst case. Sky's falling, Denver's doing this, this is kind of where we're at. So we can then project our revenue and our expenses. Uh, the tax disbursements, that number obviously is very linear with, with the revenue number. Can you so point with your mouse? Button? Sorry, thank you. Yeah, okay, just so so the tax it. disbursement line here, uh, these numbers obviously are tied to our projected revenue. So we're having X amount of sales tax, we're paying the exact same percentage is out. That's that's not going to change. That's the, the ebb and flow of those. The statewide initiatives, those are what we have in our budget. Those are AWAS, those are uh, surplus, thank you. Crackfield, all, all of the, the things that we have there, our program delivery, uh, we can split that up from uh, admin and things like that. So that's all covered in the statewide initiatives based on what we have budgeted. Because if we do have our worst case forecast and revenues, Right now, this is still our plan for statewide initiatives. So that, that number is relatively static there, and that's why. Our grant expenditures, you'll see this year, uh, this fiscal year, we're projecting to spend about 4.5 million grant expenditures. <coughs> Keyword, expenditures. Not, not grant program that we push out. This is what we would actually forecast that we spend on those grants. And that's why that number jumps in 23. Because we are bringing a bigger program, there's going to be more grants that are open or that's going to get spent, obviously. Um, admin and other, again, which is the kind of flatline, which is the admin costs uh, or salaries here that are on that. And then just a few miscellaneous other ones that didn't deserve their own line. I just kind of lumped in there. Uh, so it shows our projected year end cash balance. Again, FY22, this is based on our forecast data. FY23, this is based on our worst case forecast for that fiscal year. That's a prolonged period uh, of, of bad news in Denver. And then that this here shows kind of our contingency balance of what cash we would need to have on hand should the tap effect, essentially be cut off. And we're at that worst case for every year into the future kind of thing. This is the amount of cash we need to have on hand to cover the committed grant program that year. The reserve, like I said, is down to a million dollars down from 1.5 in previous years because that Southwest anomaly has expired. <laughs> uh, and then this shows our unencumbered balance. So this is basically how clear we would be nice. uh, of, of running out. Uh, this shows our new CDAG program put in. The $8 million that we're gonna get into here is what I've recommended our program be uh, next year. Uh, and then I have 9 million in as a program for FY23. And for future years, because obviously that's going to tie into what balance you need to have on hand, 
future years, I just have it flat at nine right now. So that's the number being used in there. What's the compare? Sorry, remind me, what was the uh, fiscal year 21? For a grant program? Yeah. Uh, two point points. Yeah, that's it. Just, just under three because the Fed, Fed match kit. They that's amazing. So we did jump that's that awesome. down. That's awesome. And, and I've talked before in a normal year where our revenues are 30 to 35 million, our grant program will be eight to 10 million. And we lucked out last year because uh, all the federal grants were at 100% that. So we were able to take that normal 5% that we were last two years. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But even if that had not happened, like I said, our cash balance is around 11 million right now. I think we would be more than comfortable even if that didn't happen. Have, so. And for us, it's that balance of just not having too little money in the account and not having a huge balance where mm -hmm. the taxpayers go, why are we paying that if you're just sitting on it? Right. Yeah. You know? right. So I think we found that's a good spot. Yeah. So that's kind of the raw data. And I know you guys don't see that very often. So that's why you know, this is the time to kind of go through that and answer questions. Here's here's kind of the, the graph showing that. Again, the, the blue part of the graph, that's our projected year in cash balance. Uh, as you can see, current projections for this year. Well, but this year is a little over 16 million. Next year, with the worst case forecast of FY23, we would still end the year at around 12 million. Now, the commitments that are out there in grants would obviously be a lot higher. And that's where this total number allocated here uh, that shows our contingency line plus our reserve line of a million dollars. We never want to go below a million dollars. So even if we had stuff out there and there was an emergency <clears throat> that came in and they would need to spend a million dollars on this, we would have the flexibility to do so. Uh, the new CDAG program here, the grant program, like I said, we have 8 million in for FY22 uh, and 9 million. And so you see that increase here. Um, our, our contingency balance is oddly flat on that. Um, the reason for that simply is, as you saw above here, that cash balance we need to have on us was pretty close. Um, biggest part of that is once it normalizes and we start having a consistent thing, if it ever normalizes, who knows what the world's gonna do. But you know, that that will be a relatively, hey, this is the number we need to have on hand to cover what's out, what we're planning to do. We'll always have revenue coming in because even in a worst case, even through COVID, there was still revenue coming in. And it's just we knock it down to that kind of worst case. Now, my biggest Hesitation with doing this, and Tom and Scott and the planning team were annoyed with it. Do we really spend this money this quick? <laughs> because, you know, doing this kind of conservative based thing, if, if you can't spend the money when you've got it, that cash balance is going to jump up quick. But we did go through the one normal cycle. Uh, my concerns over that are eliminated. <laughs> Scott says he can spend any money I give him with his airport. So, yeah. um, so that, that's a good thing. I'll second that. Yeah. <laughs> As one of Scott's airports. Yeah, yeah. as one of Scott's airports. <laughs> and so what you'll see, you'll see how that ties in later on in the agenda for tomorrow are some extra programs that we had postponed before that we're going to bring back, like the electric aircraft studies or cameras potentially. Um, we don't have anything currently on the radar in the near future with our education and workforce development grants, but we've historically programmed, you know, we had $500,000 program before COVID uh, in the position that we were going to add to help manage that and do some other things like outreach and kind of give Sean some support. And you'll probably see us come back after the first of the year if we're on this trend to suggest some of those things coming back to you to keep that balance down and resume some of the programs we've shown. Hey, David, um, who outside this building on some routine uh, scrutinizes the book, this book, this money in this budget? Really nobody. Well, uh, OFMB, the, the Office of Management Budget. Yeah. CDOT I work with. I well, I would expect that. Yeah. Things like yeah. that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they do. But, you know, I can tell you, Shoshana Lou, the executive director, she's not asking me what are you all spending your money on because she knows that's why the governor appointed all of you. And that's what yeah. statute gives you the ability to do yeah. is direct that discretionary money. The Transportation Commission, as Bryce talked about, they do approve our administrative budget, but um, that's always just a little tiny line item that's very good. Yeah. And it's just rubber stamped with, I mean, CDOT's got a $2 billion budget and our app is 780 grand. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, but, and so that's really that's really the only touch point that we ever have. Um, certainly, uh, we just had a visit, um, uh, Mark, from uh, the CDOT internal auditor. We had a meeting about risk assessment, and they're looking at what we're doing and where the risk lies, and they're checking on us every once in a while. But um, really, it's vested with all of you, which is one of the reasons we want to keep you all up to speed. So 
So the, the other end of that question is, 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 um, is how do, uh, how do you promote the, the good things that are happening with this money and how it's being used to, I mean, and who's the audience that would really be interested? I think the airports. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that in the strategic plan. Got so okay. Typically, God, all right. And real quickly, I'll say, you know, Sean's always out there on Facebook. That's typically faced towards the aviation community. Um, we have some new opportunities, I think, uh, with the new House General Aviation Caucus that's been formed yeah. at the state level to help educate some legislators. Are we going to talk about that? We are going to talk about okay. that in the strategic plan. It's one of the things that you get to see if you didn't read it already is leveraging the abilities all of you have to help share that word mm -hmm. with legislators and elected officials that um, I can, but I'm a little bit of a delicate spot um, and doing some advocacy out yep. there for money and funding. Uh, so we'll talk all okay, about great. that. Our, our annual report that we put yep. out, which will be, we're, long story short, when that goes out, that really lays out everything. Tell about all the different. Yes. Uh, so that's a tool we can use. That's like a great tool. Yeah. Yep. And it digs into the, you know, the background and each of those things. You know, and for all of you, it's, it's I do a lot of them and I, I don't always tell you about them, but I gave a, I gave a briefing a couple months ago to a column Mike on his club. <laughs> yeah. You know, little things like that on aviation people just talking about what we do, you know. And so if you all were aware, I have to sidetrack this conversation, but if you were all aware of those kinds of conversations, or I know Ken's given those up in Club 20 up on the Western Slope, I'm happy to support you with presentation material. If you can do it, I'll do it with you, whatever you want to do. Yeah, and I, I did a Club 22. You know, uh, we've done the we've done the county commissioners yeah. and given them presentations. Uh, so anyway, and then specific to airports, this is information that we do push out every CAO. We present on this every CAO. Right. And the other kind of nice thing is now that our board meetings have gone partly virtual as well, the attendance at our meetings from our airports and yeah. our consultants have skyrocketed. Right. So honestly, the, our, the, our constituents are seeing this information a lot more often than they have in the past. And that's what I saw at the CAO meeting yeah. was yeah. Yeah, the, that that membership seemed to be very very favorable about. The, it looked airports. I know Kenny was an airport director at the time, but back in 2015, when the wheels fell off of our financial bus, the airports literally got a week's notice that your grant may get pulled back. Yeah, because we weren't communicating the situation right. by the time. So what we'll do after this little part here is we'll take Bryce's memo and we'll put that into an outward-facing communication to our airports, saying, "Here's what the board talked about. Here's what we're looking at for the grant program. Here's how it came about. Here's what you can expect next year, four months ahead of time." So we're also turning that into a communications tool. That's where we fail back in 2015. Yeah, after 2015, we got suddenly a lot more fans. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, but, but we also used to, the other interesting thing in, in this last conference was a great example that actually the last few conferences is that we used to actually have the cab meetings kind of concurrent sessions or separately. Yeah. And then, and then the, uh, regular conference sessions may be going simultaneously and and you know telluride was a great success is that we actually had that is an agenda item it was well attended yep. which is exactly. great so so i think this is what we've been talking about but this is the worst case scenario so if it's if it's not a worst case scenario the delta there that's what you're talking about yeah. you got to figure out how to spend money fast precisely so this right here this year is the worst like the next 12 months it's Here's our forecast data, and we kind of use that as kind of end. But after that, it's kind of worst case. So worst case, we're looking here. So you're exactly right. If it's not worst case, and things continue progressing, yeah, this, this yellow line is going to come up a little bit. Okay. This big gap between our total number allocated and the cash balance, this isn't good. We don't want to have that big a gap. But again, last two years, <laughs> COVID being rampant throughout them, uh, and again, the FAA matching 100%. <laughs> We have a bigger cap. We don't have a lot of open grants on the street right now. We have five point yeah. two. It's it's not a big number. So that's why that gap is I need to close my grant. It's so big um, because we haven't been spending that, which and we consulted with the board and that was the decision yeah. we took last year in March or April or whatever it was when they said they were doing hundred percent. Uh, because I mean that was the discussion Dave and Todd and all the teams and stuff have here is do we recommend we put that Three million dollars or whatever it was, back out the door. And I said, from I said financially, we're fine if we do. We we don't know what's coming up here, but we've got cash balance. We can do that. It might be again conservative approach. What happened? We can hold that back, and that just means we'll be able to ramp up quicker when we come out of that. And that was the direction we got from you guys. That's exactly what happened. So 
Uh, yeah, I don't like seeing that delta there, but very unique circumstances. Yeah. Uh, once we roll into next year, again, we're always going to have a little bit of a gap there because we do have that conservative approach. Yeah. But that lets us communicate a plan to the airports that in a non COVID environment, we know we're not going to have to adjust, that we're going to be able to stand behind and have covered financially uh, without getting our cash balance to a ridiculous level. Well, and a specific example of that is you see the $8 million program that we're talking about for this upcoming season. The last time we would have talked about this, that number was at $5 million. But as you see that big gap in cash balance, like that's when you have to have those internal discussions of what do we need to do to make sure that balance doesn't get out of control. And so that's how you can see that that program in, I mean, in concept has changed to an $8 million program this upcoming year rather than $5 million. And I know, you know, we're always talking, and this is what it's looking like. But for the newer members, this is August. This is the month where I tell yeah. the team and recommend to you guys, this is the grant program for next year. This is how much is available. Um, I've got the data that we need to have. We're close enough to it that, okay, yeah, we're in a comfortable spot. So that this happens every August. We're all coming and say, hey, here's, here's the number I'm recommending for a grant program. You'll be able to really easily see why that's there. Um, and uh, answer any questions. Like said, right now, we're already forecasting $9 million for next year. Yeah, it's the first time I saw that number. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but, and, so I try to kind of show that. Uh, again, that number will kind of flow a little bit there, but it's kind of the ballpark. We want to try to keep that consistent, but depending yeah. on the revenues, it's not always possible. And what's kind of cool about this, so I mean, that program just went from five to an $8 million program for a program we're implementing in three months. And so what's kind of great, we kind of have an idea of what our federal match is going to be. It ranges anywhere from $2.2 million to $3 million on an annual basis. And then beyond that, it's all state and local projects. And so what's really cool is the planners and I, we have this long list of projects for every year. We have it planned out of what projects we're planning on doing each of those years. And as that number changes, we're able to move some of those projects up and down to make those program works. And that's the reason we're so I mean, nimble to make those decisions. When he gives us another $3 million to use in three months, we're able to make those changes pretty quickly because we already know what the needs are out there. We always leave a little gap there for the unknown of the projects that come up that just are somewhat of emergency projects. So we always have a plan for how to use that money. But again, that's the planning team is very nimble on being able to make these changes because we know what the needs are out there for the next. We have our state local projects planned for the next six years. And so we're able to, again, make those changes very quickly and spend that money he lets us spend. Do, does the division still get a federal planning grant every year no, or is that so a historical thing the only time we usually get planning grants from the fa now is when we do our systems plan and economic okay. impact studies because they used to get something, something was it for the 50 tens or something so it was a, uh, was a lot of different things it was okay. for six different actual projects okay it actually paid for some of our salaries at one point yeah um but yeah we had to it was it was planning it was not noise planning but land use planning was a piece of it so it was like five different pieces but um we decided that honestly that wasn't the best use of those because it actually takes away from state apportionment sure so sure. that has less money going okay. to the airports okay. so we're like this makes no sense that we're taking money from That's airports great. to fund programs yep. that we're doing anyway so you're completely autonomous That's exactly great. so we pull it. back on that and really the only time we touch that money has to do with when we're doing those big statewide programs how many years has it been like that um, <coughs> it's been at least six, six years, six or seven. The only federal one we've had since I started here was the system plan. And That's the only true. the other one would have been when we did the big uh, sustainability sustainability plan. Last year, but that that came out of completely different bottom. Sure, sure. But yeah, that was the last like large federal grant we got to do something other than the systems plan. So we knew the last planner whose salary was paid for. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, we had a dedicated yep. FTE, right? Yep. Okay. Gotcha. That's great. And it's been ten years. Wow, 10 years already? Yeah. <laughs> His twins are probably almost in college. They'll be, well, they'll be, they'll be 10 in December. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, as far as continuing to roll, is there any questions or anything like this? is great. Because again, anytime you have a question, reach out. I'm happy to answer it. Yeah. Now, I'll shift it over to Dave and Todd as we talk about the grant program update. 
<laughs> so I think the right one was intermixed in there. So I'll touch base, just kind of a process, and I'm going to steal Todd's thunder a little bit. But um, now that it will set a number for next year, Todd and the planning team will work with airports to kind of dial in their projects, get more solid numbers so between now and January. Uh, in October, we'll hold what we call our capital improvement program or CIP workshop at airports. That's where we'll, we haven't been able to do it in person. We're not going to do it in person again this year because a lot of airports are starting to travel. So we're going to do it remotely, but we'll partner up with the FAA and we'll walk through with airports anything new with grant requirements on both our side and the Fed side. We'll talk about timelines, what the expectations are, um, and get everybody ready so that by the time December rolls around, we'll come to all of you with a federal grant list for you. Not for approval yet in December, it won't quite yet be finalized, but. Uh, and It'll be our state and local, actually. Or state and local, I got it backwards, I'm sorry, that comes first. Um, for you all to review, and if you have any comments or questions, um, we've let airports come in and give pitches on their projects. It's not like they have to sell it to us necessarily, but if you're interested in a particular project, you know, we have them come back in January and talk about it. Um, and just a good opportunity for us to do that. And then in January is when you will all actually approve the grants themselves once they're finalized. So that's kind of the process with the grant program. Um, typically 2.2 to 2.5 is our federal match, you know, at our 5% up to 250. Um, of course, if an airport needs more than 250, I'll start getting a big grant or they're financially uh, difficult county um, and they're a good or a bad spot, we can help them out with that. And we probably have one coming up uh, here in Northwest Colorado in a couple of years with a big runway where they may not be able to swing even 5% of their, of their of their projects that we may for. That's pretty rare. They'll have to provide us with a lot of information to justify that because there's a <coughs> high bar for that you need more than 250 or that you need more than a 5% match. But that's kind of how that looks with the grant program. And then, you know, historically, you all, I think we all have been very um, supportive of using the remainder of that five and a half million dollars in the case body next year for uh, state and local grants and the projects that don't get any FAA money or only get a little tiny bit, like $150,000 annual entitlement. So, we, you know, I love our list, but we send it to the governor's office. Um, so after you all approve the grant, state supply says I have to send it to the governor's office and I can't, we can't do anything with it until he says yes or no. He's never said no to my understanding. Um, but uh, it's really nice to be able to ship that list off and show that we're doing stuff at airports from as busy as Centennial or Grand Junction all the way down to Craig and Beaker and Walden and little places like that. So um, that's really cool about our funding is we invest a lot of that lead. Nine million dollar CDAC in smaller general aviation. Is the government? Uh, the government. Does the governor ever ask questions? It's not. I mean, because this one, this the this governor is the, the staff has once in a while. Yeah, they, they, um, but I'll be honest with you. At least in the six years that I've been here, I'll send the list in, uh, and then I'll get a letter back usually the very next day saying yes. what it says. Because this governor seems to be a little more interested in aviation. Yeah, he's they're starting to be, and that's going to tie in with the system plan and some of the things we'll talk about with some of the funding requests that are unique that I've put in, I've shared with all of you. All right, so. so generally the, the governor has 30 days to say, yes, do it. And if we don't hear anything in 30 days, we're okay to continue. Right. He's the first governor that we haven't had to wait some of that 30 days. Because really? previously we've had some governors who just wait the 30 days yeah. and then we and then we go yeah. to contracting. But Polis has been very well, quick. But, yeah, but I also great. say that's a testament to you guys as far as your relationship with the staff. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they do a really good job. And we've been really lucky in that. Unfortunately, our client contact with Governor Polis, with all of CDOT, Adam's there, and I don't know if you work with Adam very much, but he left. He was one of the holdovers from Governor Hickenlooper's administration. There weren't a lot of people that transitioned, but Adam was one that had been our point for many years. Still don't know who that is. And talking priorities for these grant programs, I mean, a majority of each of our year's program goes to payment maintenance. So we're just really trying to, to preserve those payments out there, those huge investments. But I mean, this year it's going to be almost 80% is going to probably payment maintenance projects across the state. So it's a, a big commitment for us is to maintain that payment across. So. And when you say you're, you guys are meeting with FAA, I assume that's airports division and the ADO here. That's in the same store. That's correct. And we actually meet with them on a monthly basis um, just to go over any changes and what's going on in the, in the state. But but yeah, we we over the CIP update time frame, we will meet with 30 to 35 different airports and go over their CIP project by project, year by year. And so it, this, the next starting in uh, October to December is a very crazy time period for the planners because yeah, we meet yeah. with 
over half the airports in the state where we go through millions and millions of projects, I mean dollars worth of projects uh, across the state. So yeah. it's, it's a pretty cool process. Yeah. But I think one of the things that I'm excited about, um, especially as my former airport director self, is I'm, I'm a big believer in, in economic development type projects, yeah. you know, things like utilities. And, you know, hey, if we can give you a half a million dollar grant to put in sewer, water, and gas to build a new set of hangars that are going to generate revenue and fuel sales, let's talk about those kinds of projects too. Might not rank as high as a runway and it's falling apart at a small airport because without a runway, the rest of it's kind of moot. But um, I think I'm excited about that. I really challenge our planners to try to pull some of those projects out. We did one at Walmart uh, one or two years ago. Yep, and we have another one planned this upcoming year. Um, so, yeah, so I'm really excited to see some of those projects. You know, fuel farms, you know, hey, if there's an airport that needs a fuel farm, those are not federally eligible except in very, very limited situations. Yeah. The hangar shortage is. Is getting in the way of selling airplanes and, and exactly. that growth. I mean, yeah, we're not allowed to fund hangars that are privately owned or right. privately used, but like at Sterling, if they want to build a community hangar that the airport's going to own and then lease out little corners of it, that's totally which generates revenue. I mean, that's exactly. Yeah. So, um, what we're, we're really make. about to do is we get more money. Payment's great, but you know, maybe we'll put that tax lien aside and fund this airport utility project. Yeah. yeah. You know? And that's what's awesome about our board and our staff is we have a lot of discretion on where yeah. our money goes. I mean, the FAA has a very strict matrix style right. to put priority one against the other. We can operate outside of that. Absolutely. We're able to make those decisions to say, yeah, like, yeah, we have some paper things that needs done here, but let's do focus on some of these like utility projects so we can sure. get back to being productive. I got to tell you, it's it's one of the things that you all may not know because you don't know about other states and how their aeronautics divisions yeah. work, but I'll compare us to Wyoming. They have what they call a priority rating model, and they have a very prescriptive matrix with different scores, different weightings for different projects. And every year they go through their CIP, they assign a numerical value, and if your project scored above this, it gets funded. If it scores below that, it doesn't get funded with a little bit of discretion, but generally they don't deviate from that kind of very prescriptive where if we get something unique that comes up or an airport says, wow, I've got this really cool opportunity I didn't know about, we have a lot of flexibility <laughs> in the statute. You do to say thumbs up or thumbs down. It's really cool. I mean, it was Governor Romer and Senator Lou Ennis that wrote the wrote our founding legislation. And they were both GA pilots and they they did a masterful job of, of drafting our structure. I gotta tell you, those those two folks were and, and for like once we get all of the needs for the state and state and local money, like as a planning team, we sit around the table in there and we horse trade until we all agree that yes, this is probably the best program to take forward at this point. Yeah. The, the planners each represent a different region of the state and they bring kind of the needs they have and kind of compare them against the other needs across the state. It's, it is very cool to see it happen. I mean, well, I mean, we found a way to plan over eight, $10 million. Will you just let hours. us know when you have those meetings so I can mm. send Scott some double shot of espresso? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, he doesn't need it. Yeah, he, <laughs> not <laughs> Scott. Yeah, he would not be in that meeting. <laughs> and I think, you know, again, uh, you know, to the comment earlier about our system plan, we don't yeah. it just not, we don't ignore that. That system plan we adopted last sure. year, we made a promise to use that as a uh, robust tool to help program these. And what you're going to see with all the grants that we bring forward is specifically what it does to address something in our system plan. Okay. So that we can say, yep. this is how we're moving the needle. Thanks for our system plan. Historically, the tempo was every five years. That's, we've all kind of, I think, decided that we're going to recommend to you. It's a little too quick. Not enough changes in five years. And a system plan is about a million dollar effort. It's a lot of money. So I think we would get more bang for our planning buck if we start doing a system plan every seven or 10 years, doing an economic impact study every five. Get a little benefit of the economy scale if you do them together, um, but you know it just doesn't make sense to do a system plan. We don't think right now every five years, given cost. Dave, I know you're going to cover it later, uh, but can you give us a snapshot of where you envision the electric uh, recharging station effort? I know that that's a study. Yeah, I don't want to steal the thunder for later, but uh, okay. I, I, you know, I think from a revenue standpoint, I think I'll be 100% honest with you. I don't see it, at least in my lifetime in this division, having a significant impact on our revenue because you're never going to see the aircraft using DEN um, that are all electric in my lifetime. They're still going to require jet fuel. You're going to see maybe King Airs and some single engine stuff, but that's a fraction of our revenue. So for, I think for us, we're interested in tackling that. One, to make it available, and we're going to talk about you know, be a part of a voluntary part of the governor's greenhouse gas emissions program. Uh, you know, steal the thunder. We want to be a better partner on that. Maybe they should really before it gets forced upon us by 
people that don't know aviation, but yeah. you know, Chick, I think I don't see a 737 or 8320 type aircraft ever running on pure electric. But, and I'll piggyback on that from a financial perspective. If it is, you know, the, the King Airs, the smaller things and stuff like that that are doing electric. I said earlier, you know, all four cents uh, of the Abjet goes out, in and out the door to keep two of the six cents on Abgas. Our actual take home, for lack of a better term, on a yearly basis for excise tax is like $50,000. It's, 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 it's not a consequential amount that stays in our fund. Yeah, I could buy a deck lawn mower for that much. <laughs> yeah. It's huge. huge. <laughs> yeah. So, From so, the surplus. <laughs> so, like, like you said, until it's yeah. widely adopted commercially, the financial impact we will feel as a division is, is almost nothing. Now, that would obviously increase revenues and the part that's going right back to the airports. Uh, that's, that's a different story, but purely from a divisional standpoint, it's, it's not consequential. So I'll ask a question, I'm surprised I didn't ask it. Okay. I think I've asked you this. So if the wheels fall off our financial bus like they did in April of last year, and we end up with another 14 months of COVID, you know, suppressed revenues, can we still support the eight million dollar program? I know I know the answer, but I already asked you. <laughs> no, the answer right now is yes. Okay. Uh, and we've been shut off. I think you kind of yeah. outlined that. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the one that would then be the 2023 program. Yeah, right. <laughs> would be a no. <laughs> uh, but right now, again, because of the cash balance we do have, uh, and then the next question will be, well, why did we have to change last year's program if that's the case? The real answer to that is we were still coming out of the, the 2015 and then again that, that dip. So we had not, we hadn't even had two years of a normal cycle under the continuous model to uh, normal revenues because we had had a longer gap but to get to that point where we've got that roll of bells. And again, that drop was beyond our worst case scenario. We, we can't plan for that. So I'm not saying every year in the future, if it turned into a COVID year, that we'd be able to just go for the next year under the normal flow, because it never wouldn't happen. But again, you saw that, that cash balance variance between where we need to be and where we are. So yeah, we'd be okay this time because we have that, that big gap, but that's exactly right. Don't want that gap. I mean, really, we shouldn't be able to, to well, do that. We, if the taps turn right off. Basically, you laid out the roadmap, though, is that you have the contingency in place where if something like that does happen again this year, then you have to throttle back 2022 or 2023. 2023. And again, because of our cash balance, we're sure. this year because of the previous two years. In a normal environment, though, if over the year where that happens, we should have to turn the tap. We can't plan for that. Exactly. Uh, where we have a cash balance of thirty million dollars for a ten million dollar program, it's, it's just not feasible. So right now, if that happened, we'd be okay. But that's because the last two years there's been six million dollars in federal grants that we haven't had to put our money into. Yeah. So right. it's an anomaly now. The normal sure. answer would be no. Yeah, we would absolutely have to yeah. have to change that in a, in a COVID world. But yeah, but again, that's all the you're not reactionary. You you, you know those decisions will be made by the time we talking about the discretionary yeah. grant program for 23 because you will have outlined everything and where our contingency is to that. Absolutely. Point. I mean, if, if yeah. two months from now they turn the taps off, even if this was a normal year and we didn't have that big delta, sure. we're, we're, we're going to hurt, don't get me wrong, but we're, we're going to be fine. We would be scaling back that next year significantly from a planning perspective. That also gives us at that point another year. How quickly is this going to go? Things like that. So, and those are conversations. A lot of conversations Bryce and I have. Yeah. Like the I'm, what if scenarios. Well, <laughs> we live in the what if yeah. scenarios. So, so, like, what if the infrastructure bill passes and the pay raise is on those as well? Yeah, uh, we've talked a lot of stuff. Yeah. But the good thing is, is yeah, they're pumping more federal money and they're taking things that are off of our bucket list. And Todd will be way more specific than I am. That's additional money we have. That's a long state local projects, and they're going to get pumped up and get pumped up quick. Yeah, and I mean, again, yeah. we're planning out for five years for state local. I'm already looking at 2026 and kind of the plan for that. So, yeah, these what if scenarios just we, we find a way to get it done. And I will say the nice thing about working with Todd and his group, I'll sit in on a lot of their meetings, especially when they're doing the horse trades. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> and uh, they let me ask stupid questions, and uh, I always say, my position doesn't care. Here's your number, but I'm curious. Why are we doing this? <laughs> <laughs>
So it's, it, it works well. And so one of the things that may benefit us, and I think you all know, I'll just as a refresher, um, the state of Colorado was the recipient of a great deal of federal stimulus money, some of which is related to infrastructure. Uh, that's being managed by the Office of State Planning and Budget and the governor's office. And they put out a request for projects that would be eligible under the federal criteria, um, of which I was able to make a nexus between a couple of our runway projects and the eligibility criteria. So I worked with Shoshana Liu, the executive director, and said, I'd love to throw something in for aeronautics. You know, we're, we're struggling too, and I think we've got some good projects to come forward. So, long story short, I think you all saw. I uh, wasn't supposed to tell anybody about it. I found out <laughs> in the governor's office, but I did anyway. Um, no. We put in a uh, $6.6 million supplemental funding request through the governor's office for two runway projects uh, the Crossroad Runway at Grand Junction and the Runway Rehabilitation at Creed at the Alpha Southwest Border State. It basically, it would be just getting us grants to go do 9010 projects at those two airports. Don't know the process going forward. Don't know, you know, I had a meeting with Lieutenant Governor's uh, Chief of Staff last week, asked a couple questions. Um, wouldn't you tell me much about what the process is going forward, but they didn't tell me no yet that we're out. So <laughs> we'll see, but if that happens, uh, that's $6.6 .6 million that we're gonna be allowed to be able to reallocate to some other projects and pull other stuff forward. So we're kind of excited about the indirect opportunities. More of the what if well, scenarios. Yeah. It's messing up your plan. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but those are fun. Yeah. Those Always move on. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Exactly. So we'll see how that goes. We've never, I don't think, uh, I've worked at Caitlin uh, in the history of the division. I don't know if we've ever made a general fund kind of request like that. So we'll see how that goes. The other one that's sort of related to is the legislature's capital development committee. Um, it's also looking for some, some requests. And for some reason, they like to do weather uh, projects, like they've done weather radar down the San Luis Valley and some of those. Um, so we don't do radars, but I said, hey, we can use a couple of new AWOS units, um, one down in Westcliff and one, uh, not Westcliff, um, one blank. I mean, we're talking Eastern Blake East. Yeah, yes. excuse me. Uh, yeah, so one would be uh, like one of our new mountain AWAS that we put one out east uh, that EMS helicopter operators have asked for better aviation weather, certified aviation weather that's not on an airport. So we may look at trying to do one of those out there. That's a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, and then another one down at an airport. I was uh, Westcliff, I believe. Okay. Week. Westcliff is going in currently. I can't remember. Sorry, we did it a couple months ago, but we had asked for another traditional airport in Washington that they would fund at an airport they could use. Yeah. So, can I? I don't want to derail us. We're sort of using it today as my opportunity to ask dumb questions. That's what we're here for. <laughs> How, when you all do the course training, like, is there an evaluation criteria? I heard you say, you know, runways maybe take priority because everything else falls. How, how do you go? Yeah, so you are correct. So we have a runway out priority. So yeah, runways by far get the highest just priority wise. Yeah. But the hard part about that is we are comparing a runway at Walden to a ramp at Colorado Springs. And it's, it's tough to compare those because those have very different uses. I mean, way more aircraft use the ramp than would use the runway for the wall. So that's actually where we use kind of just their knowledge of the system to say what makes the most sense here. And honestly, we look at timing as well, because the longer you wait on some pavements, the more it's gonna to cost to repair them later. And so a lot of that comes into it too. So yeah, we're, that we're runway out priority, but then we're also looking at our PCI system, our pavement condition system uh, throughout the state as we're going through those talks. I mean, there is a, a lot of stuff talked about in those, and, and we'll bring in the FAA if we need to conversations and say, hey, would this help you out? If we funded this project state locally, does that help us move a different runway forward, give it more priority on the federal system too? So we are using a lot of different strategies to try to get as much done in the state. I'll put it that way. But yeah, it's, it's a lot of it is just knowledge of the system and understanding where the money is the most could like the most benefit at sure. is kind of where we look at it. Gotcha. But it's not completely subjective. No, nope. uh, I'll kind of talk a little bit about PCI and our payment condition. Yeah, and, and so yeah, we have that up. Usually when we're in this room, we have kind of this like the overall CIP of the airport. And then on another screen, we'll bring up where the PCI for that airport is. So we can see pavement by pavement, what makes the most sense. Um, and, and through that, I mean, we know the airports put in what they want in their CIP. There's a lot of times we push back and say, why is that your highest priority project? Like they'll say, hey, we need to spend all this money on our runway. And then we look at PCI and their taxiway and ramp are complete crap. 
And so we'll be like, yeah, your runway is going to be great, but they can't get to your fuel because your taxiway is crap. So like we have those conversations with the airports about like priority wise, this is, we have to look at a system of airports because the airports individually just see their airport and what their units are. And so we, I think the planners do a great job of having the conversation with the airport that says, hey, yeah, we agree that your priority, your project is high priority for your airport. But in the bigger scale, PCI wise, we, we want to make sure we're, we're doing the best for the system. And system wide, we try to average for our movement areas, uh, PCI of 78 and higher, which is, which is actually very good looking throughout this looking throughout the country, to be honest. So, so I'm sure I'm saying, does, does that help you also by the balancing, you know, the needs of bigger, uh, little airports to bigger airports? Because for sure, because I bet there's some, there's some small, smaller locations that. And have you guys ever seen the PCI website? Do you want to brief yeah. on that? Do you want to just close out yours real quick? So I'm, I'm not on there. I'm going to start. Oh, Sean, you're on? Yeah. Cool. Well, I will share mine quick. But yeah, it is amazing the amount of information. And CAO, we actually just hosted a pavement maintenance uh, seminar this last week that Kip and I attended. Uh, like nine airports came out and actually did demonstrations on how to do some of this pavement maintenance. And so I did a briefing on this site actually. But they use a grant that we funded. Correct, yeah, which is huge. <laughs> again, we, again, putting money into pavement maintenance. But to give you an idea, and we'll talk, call out a screen. Um, Every three years, we inspect airports. The actual planners are going out there measuring the distresses on each of the airports every three years. So let me go to Colorado Springs. But what this massive map is, is it shows you the entire uh, layout of the airport. And you can actually zoom into certain areas. We'll actually look at this runway over here. And you can just click on it. And then you can actually see when we inspected it, we inspected it in 2018. We actually just inspected it this year too. That information is just not on here. But you can get down to the point where, I mean, we were able to see the actual distresses on the pavement too. And we have those listed in here for every airport, for every section of paved surface in the state. So the amount of, the amount of information that's on here is, is, is amazing. What's also nice is it also shows you what the recommended work would be. So let me go to actually a different piece of paper. That one's actually pretty well. Does so this information data come from your inspections or is it a separate entity? So it comes from our inspections. So the three planners are out there measuring. And then along with them is our pavement engineer um, that we contract out. And he's inputting it into this uh, engineer system called Paper. And then it creates all of this information based on those distresses that we give him. Um, but yeah, it, what's, I mean, it'll show you recommended work for this specific section. It'll tell you how much that should cost. Um, to fix that section based on the recommended fix. The amount of information that's in here is huge. But yes, as we go through that determining what needs the highest priority, we are using this information. Because at airports say, hey, we need a we need to mill off three inches and put back on three inches for three million dollars. When we go in here and look at what the distresses are, and honestly it's they're just surface distresses. You don't need to do a mill and fill. You need to do a bog seal and recrack it for two hundred thousand rather than a three million dollar project. So, we're also looking at that level to say that doesn't make sense. Or we push out runway projects to another five years because it's not to that point yet. A crack seal will get you another five years, so we can delay a project for another five years too. So, a lot of the stuff that we discuss, you know, uh, we try very hard to. Uh, to come from a standpoint where we're not trying to say no to the airports, we're trying to help them. So if right. we have to, there is some bartering that we do between ourselves or the staff, and that way we all get on the same page and then we barter with the airports essentially. And we let them know, you know, they're not going to get your ramp this year, but uh, once we get this, just as an example, you know, we get your runway fixed up with some paper maintenance, then we can maybe push your ramp back maybe one or two years and then. You'll essentially get tacit approval to get that on your CIP. And uh, barring any issues with the grant program, it's not guaranteed, but they can be reasonably sure that that project is going to be so great. That's, that's, that's the fruit of all of our efforts internally, I would say. CLS reopened three five left last week. Say that again? CLS reopened three five left last week. Awesome. That is great because when we were doing PCI there, that runway was luckily closed along with Taxiway Alpha, so we didn't have to inspect it. It was the coolest thing ever. It saved us like four or five hours. I call it one seven right because that's where we went across. 
right? But yeah, to give you guys an idea how long Colorado Springs takes us, it's about a 30 hour inspection for our team to actually inspect all those maintenance. So we plan for three days at Colorado Springs. <clears throat> the only airport we don't do is Denver. We don't do Denver. And uh, what is um, can you go back to the statewide map? How did you get there? Uh, which map? The one that just had all the dots. All it the should map. be this one. Okay. I'm uh, trying to follow along. That one? There we go. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. And this isn't all 76. This is just the airports that have paved movement surfaces okay. that way, too. I think there's around 66 of them. So you can go back to that one chart you're on. So one of the things yeah. I want to tie this back into our system plan um, is wait, hey, we'll pause right there. So one of the things we did with our system plan is we're now tying our payment condition index back into the system plan classifications that we created that were new last year. So now we will be able to report out and say, okay, for each of the system plan airports, here's how we move the needle on payment conditions with the money we spent to justify what we're doing. So um, I'm going to go back to that, that other one because on my surface. So what we can see here is we go down and we go, we can take a glance on average across the entire state, our average runway condition is eight. That's pretty good with 100 being new. That's really high. Um, tax weight apron goes down. So what we'll be able to do is as we report out each year on our system plan of progress, we can see if we've moved the needle at all of these. And that's something we didn't do before the system plan. We just want to be able to show what we're getting our investment. That really gives you the picture. Never seen that before. Yeah, and it can show you also if you're sliding, it makes a great case for saying, can we have some more resources? Because right. even with everything we're putting into right. it, we're falling back. So state help us, feds help us. We can use this tool to help us tell And there's the better one for you that ties directly. There you go. Right. There. And that's so we can do it. If you wanted to know, hey, GA National, that's two airports. That's Centennial and Rocky Mountain Metro. Their average weighted PCI is pretty good, over 80%. So um, anyway, this was all we built when we did our system plan. Uh, last year under the hood, so we've um, probably never showed that to you. But that's for no one's seen this. Yeah. Pretty cool. A lot of information. And this is all available to the public. The link to this is on our website. This is an outwardly facing asset that anybody can use, the airport manager can use it. So the, the com under commercial service that yes, I'm not, right back. That's no, you're okay. That does not include DIA. Yeah, it does not include that. Is that footnoted on that, that, that diagram? Uh, it's footnoted in a lot of different places. I'll put it okay. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what's kind of cool is the PCI airport by table. It'll also show you every airport, their average PCI over the entire airport, and the average weighted years of those those uh, pavements, too. So there's some. That, so that's what I was going to ask if you guys had some kind of a Ouija board that you had this uh, way that you're tracking when they had their pavement done. Because when you go out, the thing I always, my only criticism about the PCI, yeah. I think it's a valuable piece of the whole puzzle. But yeah, you, and this kind of shows that where you have pavements that have been rehabilitated and then you go out there and you're doing your measurements or what have you, like us, you came out and you visited us and it was great and we, we scored very well. Yeah. But what we're starting to see more and more is we're putting more and more crack field down on that runway every time we do a bog yeah, sale project every five years or so. Yeah. So it is really interesting. And then you have that, Okay, you know, for us looking at that 20 year number, okay, to 2029, 20, we're going to be hitting our 20, 20, our 20 year age, right? And along with your PCIs, that should be able to track that we've fallen below a certain level and start getting that on the CIP. Correct. And so, with that being <coughs> said, uh, so PCI is 100 <laughs> best, zero complete crap. Yeah. Anything over about a 65 is recommended for just a surface treatment. So just crack seal, fog seal. Okay. Between 40 and 65 is recommended for a mill and fill, just okay. to kind of you're just taking off some. And then anything below 40 is considered failed. And okay. they request and they recommend a, doing a full reconstruction, including base work with that. So yes, there is a, a degradation scale for all of these pavements that are that's built into here. And that recommended work will actually go back to what that PCI, PCI is based on what distresses there are and determine whether you need a mill and fill or Structure of the surface. And also is Todd that when you start dropping below 60, it, it accelerates quite rapidly on annually, correct? Oh, or is it 50 or I yeah, it, what in that, it, it definitely starts, it definitely degrades much quicker after those. So when you're talking years. about Creed and Grand Junction's crossword one way, I would expect that both of those are probably 60 or dropping below 60. 57. Yeah. 57, exactly. They're both okay. 57. Great. Great. Yeah. 
Yeah, good. And the one thing that's interesting about Grand Junction's Crosswind, it's not eligible for federal funding because right. they get Crosswind coverage on their runway. Yeah. And with but, that, it's still a valuable runway that the GA can use. Well, because they're all right there on that. But also highlighting the fact that the FAA, I don't know how many years ago, basically said we're no longer doing yeah. Crosswind runways. Yeah. It starts in. Things, but yes. Yeah, but also in here, you were talked about the different surface treatments. You're yeah, we are also tracking those in here too. That's cool. So we obviously have a surface treatment to add in for Tower <laughs> Airport at, at GSB 78. 78? Yeah. I so thought it was, was yeah. I think it was the warm yeah. mix. Yeah. It was the, I know which one you're talking about. After I started out that way, but then we yep. got burned with weather. Yep. I just learned about that last week. Yeah. So great product. But yeah, a lot of information in here. If you guys want an actual demo of it at some point, I can. More than happy to do that too. I found a lot more stuff when I was researching last week. So nice. well, that was kind of it, you know. So to wrap that up, you know, uh, after our board meeting tomorrow, we'll turn this into, uh, you know, what uh, Sean would call uh, an action call, not an action call. I'm asking two minutes, but just to communicate to all of our stakeholders, saying here's what we're, we're working on, here's what we're doing, here's what's coming next with the CIP workshop and the schedule, and letting all of our airports know what we're up to. Loop closed. So with that. Lunch is ready. And we're eating in here. We're eating here. Yep. And we're 10 minutes ahead of the schedule. Presentation. Is he going to keep on? He's going to walk in. It's not going to be here. Okay. Let's change about three times in the last couple of months. Finance? Yes. Or it was Ben Harwood for a long time. Oh, yeah. And then Ashlyn, but she's gone. And I'm drawing a blank on the. I don't know. We've been working on the last many months to update our 2018 strategic plan with a brand new strategic plan since we had tackled a lot of things we had uh, lined out uh, three years ago. And now it's time for us to map uh, the next path forward on the things we want to focus on. So uh, I will just stop right there and turn it over to Jeff Coleman with Aviation Management Consulting Group. Uh, Jeff was the uh, uh, project manager for us that led the facilitation of uh, the preparation of the plan, which included a lot of our stakeholders. It wasn't just us. So, Jeff, if you're ready, I'll turn it over to you to give them the update. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, David. My apologies. I'm uh, traveling on the left coast. I'm in a Starbucks with my mask on, so a little bit of background noise, and I'm a, I'm a little muted. <laughs> You're lucky you said that because we're going to give you a lot of a lot of a hard time about that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, both myself and Caitlin Cooper uh, did the facilitation of this. We thank uh, uh, both Dave and his team as well as the uh, board for uh, engaging our services again. We really enjoyed it the last time, and I certainly enjoyed this time as well working uh, with the staff, uh, the board, and the other committee members. We worked uh, through really two phases, uh, the preparation phase leading up to this, and that's, of course, the buy-in of the board and the staff, and uh, that always that happened really prior to us getting engaged. Our role was really phase two, the development side, uh, and after the board uh, approved, or once they approved uh, this strategic plan update, then phase three will kick in uh, for implementation. Uh, I already talked about phase one where everyone bought in and we formed the planning team. Uh, I do want to recognize uh, the planning team members. I don't have everyone's name in front of me, but we had a representative from Cabot. Uh, we had a representative from CAOA. We had a rep uh, representative from the Colorado Pilots Association. Uh, we had a representative uh, from the FAA, uh, from Denver, and uh, from uh, obviously CDOT. Did I miss anyone, Dave? Uh, no, I think just Mr. Mampa, our chair, also participated in that too. Yes, as well as our board representative too. Thanks, Kitty. So then we went into our phase two development. Uh, our very first step was collecting and sort of an update of where CDOT, uh, Division of Aeronautics is today, programs offered, the people involved, the associations involved, uh, distributed out this assessment to the committee members. Based on that, solicited 
input from all of the committee members uh, to identify the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, of the Division of Aeronautics. Um, from that, we went and reviewed the current mission and vision and updated that. Uh, and once we established what the new mission and vision and received the uh, CAB approval concurrence of that, then we went in to establish goals and objectives. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that process once we get there. So here is the new mission statement for the Division of Aeronautics. Very similar to the previous one, there were not major changes made. So the mission of the CDOT Division of Aeronautics is to support Colorado's multi-world transportation system by advancing a safe, efficient, and effective statewide aviation system through collaboration, investment, and advocacy. The primary change that was made was an adjustment. Uh, there used to talk about um, a space uh, in here. We wanted to find consistency with the state, both with the legislation that formed the Division of Aeronautics, but also the aviation system plan uh, that is uh, developed every five years by the division. Vision statement is the vision of the CDOT Division of Aeronautics is to be the leading state aviation organization by enhancing the efficiency, economic benefit, and sustainability of Colorado's aviation system through funding, innovation, education, and support of current and emerging technology. So two primary changes here again with removal of space and the insertion of emerging technology. I'll pause here for a second just if there's any questions uh, of how we got to this point in the process. I just add that uh, you know when we uh, changed it to um, delete the word space, I think we realized we said different space system, and while we do have a spaceport here in Colorado, one airport does not constitute a system, and so I think if it's not consistent with that, certainly didn't mean that uh, it's not an important part of it. it. Might be something to look at down the road, but it just wasn't consistent with the rest of that. And Dave Rubel, the airport director here, was the CAOA rep on the uh, on the committee and, and concurred with that change. So I think that's the Background. And we kind of consider aviation as being all encompassing term rather than a separate exactly from space. Okay. Yeah, what I think one of the discussion points was is that while spacecraft are launching from a, an airport and is in the Colorado airspace, it is part of the aviation system. And we just don't really control anything above the uh, the air that aircraft uh, or spacecraft utilize, uh, but uh, Obviously, we aren't negating the one airport in Colorado with these changes. Uh, they continue to be supported uh, by the division and the aviation system that it's uh, in part of. And also includes the so, exactly. so once we uh, move past the revision of the mission and vision, uh, we solicited uh, information from all of the committee members on the different goals and objectives uh, that they felt were appropriate to help achieve those mission and vision. Uh, we came up with a total of four goals. Uh, there was quite a few more recommended, some dropped off. Doesn't mean that they're gone, they're still in, in the pocket of the division for consideration down the road. Some of them were combined uh, into uh, single goals. Um, and then objectives were attached uh, underneath each goal. I am not going to read each uh, of the words here. I believe uh, everyone had this distributed to them in advance. I will read the goal though uh, for each one that we have there. I'll pause for people if they want to read uh, each of the objectives and if I uh, give time to ask any questions uh, before we go on to the next goal. So the first goal, again, keeping in mind that this is designed to help us achieve the mission and vision that we just talked about, is to engage within the support of the facility technology, the alternative aviation fuels, aviation, air traffic control by the end of this 2020 something. Notice that all of these have by the end of this goal 2020. We wanted to wait 
to insert date there until we received approval of the goals and objectives uh, conceptually. Uh, once we do that, then obviously uh, division staff will want to go in and prioritize, uh, okay, what monies are available, which fiscal year are we going to uh, undertake these efforts in. Uh, that might change the order of the goals, or might change the order of the objective, but it uh, helps to make the goal smart. Uh, smart is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. Key for time-bound is where the end of fiscal 20, uh, 20 X comes into play. Uh, it's important to have a, a target of time to complete each of these models. So I'll pause here if you guys want to read the other five objective pointers here and answer any questions or, or uh, David and Todd uh, can as well. Chick. Question on uh, objective one dash two. Uh, how would you rate that uh, using the matrix to the right? I'm really curious about the uh, sustainable aviation fuel initiatives that are at the federal level and actually internationally. Uh, and then of course, uh, the electric uh, aircraft uh, being developed by BAI and others, uh, even here locally. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, sure, Chick. I think that was a big part of the conversation. I think uh, one of the things, it's not just about electric aircraft, it would also include a potential support for a steady level incentive for the, the um, purchase of sustainable aviation fuel or maybe some kind of incentivization for a production facility here in Colorado. Um, Kenny and I actually had a meeting with a couple of tax policy folks in the governor's office uh, two or three weeks ago. And yeah. They're very interested in pursuing that concept, and I think that aligns with what I think our state's leadership wants to do uh, with that. Of course, you've all heard my love. I love sustainable aviation fuel because it pays the same taxes that we already collect. And, um, it'd be cool to be able to get more airports in Colorado to use it. And I think the other thing that I want to always point out when we talk about and as we get into these discussions about electric aircraft in the future, the big, the big, big uh, challenge will be how the state as well as the airports earn their revenue from electric aircraft mm -hmm. and the formulas mm -hmm. and minimums and everything else that, you know, we could probably have a hand in some of that decision making or guidance. I'll be honest with you, I was having a conversation with uh, Mark on the side during lunch. Um, one of the things I think is really, really cool and important that we do is kind of get out ahead of some of the ideas that come out uh, that want to try to force aviation to do something that other people don't know anything about. One of the concepts that was bandied about last year from the Regional Air Quality Council, Iraq, was a $10 per aircraft operation landing fee on all aircraft in Colorado, airline, GA, whatever, without money going to fund electric aircraft and greenhouse gas mitigation. Well, that's unworkable on so many levels. It's, it, it, it clearly is not, not vested in reality. So what we'd rather do is step up and say, well, hey, let us help you. Let us help you, but we'll use our aviation expertise. And by the way, let us explain to you federal preemption on aviation activities and all those kinds of things that they're not used to dealing with in the electric vehicle world. So I think we can be proactive leaders in this mm -hmm. space. That's a big one, I think, for us. That's probably one of the most monumental ones in the whole. We spent a lot of time on it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. A Thanks. good question. Any other questions on uh, goal one and the objective? Hearing that, we got a goal two, which was to expand the division's outreach, education, and advocacy programs to facilitate engagement with stakeholders and industry partners by the end of fiscal 2020 act. I yeah, got six objectives under here. Uh, a lot about uh, educational opportunities, creating a Colorado Aviation Conference, uh, refining, expanding the economic impact study, uh, really engaging more strategy around the advocacy and engagement of the division. Uh, quite a few uh, things, uh, moving parts here. Any questions on goal two or their six objectives? And one of the things, Jeff, if I could real quick, you were part of our earlier conversation for the board, objective 2-5 is what we talked earlier about leveraging all of you and helping with that outreach and 
educating folks outside of the aviation world and maybe coming up with a plan where you know mm -hmm. we can put some of those things together so that that, that speaks to that uh, i have a question about this one as well one, one of my concerns is that with the small airports managed sometimes by counties uh, and county employees that are not aviation or particularly on the flight line and refueling and things along that line it's not specifically uh, a goal number two issue, but it is an issue, and I think uh, if I could just offer as a as a, uh, a concept, the planners that go out to the field that meet with you know, county employee George, who is the the guy they they grab off of the the uh, bridge uh, uh, team to go and fuel airplanes and things along that line. These folks need an opportunity to have. Experience exposure to training on uh, how to do these functions safely and then how to administer that uh, across the board. It's not at the large airports, it's at the small airports, the, the small GA <coughs> airports, and NATA and, uh, and other entities offer these training opportunities from time to time. And I'm just offering as a suggestion that somehow we incorporate a mechanism to inform those county or those small airport operators that these training opportunities are available uh, and they could partake of it. And perhaps even us having a, an opportunity to fund it uh, as, a, as an outreach. I think it's a safety factor. I think it's an efficiency factor. And I see a need because as I go around the state and I talk to some of these folks, you know, they're, they're trying hard, they want to do the right thing, but they really don't have the background and the experience that we have, especially at the larger airports and things along that line. So I don't know if it fits in two, probably not, but I would put it somewhere in the strategic plan as an opportunity uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the staff to take a look at. Yeah, I think so, I, I, yeah, I, yeah, no, I, I, I would say along Chip's suggestion, I think that's a great idea. And what's so nice about today's day and age, there's a lot of resources like NATA um, that maybe we can, as a state, uh, be a member of NATA and then we can convey um, outreach to these other smaller airports for their training for safety and, and fueling and what have you that typically an FDO might have that membership Sure. And, and do it, but we can negotiate some sort of a statewide program really geared toward our smaller airports and including uh, fuel providers like AvFuel. We've actually recently transferred over to AvFuel for their training program just to kind of mix it up a little bit, make it a little more interesting, a little more modern, you know, so so that's great, George, and I think that for Chip that we could probably uh, look at something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we've done that with the funding of the asphalt uh, yeah. and the pavement maintenance class we did last week yeah. that was funded with a $30,000 grant from the CAOA. So that's certainly something. Uh, so we'll, we'll so, so I really, I really, I really like the idea as well. And I, I do see several spots in here. One is incorporating into the uh, 101 program you know, a list and identification of available training programs out there in the industry, both locally, state level, and uh, national level. Uh, you could also uh, tout that up at the Colorado Aviation Conference, and also during the enhancement of the website, include that information on the website uh, for stakeholders to have access to as well. So great idea, and, and I think we can get that incorporated within these objectives. Any other uh, questions on goal two? Number three. Maybe. Goal three, enhance internal professional development to strengthen the capabilities of the vision by the end of Physical 2020X. This is really focused on uh, really strengthening um, the already strong uh, Division of Aeronautics Management and staff, uh, enhancing their knowledge uh, their exposure to the industry uh, and, and giving them uh, the opportunity. And this also includes the board uh, in that as well. Good 
chair, I'd like to add, we have a cutting edge team here. It's the director and the staff are all top notch, very energetic, very involved. We simply need to reinforce that this is a very valuable uh, development plan for them to maintain that cutting edge technology that they bring to the state. Yeah, I think that's great, Chick. And we did talk about that at length is, you know, I, I think the earlier version was uh, something it was almost worded, let's begin professional development. And, and I think the kind of that's where we came to this enhance because we already have a, a great group of yes. uh, team and it just to continue to sharpen them. But also it's, it's, it's satisfaction and fulfillment in their job, you sure. know, because I mean, they're not, you don't want people to get bored and then they go elsewhere. So if they know they have a voice and they have the opportunity to have input to continue to enhance their education, that makes them a better team member. Exactly. At least it's said in all the great management classes I ever took. <laughs> I think Jefferson had a program. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, to that, to that point, Kenny, you know, one of the things not historically done with the board is done anything for you in doing you know, some leadership things or you know kenny is we're hosting the maseo conference in springs uh, we couldn't afford to send all of you but kenny's got a registration for that so he'll be down there which is cool but um i think we'd love to communicate with you about having you uh, all uh, maybe not just in state but you know if we go to a conference out of state take a board member with some other guys another opportunity is the um Oshkosh. yes on that, on that, that we do every year and i think like trimby would probably really love to she flies all out. Yeah, she can fly us out. Yeah. So, yeah. So, maybe I'll think about what that might look like for you. Great. Could even be something like tax models or something super exciting. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, right. Thanks, Jeff. That's it. Any other questions? Good. Okay, we'll move to goal four. Explore and where appropriate, implement or support new and improved statewide initiatives to sustain the ADA system by the end of the 2020 X. Um, again, really looking at, at expanding the already uh, extensive amount of statewide initiatives uh, that the division have, but adding to that, building on top of what's already there, like the weather camera collaboration uh, with the FAA. Uh, expanding statewide aviation safety education programs. That sort of goes back to that discussion earlier on training opportunities. Uh, certainly continuing to pursue every potential federal and state funding source uh, uh, for the uh, division and, and for the aviation system as a whole. Uh, so I'll pause here to see if there's any questions on goal four and these five underlying objectives. And I think the only thing I might, might come in on there is 4 5, where you know, we have historically not gone too far out of our wheelhouse to ask for other funding sources. And I think now is maybe the time to start doing some more of that. Uh, the big one is the state infrastructure bank loan recapitalization. That's just been a hugely successful program. It's valued at about $26 million with interest, I think, right now, maybe a little less than that. Uh, the struggle we have is all but about $300,000 is out on loan, which is a good problem to have. but. It's, uh, until people start making payments, we don't have any more funding to loan. And it's an awesome program. So I think we've had conversations with uh, the executive director's office and some legislators about maybe we get a one-time general fund allocation and put 10 or $20 million into that, and then it just comes back on itself. So that might be something that we advocate for in the next legislative session. So keep growing. And, and you know, I think uh, one of the great statements about this and how it's been managed is the default of an airport. I don't believe we've ever had an SIB default. Just once. Maybe one, one time it was a minor. It was thing. just delayed. Just it was delayed. a delay. Okay, sorry, no default. Yeah. So we have never had. Yeah. And they, had, the yes. and they so, had done it ahead of time and then they got their hands on it. Right. Like they cleared it. And it right, right. But what that does is, is we have a great track record now. Oh, and, sure. and what's nice is that um, when we talk about tweaking this and, and maybe even have some of the decision making really through the division even a little bit more that we've yep. got something to, to discuss that with the uh, transportation board. Yep. So, 
So I'm gonna um, I'm gonna join George's dumb dumb question club. <laughs> um, it's kind of in for that. I don't know where this fits, but so I'll just kind of throw it. It's sort of in four dash one, but but what a you know what's um, what's our opportunity to roll and and helping support expanding the fire uh, fire support firefighting support air you know aerial firefighting support. I mean it. I mean that's you know it, it goes with. It goes with the overall goal of uh, you know, sustaining the aviation system in the state, which you know, right. which is really, really important to that activity. There's a lot more attention to that. I don't know if that fits here or in another objective, or if it fits at all. But I, but I think it does. Yeah, and that was one that kind of came out of our safety mandate, Mark, where we realized that you know we have 14 commercial service airports in the in the state. They all required by FAA to have aircraft rescue firefighting training. Our GA airports don't. Yeah, no, so I'm, sorry, Mike, uh, sorry, sorry. So I'm not talking about on the ground. I'm talking about aerial oh, yeah, oh, firefighting. I missed that. Which the state okay. does have. Yes. And, and it's, uh, and it's, and, and it's yes. expanding. It's yes. going, to, going to have to expand. Yes. So is there, <laughs> that's why I said that question. I'm not sure where it fits, that, but how do, how do you know, what's our role in that? Or is there a role for us to help support? That's a great question. And, and grow I that. I'd have to think a little bit on that. So um, the state actually has three uh, firefighting aircraft right now. We're about to have the third. The third. Yeah. Uh, so they've got the two multi-mission aircraft, mm -hmm. the Pilatus that they use. Those are operated by the Department of Public Safety. Um, now, the last legislative session, they also got, I don't remember the dollar amount, but they are, the state is buying its own Firehawk, which is basically a Blackhawk yeah. helicopter yeah. converted by Lockheed Martin to fight fires. The state will own and operate that, also Department of Public Safety. Um, I'd have to check and see where we might have a touch point with that. I don't know what that might be. But, uh, well, I, infrastructure, airports. Well, they need our airports. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, and I think that probably kind of falls under sort of the economic development side that that the Division of Aeronautics is always trying to support in terms of overall, because a lot of the specific what you're talking about as far as aircraft rescue or uh, aircraft uh, firefighting capabilities are the three airports and the interesting thing about that is there's still a heavy federal aspect or presence in that because usually the blm or the uh, uh operates our department of u.s forest service hand in hand in terms of managing that they're the ones that have all the contracts for the aircraft the state i think wisely thank god has played more of a role in smaller aircraft for trying to trying to go find these fires when they're small yeah, size, so before they turn into these monster things right. like in California where you basically own a, or you have a contract with a 747 or, or DC-10 or something like that. So um, I think that's a much wiser way and less expensive approach um, to managing the uh, firefighting capability. Well, it also has, I think, I think it has public attention with public so Absolutely. So support. So and I, to, to add, yeah. add and broaden that, that fleet. And I think now is a good time to actually have, that's a great point, Mark, is to have those discussions too, because it always seems that these things happen in the middle of a, you know, awful season. Yeah. And that's kind of how the last one, it's more reactive rather than us having sort of a little more input and thought on how we could continue to enhance and advise the state of Colorado legislature on the next steps, like getting a fire home. One touch we have had to that is Colorado Springs just recently put in a fire and ice pad is what they call it. So it's a, a fire yeah. it's a tanker base in the summer and it's a de ice pad in the winter. We definitely had touch points on that. We were seeing if it was an SIP or a grant, but we put quite a bit of money into that program too. So, I mean, not exactly what you were talking about, but that is, we do have small yeah. pieces. Yeah. Touch but I think what that's in the, the conversation I'm starting here is maybe that's what we sit down and with the Department of Public Safety and say, when you take that Firehawk helicopter to one of our general aviation yeah. airports, what infrastructure do you need? Right. Yeah. Do you need a ramp that supports this much weight because it's heavy, you know, yeah. and it's got little tight tires? Uh, do you need water? Do you need whatever? Maybe that's well, the. And, and having those agreements in place before right. that right. helicopter or, or even other equipment. So, so you got the single engine ones. Yeah, so, so there's another, yeah. you know, another aspect of this, which is. And I don't know, you know, I'm talking through my mouth, I don't know very much about it, but I do know that there is an issue with, um, you know, the aircraft that swoop and, and refill on, you know, they can't do that in Colorado, at least what I've heard because of the invasive species oh, issue. Yeah. No, those actually you can't. You can, they are allowed. Yeah, the federal level, you can't. The state, 
you know, no, um, even at the state level, there is okay. an emergency provision. Okay, if, all right. they, I, they have Good. to get a special dispensation for Parks and Wildlife yeah. to do that. But if there's a fire and they are the, the water pickup, whether it's a helicopter or, okay. or a fixed wing, so that's not an issue. Dispensation to do that. Thank you. I, I had a question that, that uh, our trigger, trigger me, and this yeah. is specific to the ground. Uh, I'm not sure this would go under sustainability or under four, but um, uh, and I think it's more federal, so this, but at any rate, the last reauthorization, the FAA was supposed to report back to Congress on alternatives to PTAS, right. and uh, ha happened to be on a call a couple of weeks ago with, with the FAA and the Big Seven. And they are not going to meet that deadline because COVID, they couldn't do testing. But there are uh, nozzles and other for, for commercial service if, uh, if it's you know, ways to avoid having to spray at least for 139 testing and other things. And I just I, I wonder if it would be helpful at least in seeking federal funding to for, for Helping airports get those kinds of nozzles and kind of encourage them to not use them as fast because it's not. We've had a mission to not do that. Actually, Southwest is going to open the first commercial hangar I'm aware of that doesn't have a PFAS. Right. Um, uh, so, anyway, just wanted to throw that out. I'm going to be a hero, Todd just said. We did that. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, before you joined the board, a couple of years ago, uh, we went to the we went to the board and asked for four hundred thousand dollars for a grant program to fund one hundred percent of the cost for the airports to buy the parts to buy them to do awesome. that. Uh, we were the second state in the country going to Michigan to do something like that. We had every eligible airport take us up on the offer. Kenny got one. Yep. And plus, uh, <laughs> two general aviation airports. Yep. Yeah. Right? Two that so also had RFC. So, yeah, so yeah, it's, 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 it's a hell of a tool. fast with that. We saw an opportunity. And... <laughs> <laughs> in fact, to that note, Gus Sam was the last airport that prepared their tier a couple of months ago and actually okay. passed this meeting and had to go back and partner again with CDP. And do a little release touting what we did. It is really cool. It is cool. <laughs> and this PFAS is very, uh, it's kind of, for those of you, PFAS is a highly toxic chemical. It's found in firefighting foam, a lot of other stuff too, like Vortex and Teflon. But um, in places where it's been used and sprayed, it's gotten in groundwater, it's very pervasive, it's, it's got a lot of problems. Um, it's gotten a lot of attention at the state level at now two. They, in fact, we were just requested uh, for a database of all the airports from uh, CDPHE because they have to do it. They were charged by the legislature with doing inventory of airports that use defects. Um, so anyway, that's that's coming in. The R one, just a little more detail on that is it is becoming more challenging for our smaller and smaller. Um, airports to get our certified for the challenges we have now is you're requiring um, airport firefighters certified, which a lot of smaller airport firefighters are not full on firefighter ones. They're just like both are um, so it's getting harder to train up that it's becoming more expensive. There's another facilities at Casper. Um, can you can maybe speak to the small report? Yeah, so we've been doing the other thing that's kind of added to the challenges is that Salt Lake had closed their fire training center about uh, three years ago, four years ago, for yeah. to make room for a new runway or taxiway, I think, or something. And so there was no alternative because Helena and, and Casper and DIA is in the mix a little bit. Um, but these are things that we have to manage. So what we do actually, um, we kind of started this little on the southwest part of Colorado. And now this year we had, there, we've got a mobile trainer in. And that's where we were having these discussions is, is uh, the state somehow being involved with getting these mobile trainers. It's really cool. They get this few sites in it. It's like a, a trailer prep and, and it has, it looks like an airplane uh, fuselage. And it has a wing that folds down and you can do the engine simulation and the brake fire. It's pretty cool. That's and awesome. you use your own equipment. And so we do it. Um, we've been doing it the last three years at Telluride, and we even invited Durango, Gunnison, um, Grand Junction has even come to that training. And now it's That's they expect incredible. to come to Telluride. They want to come back next year. Yeah. So we were going to mix it up a little bit, but it's kind of a cool thing. And it's with an organization. It's called Part, Part 139 Fires, what they're called. 
and um, they're fantastic. And they're, a lot of those trainers came out of the Salt Lake uh, system. Oh. And so they, they'll rotate uh, volunteers. There might be even DIA someday, uh, yeah. firefighters that go around and they do the training. So it's a little <laughs> more proactive approach that allows you to use your own equipment. And, um, and I think what came out of DIA too was there was a captain or whoever was kind of in charge of that. He retired and oh, we had worked out with him when I was used to be at another airport where, you know, we would sign some kind of a waiver that was approved through uh, Den Legal or, or what have you. So we could still send our airport firefighters to your facility. That was sort of a waiver. So we weren't going to sue Den because our firefighters weren't career firefighters. But this is kind of the challenges when you're dealing yeah. with airport firefighters at small airports, and then you have career firefighters at Den. But I think maybe that's another avenue, George, that you could kind of help facilitate yeah, to I, where absolutely. there could be some kind of a waiver that everybody feels comfortable with by having our having our smaller airports if they want to, probably more in the front range, you know. Yeah. So how much did you have to pay? The legal already doesn't like this, so. so what I, I paid for the simulator and it was we one year we did a 40 hour and we just did the recurrent training. But I, I never I spent about twenty three thousand dollars for everything, which isn't bad. And that's including propane. Because well, they don't have to travel. You don't have any of those expenses to send them away. Right. I mean, yeah. So my budget was, I think, twenty one thousand dollars to send eight people for fire training and it, to go to Salt Lake. So, you know, now I spend twenty three, but I've actually worked it out to where I probably am spending half of that because I'm charging a nominal fee of five hundred fifty dollars per firefighter to come do training to reimburse ours for the fuel and the, the propane and stuff like that. So Ooh. it's a win for us too. It's awesome. So yeah, James, we're, we're, we're not training folks. So Dan is not training folks from around the state at the time they're out there. I, I think it's limited. I think it's been more people that are career firefighters. Career. I think the springs, the springs people that are. Or no, no, sorry, Springs. Springs uses the guard. They have the guard. Is Air Force? Well, Pueblo, Air Force, yeah. Pueblo, yes. Um, Pueblo, yes. And to yeah. the point where they can only use hand lines, they're not allowed to use the trucks. The, the trucks, trucks either. Yeah. So that they really limits. Use any you got to be able to use, you know, I mean, and in the past, just to give you a little bit of history, George, is that the Division of Aeronautics actually owned two trucks. They purchased two trucks. I'm not trying to suggest that because I think some people just about passed out over here, but, but it was kind of a nightmare from maintenance, but then we basically ended up giving one to Den yeah. that was, was utilized in the training and the other one, I think, went to uh, Northern Colorado, Fort Collins or I don't remember. And then, we bought, and then we bought Green. Den another one. Yeah, and then like you bought 2008. Right, then you bought one. Den another one. So we have partnered with Den before, okay. but it just seems to have kind of dissipated a little bit yeah. under some new leadership, perhaps. Okay, let me, uh, I, I would love to help on that. Okay. And so that was one of the Is concepts that, that we talked about was like some of the crack fill program we apply the crack yeah. to have around states and airports and share them. Yeah. Board. We can drag it around the state and we feel like another statewide initiative to have conversations about that. Um, one of the other things I think we saw an opportunity was to get out to a smaller airport. I'll pick up Walden again because the airport got local fire district. We know nothing about responding to the airport. Uh, they might start cutting where you're not supposed to cut. They don't know how to deal with a Cirrus or something like that. Is how can we help those smaller fire districts that don't have power learn something about aviation to be better prepared for their community? And so that was the other next to the park was what else can we do to make aviation safer across Colorado, not just at the commercial service or business? All this has money. So these kind of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think the thing too from our standpoint is, is I think we're just. We've kind of gone down that where we've done general bids for, for products or what have you. It just seems that we want to more empower others to take that role or other airports or what have you. And then you know if, if Den decides, hey, we're gonna we're gonna get engaged in training with other airports and stuff, then you come to us and we'd be happy to probably consider buying you a fuel a fire truck and you maintain it and everything else in your fleet as an example. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, whatever it costs to do the, yeah. the in the larger aspect of this, I mean you're able to, to carve out 23 grand for budgeting for 
Absolutely. Yeah. But when you go to the Eastern Plains, I mean, there's some of these fire departments any money. This would least, exactly. This would give them yeah. the availability to, to train on an actual aircraft, to go full scale exercise, yeah. bring in everybody. And that's kind of the thought process behind this. But I didn't even know they, the group you did exist there, my computer or Google. Or it's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And they have some good stuff. And they, yeah. they've done vehicles and, and things like that. But but I think that's a really good, um, good way to sort of look at alternatives and, and keep everybody. But the big thing, I think the point of this discussion too, was you have those mutual aid fire departments that show up at these general aviation airports and have no clue. Right. No clue, and just start cutting yeah. and yeah. dragging things away. And, and, and how, I mean, even if you just world. send one or two, one person from one of those rural fire districts, you could, that, they could be that expert, you know? And of course we all know firefighters love training and credentials, you know? Yes. So that's what they spend all day here, especially in rural areas. But let me tell you. Don't let me vent. Well, I will point out that uh, Todd is a firefighter. I'm taking the test today to get another one. You got it. Uh, 4, 445, that's what you got to do. And then you, it's kind of like a general or a military, you have all these ribbons that you wear on your uniform, right? OK. I'll have fun. <laughs> you ain't have fun. Sorry, we beat that to death. Sorry about that, Jeff. No, no problem. These are actually some of the things I I I enjoy. Can you hear me? Hold on, Chip. I'd like to ask to go back to uh, goal number two, and just a comment about objective two dash two. Uh, that's the economic uh, impact study. That was a very powerful uh, result of a lot of hard work, but it was seven years apart. And I would uh, offer that uh, given the, uh, the growth of the state and the income and things along that line, that we seriously consider moving that window down to four or five years. I know you talked about five years, perhaps even sooner. I don't know if it's feasible with the amount of work that goes into it, but the end product is so powerful that it talks to aviation that, that politicians and newspapers and people like that can go out to the public and simply make the case for our industry for us. So I would simply suggest that uh, that if you could put a date against that or a frequency against that, so uh, that would probably be a good idea. That's a great point. Chick. Yeah, and this one, Chick, too, was also offered. I think one of the things that, that you've realized that we, we did a study, we send out the press release, we tell the reports, here's your report, follow up and say, here's how to use the data, here's what this term means, here's how to articulate this in your local community. So what we talked about here was doing a briefing like at CIOA and doing a little two hour seminar. Here's how to use the stuff we put together for you. Um, one of the things that we did that we did pay extra for is we have a dynamic job where the airport has to go in and say, here's my number that came out of the study, but I'm going to add this business or this air service or this new feature, type in some numbers, it'll spit out updated numbers based on that potential development. I don't think that that so, so we talked about how we might be able to better educate our airports on what we're providing. And I think that What's really nice is our, our recent economic impact study was set up in such a way to allow that, like a potato head version yeah. of how easy it is so that when we do update it in five years or so, it can be, uh, it's a little more, you are comparing apples to apples. And, and I think they did, uh, what is it, uh, Kinley Horn. Kinley Horn did that and they did a great job. It'll take, uh, from the timing perspective, from the time you get them under contract, the time it's going to be about 18 months. So yeah. you'll probably see us try to start that in 2023, which is hard to believe, with a 2025 report. Um, they run, and again, there's a cost of those. We don't want to do them too often because they do run. The last one was just a tag of ours. So they're, they're expending, they're not eligible for federal funding. And the system plan with the economic impact study is so, um, uh, that's a good thought. But in 23, you'll see a number of that. Yeah. And as the staff, we learned a lot about how to do that as well. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You guys are experts. You oh, can almost yeah. do it yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Kate, I'm just starting. Yeah. 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 And Scott is really having a hard time. Yeah, yeah. Scott is <laughs> well, <laughs> far away up. He's having a peak here. So, can we go back? Thanks, Jeff. We okay, we'll go back to four. Just one quick question. Uh, can we? Uh, go ahead. 
Yep. Can you talk to four three? Can you talk about um, app based images? I mean, uh, dissemination is that through commercial apps like four flag or interfacing with those? Yeah. And it's really nothing that we yeah, do directly, but we told that FAA has to develop the APIs on it. So maybe yeah. know a lot more about that. Um, but we, uh, Tyson Way, the, the yep. CEO of Fourth Flight, was in Aspen. He and I talked all the time. Those were the last ones. So they were a phone company. So uh, we would love to find a way to work with FAA and private industry where we're on Four Flight when we get into the yeah. that we were talking about. It's just a, it's a, it's a link. Yes, because yeah. that's not a rock. That is not a rocket science. Yeah, it's not. And one of the things that uh, I'll be honest with you that, that you know we do weather cameras with FAA. Part of me wants to say, well, how about for everybody else in the world? I don't know what it costs to develop an app API. But what if we pay twenty five grand to do it because you don't have the money? Yeah. I mean, you develop it in Colorado, and share it with Montana, and everybody else is there. So. Fantastic. That may be the conversation. Fantastic. Money is holding it back. Let us help you out. Fantastic. I gotta tell you, I tell you right, I can't tell you the positive feedback you've been getting from users. Awesome. Uh, yes, yes. That's cool. Okay, yeah, we're gonna talk more about that in a little bit. Well, these are the kind. They have my hand up. <laughs> so these are great discussions. These are some of the reasons I love facilitating. Uh, business planning and working with uh, organizations like yours and a lot of these discussions are taking place at the uh, committee planning level and uh, here again at the uh, board level and it's always a dynamic in here the different perspectives uh, from different stakeholders and their experiences in the industry so, great discussion so uh, once you guys have finalized your review and potential approval of those uh, four goals and associated objectives uh, to will facilitate working with uh, division staff, providing them action plan templates similar to what we did uh, three years ago, which will identify the who, what, when, where, why, and how uh, each of the objectives uh, will be established. And obviously uh, the board and, and division management staff will have to be involved at the budgetary level because some of these objectives do require funding. I think as Dave just talked about having a handout here. So. And then once the action plans are uh, finalized, then it's uh, the implementation. And I think one of the things that uh, uh, the division and the board did a really good job of over the last three years is continuing to check the progress, make the necessary adjustments, report back, to the board, review and revise as necessary to continue moving forward towards the uh, establishment and achievement of the mission and vision. So that really uh, wraps up my side of things. Happy to answer any other questions and answers as I'm sure uh, David is integral in the process uh, will as well. Jeff, do you have, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, do you have a sample of one of the action plans that you could put up for them to see? Um, if you give me just a few moments, I'm, I'm certain I can. Yeah, no, uh, I'll, yeah, thanks Jeff. I'm sure Todd can do it if, if that's good for you. Yeah, I can do it. Well, yeah, go ahead. Go for it. So this is what one of the action plans would look like. This is from our previous or our current uh, plan. But each one of those goals and objectives, we have a sheet like this that would say how we're going to do it, who's going to do it, what the time frame is, how we're going to do it. And so we'll have again, one of these for each objective, and we'll share what we did three years with the with the board every every six months or so. It's uh, you know, to you all that often. 
that's how we're going to track how we're doing on each of those. And Jeff has prepared these for us sort of all of our new strategic plan goal. How tangible are the metrics typically? I think they're pretty good. Most of those do have an outcome, like, you know, hey, we stood up this new training program, we're going to conduct it at CAOA. Some of them are a little fuzzier. It's like ongoing. And, you know, last time we had a lot of ones that were ongoing because it was fixed or financial. You kind of code that, you know, uh, stop like. Like a stoplight to say, you know, this program's great program for all. Yep, and we have been doing that with some of those on the with that. Sean and I have problems because we're ready to call it one, but it's not a glitch on it. But that's get weird colors. And, uh, and to, you know. to Jeff Coleman's credit, that's one of the biggest things that he has been hammering us about as we put these together is that there are the things in the world. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think he did a good job on that. Great. Smart, right? Thank you, Carrie. Smart is smart. Jeez, I almost forgot that. All right. I think that's it. Thank you so much, Mr. Coleman. My pleasure. Thank you for uh, uh, providing AMCG the opportunity. I enjoyed it and look forward to continuing to work with the division and the board. I think a latte with uh, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Jeff, I'd like to tell you to maybe uh, send us or link us to those, uh, that presentation. We did. We'd like to use a couple of those slides for our board meetings. Yeah, not a problem. I think I emailed it to you, so you have it. Oh, okay, cool. I'm sorry if I missed that. All right, we got it. Got it. Okay. All right, well, have a safe flight. Thank you all. Thank bye bye. You. Don't want to take a quick break. Right. Yeah, that's good. Take a break. Stay everywhere. Stay everywhere. Yeah, it would just be the camera. Oh, Tyson, those guys are so good. It's just, it's just a matter of having them and the access on the back end. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah. So is Jacob's still Hey, last year college. Doing a good job taking care of the yards. He's doing better. Yeah. Not to my liking perfection, but I understand. You know, every time I come home, I have to vote. Yeah. But you bring all your clothes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 You were just there yesterday. Or no, oh, Sunday. I'm sorry. Oh, so, come, come on, all. Yeah. So I had to go from. Yeah. Uh, we're not. Ever, we're not excited. Oh, <laughs> One of the things that uh, we're going to bring to you all tomorrow for potential action um, is a phase three aviation weather camera partnership with uh, the FAA. So. I think you all know that a couple months ago we finished up phase two, which installed um, the aviation weather cameras at 10 airports. And that was in addition to the 13 we did uh, in 2020 when we put them on our Mount Bay, Washington. So we have a total of 23 installations now, four cameras each. So almost 100 cameras in total, which has been very cool. And that, of course, has been done under that awesome partnership with the uh, FAA's Alaska Weather Camera Team through a reimbursable agreement. We cut the FAA a check to do the work for us. They fly down, put all cameras on, uh, and go home. It has been a really cool partnership. Uh, we were the first state outside of Alaska to do that, which is pretty cool. Since then, Hawaii and Montana have joined the fray, and now the weather camera program has interest from about a dozen other states. So one of our fears is that um, pretty soon that small team is going to get overwhelmed and not be able to keep yeah. up with the demand, or it's going to get acquired by a larger, less nimble part of FAA. It's not as easy to work with. We kind of want to capitalize on our, our first in relationship with, with them. And so um, what we would like to propose, given our financial position and the current opportunity we have with FAA, is to expand that to potentially the final batch of another 20 um, cameras uh, next year which would be uh, the cost estimates just a tick under $400,000 that we rounded up to accommodate any contingencies. But that's approved by you all tomorrow. We would do the same kind of schedule. We'd negotiate the scope with FAA, negotiate and pay the reimbursable over the winter. They would design the installations and then next year come out to the airports that we pick to do those. Um, I don't have a list of airports to propose. Like, 
we used the phrase horse trading before we were having conversations about which airports we think would be uh, the most valuable. Um, we would like to put some out on the Eastern Plains. The problem is with the cameras out there, they either show that it's crystal clear or you can't see anything because there's no physical reference typically that's, that you get like in the mountains. So I think we do want to put some out east, but I think we'd like to continue focusing on some of our other mountain airports with those cameras as well. So if you all approve that, we'll develop that proposed list and bring it back to you in October um, for your vetting. We'll visit with the airports that we think and make sure they're interested. Um, unlike the uh, uh, the first batch that went on the actual AWOS units for simplicity's sake, the ones that are going on airports were going on buildings and hangars and things like that because there's complexities we found out and added to the actual weather station. Right. Um, so, um, like Kennedy's, I think you're selling your hops building your terminal. Yeah, it's our just our main terminal. Building. So, that would give us time over the winter to reach out to the airports and say, here's what we expect from you. You've got some skin in the game and you can provide power and a place for the cameras to go. Are you interested? So that is our proposal. And we had talked originally about an aspirational goal of trying to get cameras on every one of our 53 or so. 50, 62. No, airports with weather. 50. 50, that's what I thought. <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, airports with certified aviation weather. But we realized that at about 20 grand a piece, it may not make sense to do that at any airport out there. Um, so 20 would get us to all but about 10. <laughs> We'll come back for phase four, but I think we can knock out the We continue the maintenance program as well. We do. And so we pay for the maintenance, at least for the first three years. By that was the MOU we have the airport sign. They really take very little maintenance. Uh, the airports have agreed to, hey, if you need a power cycle or something, you're going to do that for us. But um, our intent, Chick, long term would be that we would add these into our AWOS maintenance program and, and, and incur the cost, but it's pretty minimal. They even, they even give you an extra camera. Yeah. So here, here's an extra one in case one yep. of these goes out. Okay. Wow. So that's our proposal for tomorrow. No action today. I'm just happy to answer any questions for you, but I think it's been a huge safety program and, and the FAA is willing to jump in and committed to being able to do that schedule-wise next summer again. So we, we do have a commitment for that. I think that's, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think you hit it too, is that this is going to gain rapid or it already is. Uh, popularity and we need to take advantage our windows closing in other words because this is the crew i want this crew to be exactly. phenomenally efficient so a little inside baseball with the faa a lot of this kind of of faa stuff and this is considered a non-federal nav aid um, a lot of that stuff is is managed under the tech ops group of faa tech ops that are listening out there, I apologize, but they don't have a reputation as being the most nimble and customer service focused group within FAA. And so they're, they've been making inside baseballs take over the, <laughs> the weather camera program because they want to they want to brag about the success of somebody else's work. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, the team is great. And it's the same band that we've had for the last two years. It's a crew that knows how to work. And man, they get down here and just knock them out. The two guys from Wasilla. Yeah. Great guys. Yeah, they're actually Lidos. Lidos, how do you say that? Lidos. Lidos is yeah. the contractor that yep. does a lot of that work. So, so that's it. Great. Okay. And currently, there's only three other sites in the U.S. other than Alaska. There's one in Hawaii that's live now. Yeah. Oh, and there's two in Montana. Two in Montana. Two in Montana. So, uh, one of the other things that uh, that they're doing, just as a side note, is they're working on developing, which is kind of cool. The same group is working on developing what would be called it's like an AWOS light. Um, it's like basically it would be certified aviation weather, but not at the quarter of a million dollar cost of an AWOS installation. It would be one that would be potentially solar powered, um, which AWOS are not allowed to be solar powered. They've got to have hardware power. So we would really have some cool opportunities to put more of those in the mountains if we didn't have to have a full AWOS. So mm -hmm. we're excited about their development of that technology. They've been really pressured by the aviation community to come up with better, better so aviation. Have to hit the ski areas. Uh, yeah, but they've been they've been testing a few out in Alaska and trying to validate the, the readings next to a certified system doing all the testing because it, obviously it needs to be done. But you know, for us, you know, we don't need AWOS threes in the mountains. AWOS threes report weather that you need to shoot a cat two ILS. Yeah. You know, nobody cares if it's off by two hundred feet when you're picking your way across Berkeley Path. Right. So it's, it's not it, worry it kind of kills us to spend two hundred yeah. grand on an AWOS yeah. on an AWOS unit. It doesn't necessarily need to be certified, but that's the only way you can get data into the system. So we're 
excited about that opportunity and what we can do down the road. Right? And then the reason this, and the other one they will talk about later, needs to be approved by the board is it wasn't in our budget that you guys approved right. back in January. Uh, again, back then our revenue forecast in the year was 15 million. <laughs> right now we're showing, again, for this fiscal year now currently, it's 30, I think it was 20 at the time. It's 33 now with, with a little bit of recovery. So anything that wasn't approved kind of in bulk at that time, it was due to that audit cost center. We have to come to you guys at a board meeting, get an action item on there, and officially uh, have you approve that. So that's why it's a little different, uh, just simply because that wasn't on the budget back in January. Cool. Let's go to the next one. All right. So the next one is also uh, uh, an additional budget request to add, and that would bring back a two hundred thousand uh, dollar funding line item in FY twenty two funding for a sort of reframe alternatively powered aircraft infrastructure study. And for those of you that are new on the board, some of this happened before before you all joined. But back in December of nineteen. The CAB endorsed the concept of us funding a study to evaluate the potential airport infrastructure needs in Colorado that would be related to the development of a new and evolving generation of electric aircraft. That following January 2020, uh, CAB formally approved $200,000 in funding for FY21, which would have started July 1st. But of course, in March, April, wheels fell off the bus. And in April, we came to the board with a recommendation to pull a lot of stuff back. And that was one of those things that we pulled back. So, um, that said, I was disappointed that we had to do that at the time, um, but some really cool stuff has happened um, in the meantime. And let me back up real quick. What we had kind of envisioned that that study would have looked at back then was sort of an overview of the industry, what's happening with aircraft certification, sales, demand, production, like we talked about. You know, it's one thing to design an airplane, it's another thing to turn it into mass production that's profitable and sustainable. Um, what kind of charging infrastructure would you need? You know, it's kind of up in the air. Every airplane has a different demand. How do you get a standard plug? You know, where does it go? How is, how is it funded? Does it go on a ramp? Does it go somewhere else? What do you do with it? Um, how do you pay for it? You know, what kind of mechanisms can you use to uh, uh, to pay for it? Sorry. Uh, and then lastly, you know, what kind of policy rate you need to change on registration fees and things like that. But since that last since April, there's been some really cool things made by other. And I don't know. There's Scott Carey from NREL. I see him joining. So um, I've known Scott for probably 15 years. Uh, Scott's an airport engineer and uh, now is the ports and electrification program manager for the National Renewable Energy Lab. And they are doing, and I'll circle back to Scott, they're doing some really cool um, work at places like DFW and Los Angeles World Airports on aircraft or airport resiliency, electrical grid. Uh, things like that. So they would be a great partner. They are about to study or about to publish um, a broader study on airport electrification. Uh, NASA's Aeronautics Mission Research Directorate has recently partnered with the Georgia Institute of Technology, and I shared with you the link. They just released a model regional air mobility analysis that was kind of based on that aviation nine seat electric aircraft that Cape Air or regional airlines are very interested in. What does that look like from a passenger model standpoint? Where do people want to go? How could they go places? It's very, it was really technical about the decision that people make on short trips between picking a car and picking an airplane. And, and I toured that aircraft on, on Thursday in uh, Arlington, Washington. And so it's not a it's not a theory, it's not a paper tiger. It's uh, and I have a picture I can show you uh, of the group. Uh, tw twin motor, um, 421, 420 mile uh, range, um, using all, all off the shelf technology. So it's it's tangible. You can touch it. It's going to happen. It's well funded. Um, and it's kind of just being done quietly compared to some of the other um, uh, other developments that are a little bit more um, marketing focused than, than that. So and what's interesting is their concept is that for airports that um, early on for airports that um, the aircraft will operate in on a regular basis, you know, they'll help them design and put in a permanent um, in, you know, implementation, but they um, also for airports that are frequently or infrequently used or um, and don't, or don't, aren't able to put in the infrastructure, you know, they'll have uh, the recharge capability. They already have a recharge capability on a trailer. And so the truck will come to the, to, to the airport. That's cool. It's way cool. It uses uh, 
Tesla like plugins and uh, it's uh, it's you know, very real. So that's exciting stuff. And I got to so that and then the airport cooperative research program, which is an arm of the federal transportation research board uh, here in a couple of months is going to release their ACRP report on electric aircraft on the horizon. It's going to have a lot of information in it too. And so the good news is by postponing it, there's a lot of progress that's been made by others. We'll be able to leverage and do something even more cool. So um, I would love, as we talked a little bit about earlier, I think in doing the strategic plan is I get really excited when I look at our network of 76 airports around Colorado where the infrastructure is already there, the runways are there, the ramps are there. Um, we don't have to build new fancy bird ports downtown and figure out how to power those and do all that. But we have the potential, I think, to, to really enable some cool new mobility in Colorado with these aircraft going from places that you wouldn't think of today, like maybe there's Boulder to Centennial or you know, Pueblo to Colorado Springs or somewhere on the western slope where now all of a sudden with electric aircraft, it makes it cost effective to do it. They're small enough, they don't require aircraft rescue firefighting. They're small enough, they don't require TSA. Um, it's it's going to be awesome, I think. And I would love for us to lead the way about how we can support those here in Colorado. Um, so that's kind of the essence of, of the scope that, that I'm kind of interested in. Um, again, I, my philosophy is, I know Mark and I have talked a little bit about it, I think flying cars are cool. Um, I'm not really interested in doing anything to fund uh, urban EV tolls and things like that. There's other folks doing that kind of stuff. But we have the flying car, the initial flying car at Meadow Lake Airport. Oh, I know that the, the, the most Taylor Aero car. Is <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. So, and Sweeney owns it. Uh, again, I get excited about these more traditional kind of aircraft that, as Mark said, they're, they're not high in the sky. They're not a video or a rendering that a lot of these things are. They're not. Billions of dollars of material and that's tax money. <laughs> you know, they're, they're really things that are flying today. So I think what I would love us to see this broadly, and I would, I would love to come back with more detailed scope if you're all amenable to this tomorrow. But sort of again, an overview of the current state of the, of the industry and, and, and pilot certificate, that would still be the same. And I would love us to see us maybe bring in like a NASA or a Cape Air or some of these uh, regional airlines that have expressed interest in these airlines and saying, hey, if you're going to fly in Colorado, want to fly using our airport map to bring them in and say how do we do that at these airports. Um, take a look at the, the infrastructure needs, the capacity, um, and the smaller GA training aircraft. You know, my aerospace is still working on theirs. I think they're close to certification. Um, and you know, if those come to fruition, I think that has the fundamental ability to really transform the way airports like Centennial and Rocky Mount Metro operate with GA airplanes. That would come cool. Um, I'd love us to look, you know, in partnership with folks like NREL, you know, what kind of potential for on airport renewable generation or solar is there to power this stuff, you know, rather than taking it off the grid and doing some cool stuff with there. And Scott, get ready. I'm going to put you on the spot here in a minute to talk a little bit about that. <laughs> um, talk about how we fund it, you know, where does that money come from? Uh, we don't have the ability to fund a lot of it with an $8 million grant program, but maybe this is an opportunity to go visit a kid or governor, legislature. Yeah. United just put in an order for like a hundred electric aircraft. Right. So there may be, I mean, I'm not going to volunteer. Sure. To it, but there are big hubs for them and might be worth uh, we'll have competition. And I would love to pull all those folks in and talk about how we do that here in Colorado. And then lastly, I think, as we talked about briefly, it's not just electric, you know, there's hybrid, you know, hydrogen fuel cells are becoming yeah. a thing. Uh, there's the conversation about, you know, maybe I've seen a Dash 8, and I think an ATR 72, where they're a hybrid. There's a jet fuel turbine engine that powers an electrical generator that runs the motors, just like a diesel engine in a or a, or a Prius, for that matter. So, uh, and then lastly, I think certainly not a, a, an inconsequential piece at all, but I would love us again to look at opportunities to incentivize and encourage the development of sustainable aviation fuel infrastructure, including the you know, potential for in state production. That somehow, and that's a policy thing more than just funding the development of that, but supporting that policy. So that's kind of my uh, aspirational dream for this little two hundred thousand dollars study. And if you all are uh, amenable to that, what I'd like to do is over the next couple of months, I talk with Mark, maybe meet with Mark and Scott Carey, and a lot of people way that help smarter than me, and say, how uh, what should we be looking at? Come up with a scope, figure out a way to procure it. Maybe partner with NREL, partner with NASA. We can do reimbursable agreements with federal agencies. We have a lot of cool opportunities to bring in a lot of you know, people and maybe make Colorado a leader in this arena. That's my dream.
Well, it's good to have dreams. Anybody, <laughs> anybody else have any? What sure. about hydrogen? I think that's pretty cool. So Scott, are you on the phone, Scott? Good. I am. So I want to introduce Scott Carey. Scott, I'll let you introduce yourself. So we're talking about all this. I think you heard it. The question was, what about hydrogen? So maybe I'll turn it over to you and you can fill us in on what you know from your world. Sure. So um, just quick background. I spent, I've, I've worked with a few of you over the years. Um, I worked in aviation consulting in Colorado for almost 20 years um, and then transferred over to uh, NREL and, and working across all the different groups at the lab, taking what these amazingly brilliant people um, and what they've been doing on ground transportation systems and energy systems for you know, almost 40 years. Um, the next step for the lab really is they're up to class eight trucks. So the next challenge is really aviation um, and trying to help that whole industry grow, um, help with some of the standardization um, and make this um, go through the different technologies and help put out some of the right information uh, to let people make decisions on where they want to go. So uh, the question was uh, hydrogen. Um, we have started talking about this as overall um, sustainable aviation is how we've been approaching it. And we include in that um, future fuels to meet uh, CAFE standards, of course, CIA standards, um, and that could be biofuels. With that, you can blend in hydrogen and some other um, methods to make some of those systems. Then you go to electrification, which goes to the batteries and the aircraft like aviation and others. And they're generally right now, they're hitting about 500 miles of range. <clears throat> the reason they're hitting 500 miles is because the battery technology hasn't caught up to get lighter to be able to go further. Because um, you can only put so much weight on that aircraft and still use it. So that's where hydrogen starts to come in, um, between 500 and 1,000 miles on the aircraft. And then also as storage, long-term storage on airports. So you don't have to necessarily increase the size of, say, the um, electrical feed going in the San Luis Valley. You could store that as hydrogen and put that out through a hydrogen, um, a fuel cell back out as electricity when you need it, when you have that big surge that comes in um, at the request to actually charge an electric vehicle. So that, those are kind of the places right now in hydrogen. So we see what we're hearing from, um, from ATAG and from industry is that electric is really the target at zero to 500 miles. And then as you go from 500 to 1,000, hydrogen starts to make more sense. And over 1,000, at least for the next 20 plus years, it's really liquid fuels. Um, trying to, and then coming up with better ways to do liquid fuels. Um, trying to hit some of the targets that have been set. Does that help? That's awesome. No, that's awesome. Scott, can you talk a little bit about some of the cool work that's been done down at DFW, or at least to the extent you can, uh, some of the bigger hub airports? Oh yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's it's things that I would have never never thought of as a as a typical consultant. Um, so what we're doing at DFW is uh, helping DFW look at their landside vehicles, their terminal, and their airside to try and predict when people are going to be at the terminal better, and then adjust the systems throughout the terminal and then potentially airside for an airside optimization of gates and um, uh, employee movements um, throughout those systems. And so we started on the land side with a program called Athena. Um, and what it did was took in all of those, those amazing um, systems that we have right now with all the mass transit and said, where are people uh, coming from and where are they going? And they could predict to within like five cars, um, how many people are going to be on the curb um, on, say, a Tuesday afternoon based on the flight schedule at each, at each of the, the locations. And we're now chasing that into the terminal to say, okay, based on that, can we make the cost of energy cheaper by shifting when we heat and cool that building? 
um, they have probably 15 megawatts in heating and cooling on that, on that facility. So um, those are some of the pieces and that's expanding now. Department of Energy is paying for a significant portion of that because it's research that can help all airports is the, the idea. Um, and they have a few things that they are taking on themselves that are more targeted for their facilities and looking at lowering their energy costs, um, looking at storage and how to make sure that they have, they have higher uptime on the, on the facilities. So that's a portion of it, Dave, yeah. Cool. And we also have, I would say the other thing that's going on right now is um, uh, the FAA has asked us to dive into the first piece and then NASA is right behind. But uh, FAA asked first for us to look at urban air mobility, electrical infrastructure to assist with their guidance. And then now we have, based on that RAM study from NASA, um, they just finalized and got funding over for us to look at the regional impact of uh, what their study could do to electrical, uh, essentially across the states, and what that means in terms of cost and where that might go. So there's just some of the things we're working on. That's exciting. Cool stuff. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate your time. Scott? Yeah, no worries. But we got a question uh, from George. No, I'm just going to say, okay. Jim, the next time you're looking for a mid-continent hub airport, <laughs> uh, I've got one a little closer to home. <laughs> yeah, just down the street from me there, Scott. Uh, you hey, um, Go ahead. Scott, Scott Morrissey has been at the lab many times. I will say that. And if, if there's more things you want to do closer, we'd love to love to talk more. So we, we don't want to travel either. So <laughs> I, I, I think that's what George is saying. If you guys get some crazy ideas, I think uh, you have some good partners over at Den. Absolutely. Well, I would start there before you go to DFW. <laughs> <laughs> and I certainly think they'd be a great partner. And one of the things I'd like to explore over the next couple of months, and Scott and I've talked a little bit about it, is there may be opportunity to build on our $200,000 with some contributions with NASA. And, and, and REL, and maybe we all contribute a little bit of something and do something even more uh, yeah. profound. So uh, we're cool. going to talk about that. But my goal would be that maybe I come back with a more specific scope of work and list of partners for our October meeting and work on that over the next couple of months. We just have information on the hydrogen subject. Uh, one of the uh, companies that's really investing a lot of money, um, and I listened to a presentation talk to them at Oshkosh, is uh, Airbus. Oh. So if you go to if you, you uh, Google Airbus uh, Zero E, uh, they have a good video out there, but, okay. but a lot of uh, a pretty serious uh, investments and serious work being done by that particular manufacturer. Um, on um, they uh, they they believe that that's the path versus all electric. Well, that concept of storm electricity is hydrogen. It's just, yeah. I mean, I'm not an engineer, it's just mind blowing. I mean, you take it, convert it to hydrogen, save it until we need it, and it turn it back into electricity. That's and it's pretty, and it's pretty safe. It's one yeah. hell of a capacitor, I guess. It's, it's very safe. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. We can just get past the hand, but come on, Kenny, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> well, it wasn't the hydrogen that burned. Right. Right. It was, right. It was, it was the mud. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was the skin. Yeah. That's a great point. So, well, great. Uh, anything else you want to talk about? No, that's it. Unless you have any other questions on that. Anybody, any? any I just will say this is one of the things that you know our division. I know you guys we harp on all the time. Sean's been here a long time, you know, and since 1990 when we stood up this division, we've always done cool stuff, and I love that we still have a board that loves doing cool stuff. Um, and that makes I think our job fun. Every every agency gives out grants. Every agency does PCI inspections. We'll always love doing those too. But we really get excited. I think about doing cool, innovative stuff. And it's, it's kind of proud to stand up. With yeah, we're doing that. Yeah. You know, yeah. So thank you. I mean, it means a lot to us. Support us. You're not doing it. You're leading the pack. We're yes. trying, but it's uh, it's fun. Well, that's that's what we like to pride ourselves on. Right? Fun. Well, and I think you know, I think the big thing is we do cool stuff, but we do it so we can make the system safer and a lot more efficient. And I think it really justifies uh, us taking money from. Uh, you know, in the form of fuel sales tax to do cool stuff. I mean, a lot of people hate taxes, but I think if you're an aviator, I would be happy to pay this tax because it, it really helps the system. It brings more people to our state. Um, it just, it's a, it, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm a huge, I love what I do. And the things that we're talking about is not if, it's when. I mean, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, if we talked about 
that there would be automobile manufacturers saying they're going to be all electric, you know, you know, and there'd be as many electric cars out there. Now we, we want, yeah, 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 not in our lifetime, and it is in our lifetime. So yeah. it's you know, there's there's all kinds of challenges here, especially in a, in a regulated world that aviation lives in. But um, but there are people that are they're gonna it, it's gonna be small small fast steps, and if we can be supportive of that, and not reactive, you know. Um, you know, we'll become, um, you know, a good test ground, I think, for, for and that attracts, that attracts money and, and jobs to Colorado. And that's another part of what I think, you know, in a, in a secondary role that we're responsible for, too. Well, and you look at the 500 mile range that Scott talked about, I know the deviation is looking at that gets you from any point to point in Colorado. Yeah, you know, so that's right. Well, and a big piece of this as well is, I mean, if we're talking, whatever money we're talking about this program, I mean, that money does come out of the grant program, but what's cool is, I mean, we're investing in the future of the state as right. well. We're preparing for a future state for these airports. That it's not a direct grant to an airport, but in the long run, that's what we're preparing for is getting those airports right. ready for what will be coming down the right. pipe. So that, that's what's, I, that's where we get the investment from the airports directly as well, which is nice. That's cool. Yeah, and I, I would say too is a couple of comments I'd make is that one is when you have emerging technologies and fuels and alternatives, the, and I think what I like about our board as well as our environment and our people like NRAIL and Scott Carey and what have you is we can kind of wade through, let's call it those shark infested waters looking for the whale. You know, that, okay, this is real, this is provable. This has a track record or potentially could be very successful. So we're not going down a, a path wasting our time and money. But the other thing that I always would say, and I think that's what would, would be so nice about this study is, uh, is there is an economic aspect um, to us greedy airport managers. We're always, what's in it for us? How are we going to make our money? And, you know, and I think that's what the division is, uh, a, a big part of the division is, ability is to help those airports to try to be self-sustaining financially. And I always say, I don't, I, I know I've said this before, but I mean, that's something that, you know, me that makes our money off of fuel and the thought of putting in a, going to have that conversation with me or with an FBO and saying, well, why don't you put this nice little electric charging station in? Uh, why the hell would I do that when I make $4 a gallon of fuel, you know? So, so those are the things that we have to be really balanced about when we start presenting this to the airports uh, and what have you. Every step of the way, there's a way to make it self-sustaining, right? So you want people, you want FBOs, you want airports to say, yes, I, I will put that in. You want DIA to be all about that. So, And we want to be part of the group that's determining how that works, not yeah. someone does it say, here's how it works, and we have to deal with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's all kinds of weird FAA policies too, obviously, with right? assurances, and we've heard stories of airports wanting to, I know Scott and I've talked about this, where you put a, a charging unit on the fence. That side's the ramp, that side's the parking lot, it does both. Well, the FAA sometimes doesn't take a very great view of that if you're using an aeronautical function for non aeronautical purpose. So maybe that's a policy thing, maybe a tackle with the FAA, you know, from a higher level to allow something cool like that to happen. Yeah. Uh, or maybe it just doesn't happen. I don't know. But those are the kinds of things that come up. Uh, in the policy realm, um, or is an airport allowed to tack on a surcharge if you choose to put in a charger? Can you add a kilowatt hour surcharge to that to recoup your you know, infrastructure cost and your operating cost and all that? So, is that policy? I don't know. Does that policy allow you to do that? In Colorado, I don't know. Right so, well, I think about a few years ago. I mean, this is just kind of a good lesson learned. Is a few years ago we were very excited about UAVs and what was our role going to be. And you know, the one thing I always would question, I thought, you know, every great UAV or program or something like that, we're always vertical takeoffs. You know, you don't need an airport for that. And so here we are today, and there's more UAVs out there than ever, and they're all the same thing, they're vertical takeoffs, and, you know, we have controls in place. So, but there were some kind of some wingnut operations, you know, at various airports that were approached. I, I think about the Alamosa story, do you remember? The flying trash cans, remember those, that, oh, those yeah. discussions? And they were going to basically, that was one of the reasons they were giving up their 139 certificate and all this other stuff that we're going to be the UAV center. Yeah, and that just that. went away. You know? So that's what I mean is that I think we have enough knowledge, but I think what I really feel good about is the talent we have uh, on, on, in this room and as well as uh, resources that we have. That's uh, great. 
So let's, anything, anything else? Anybody else have any comments? Or? Thanks, Scott. You're yeah, welcome Jim. to hang out and talk uh, uh, cab meeting agenda formats if you have any thoughts on that. I, I think I'm good. All right. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> thanks, Scott. <laughs> talk to you soon. Jake, have a great one. See ya. I, I just had one day, question for Dave. Yeah. Are we going to hear more about uh, resuming the interim program in the fall? You are going to hear about that tomorrow in my director's report. We've talked about this, barring some kind of thing where we all have to go back to 100% remote, which we don't see as not. We are looking to rehire an intern. We just didn't have the ability to give them a good experience when we were working from home. So, as much as I would have loved to have come over and done my hard work. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we want to take a break now, or do we want to jump into the next session, or? Maybe take about a 15 20 minute break. Do you recall we can keep power through? We're about uh, 20. How's everybody doing? This stuff's going to move pretty fast. Let's power through. So, uh, so, Sean, I don't know if you can share, so they can share. We just want to, we just standard stuff here. We verify on the day to day operational things that we deal with. We're done with the philosophical, cool discussion. Sorry, this is boring, routine stuff. But one of the things we'd like to do, you saw in your packet, the current uh, cap meeting agenda format. Uh, we did recently add the new industry updates uh, line item to that, but is there anything you all want to change with the format of the agenda, the order? Um, right, those kind of things. Anything we're missing now is always asked. Does anybody have any thoughts about how we do our business? I'm, I'm, yeah, I was okay. Sorry, I can't I leave that one up there too. Uh, I can't. Oh, okay. Sorry, you were, that, that's me. That's you. I tried taking over and I couldn't. Oh. We'll power struggle for the Where do we want to look here to start? Uh, it's all the way down, Sean. Keep going down. Wait, wait, the wait. best was to click on the uh, bookmarks. It's bookmarks oh, on the left side. Okay. Yeah. Oh. One way down. Oh, oh. Caitlin has ice cream. There you go. Look at this. <gasps> Fourth from the <laughs> bottom. There you go. This yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> What's the thing? Oh, 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 All right, good with that one. Yeah, I like how the I really like the tweaks on the agenda where you do the action needed. So it's very self explanatory. Just a review of our standard financial dashboards and direct support. I know my direct support, but I'm not able to do it fancy, but I'll spend a lot of time doing those. Um, but if you have any feedback there, of course, the financial dashboards are a product of the new open gov platform that we rolled out last year. I think it's uh, well received by all of you and the Pretty price well text that he has. And getting price at the very end, we always add a little bit different, uh, a little bit different. Uh, Slide covering something. I think this this month it was uh, monthly expenditures. Excellent. Yeah. And if there's ever anything you want to see on that last slide, we're totally incorporated. Just let me know. Uh, I know you know we do surplus. I just shoot out for a couple months, kind of how that broke down. Right. Yeah. If there's something up there you want to see, just let me know ahead of time. I'm happy to make that final slide on that. It's not a big deal. Odds are I'm recording on it somewhere, anyways. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll keep doing those. Again, if there's ever something you're missing or something you want to see, you're obviously going to us. Uh, the other thing you will do tomorrow is you'll set the preliminary um, 2022 meeting calendar and location uh, set up for next year. Or so uh, those are the dates we've got. January is always is in, in the conjunction with the CAOA Winter Legislative Conference out in Brown Palace next year. That's on. Monday the 24th and half day on Tuesday the 25th, unless CIOA they make it a one day format next year. 
next year. So, I think they are. so uh, that may just be the board meeting typically that Monday uh, morning. In fact, the last time we actually had it in person was that giant blizzard. Yeah. 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 I was going to go back up, go back up yeah. the calendar. I'm sorry. Yeah, let's keep going. Uh, so again, we kind of keep up with the every other month. It's not a lot going on in February. January is also where you will approve the state local grants. Uh, April is where the Fed grants will be approved. Um, April meeting is typically held here. Uh, June, like always, is held at the spring CIOA next year. That's a grant section. So that'll be kind of cool. Um, we're meeting in July, August again, two days, kind of the last Wednesday. Um, I don't know where we came up with the last Wednesday, but if this time of the month in August still works. It seems to work pretty well for us. So. Where it came from. It, yeah. Well, when I looked at the calendar this time, usually it was pretty evident that it was what the dates were supposed to be. And this time I was like, do we do it the fourth week or do, it, do we do it the last week? I couldn't remember because, you know, usually it's 24, 25, 23, 24. That was also the last Tuesday, Wednesday. So, uh, and then October, and we'll circle back to this for this yeah. this October. But um, that would be our annual joint lunch with the Transportation Commission. And what we've typically done is we'll go down and see that headquarters. You all will sit around a table like this with your eleven peers on the Transportation Commission. We'll give a little presentation about what Aeronautics does for the, the members that are there because um, they change a lot. They change way more frequently than you all do. Um, Give you an opportunity to talk transportation policy and then we split up and have our respective separate meetings and meetings of headquarters. So it's a good opportunity for you to know your other type one board governor employees. Does that happen in this year too, or just I'm sorry. Is that only happening next October? No, so if we had not known normally well, previously it's been in April is when we would do it, but um, right now there's four new TC members that just joined the, the transportation commission this month. We would like to do that this coming October on the 21st would be the meeting dates. We'll come to you all with a calendar amendment for this upcoming October meeting to do that this year, unless something drastic changes or a little bit of the in person meeting. But right now, that's, that's a lot. So, but it's been a couple of years since we've done that. That's right. This is, uh, for me, it was very interesting to sit in front of that group as well and hear what they had to say. And just, it was a good conversation with yeah. everybody. So it's fun to watch. And we had some of them attend our board meeting at times. Yeah. So it was, it was very good. Yeah, it was very useful. Yeah. And then Caitlin always puts the holidays on there. Those are the holidays that we're not in the office. So we always try to avoid meetings there. Unless you're Todd, he comes out uh, once in a while on a holiday. But <laughs> not ever purposefully. It's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> just working from home has really helped that. <laughs> Hey, just show up at all. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things, if you don't mind going back, one of the things that we've also tried to do, and it's not on here for next year, is we would try to take um, one of our meetings sort of on the road. So if CAO was on Western Slope, we do one of our other meetings like out east somewhere, Pueblo, Greeley. Um, just curious what your all's thought is on that. Um, you know, if you want to keep doing that, sometimes it's hard to find. Um, places for everybody to stay like way out east <laughs> uh it can be a little challenging but um really you know uh, places like that fort morgan think of can you do burlington or burlington mm -hmm. um, what do you all think about going on the road like that yeah i mean i think in the past i think we can be flexible and play it by ear because opportunities do present themselves uh you know maybe there's some in conjunction with some event like uh let's say grand junction has complete spit phase of their runway or, or color springs has a event you know i think it's kind of good to be flexible but we can kind of stay flexible for that month of the meeting um continue, considering what's going on around the state and then and then we can you know discuss that and say hey let's go over to Let's go over to Fort Collins or something like that. So, all right. Cool. I mean, we could say, I think, didn't we used to talk about having one on the western slope and one on the eastern slope or something once a year? Mm -hmm. But it's usually just off because CAOA tests bounce back. Yeah, road, yeah. So it's just you follow wherever CAOA or opposite CAOA. Yeah. So, but I just think having that flexibility to start with this as our base so we can get okay. it on our calendars. Cool. We'll maybe look around at some airports and see what some of them have going on. Yeah. Because you know, I'll tell you what, it is fun to do that. What, what was it we did? Uh, not Lyman, 
what was the word for it? Man? Akron. It was Akron. Akron. That, and they just, they loved, they loved it. They absolutely they were excited. Loved they, it. Yeah, they, they, they had yes. a historian yes. Yes. come yeah. talk to yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, you we know, had a stuff like around. that. Yeah, that's cool. And, and then you might have other yeah. reports that are sort of like, like I think you know what would be a neat one is. I know it's way out of the way, but uh, you know, you think about Pagosa Springs. Yeah. I mean, I was in Pagosa last weekend. I couldn't believe. Just what an amazing community. I mean, they have a neat airport and everything else, but that that's just an example. I mean, we wouldn't do that, but I mean, so they really enjoy that attention. So we could be strategic, but kind of do it in conjunction with maybe some big event we're going to hold. So, well, so I, that, 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 I mean, you have new airport managers too. I mean, my Eagle might love to have have our presence there. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I, mean, maybe we, I don't know if their runway will be done, but no, it'll be worth a few years out. Yeah. Yeah. But stuff like that, we go to Creed, they would love that. You used to do that. You guys have done that. Yep. Like Lodita, did you? It's great to get a good <laughs> photo of the board on a brand new. Line yeah, I agree. Too. That's I agree. Pretty awesome. I'd echo that because I think it also it's an opportunity to invite a lot of other airports and, and community yeah. leaders in the area. Yeah, that won't come to Denver. And even right. other airports, you're right. right. And, yeah. and and be able to you know spread the wealth, spread the information that we get, you know, to them as well at the same time. So why don't we, I think, collectively agree that let's try to make it a goal at least once a year we're doing that. Yeah, okay, cool. We're doing a road trip outside the CAOA. Love so, it. Okay. And we didn't do it last year because of COVID. And I think the year before when we had to play. We weren't really. I mean, candidly, I mean, that's kind of one of the reasons why it makes it so fun to be on a board with exactly. like this. Yeah. I like the idea of going to an airport that recently had a project completed that we yeah. Had yeah. yeah. And we come up there. Like, we did for Del Mar. Yeah. 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 So I, I'm a big, I'm a, I think we're all in favor of that. Cool. Um, yeah. we'll, uh, we'll put our heads together and you guys do the same. And we'll come up with something good. Okay. Uh, the next thing we had, if you all took a look at the government stock, I know it's super riveting. To read. <laughs> uh, we didn't have any proposed updates to that document. We already updated it to three board members previously this year. So um, I think we've all read it at some point, but we didn't have any changes to the proposed. So but we put it on the list to say we reviewed it because that was one of the uh, findings of our 2015 performance audit that we haven't looked at that document in a long time. So now we look at it every year and check off that we did it. Make sure it's good. It's good. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, we're moving right through. Yeah, that's great. Uh, the next thing I'll do is I'll turn over to Todd a little bit to talk about our own CIP. We actually have our own capital improvement program because we own this building and the cost of maintaining and improving and doing the routine maintenance on this facility comes out of our budget. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, we, a couple of years ago, we put our our own CIP together that really gets into the weeds. Just so yeah. more not. Not for necessarily for the financial piece, uh, but so we know when we need to do things like replace the disposal or we need a new fridge <laughs> before it breaks and little things like that. So I'll turn it over to Todd to kind of talk about that. We do have uh, in the next few years a couple of pretty significant uh, costs with the building. We just did the roof uh, and the remodel up front, but go ahead, Todd. Yeah, absolutely. So this was uh, something we put together three or four years ago now. Prior to that, we just kind of fix things as things started to break. And honestly, that wasn't our best route to do that. And so, um, so we started making a list of all the actual assets that the division really owns and, and is responsible for maintaining. And so the list just kept getting longer. Um, but yeah, so this is a list of really all the, the assets that the division owns here at the building and kind of put a timeline on them when they were new, when we need to replace them. So we can have an idea going forward how much we would need to schedule money-wise just to keep this building going. And so this is really, this is that whole list. Um, and as you can see, it's, uh, the second from the right uh, column is the year that we have planned for replacement on all of this stuff. And so this is just something I track on an annual basis. And so for this year, um, for FY 2022, which is coming, which we're in now, uh, we have about $13,000 worth of things that we need to fix. Um, half of that is honestly, it's, a, it's not even really an admin expense. It's just like replacing a the plotter for Sean. I mean, it's just to the age. 
The plotter's over 10 years old, so it's something that we just need to replace over time. But uh, so some things planned for 2022 is the plotter we just talked about. Um, we talked about our PCI um, program. We usually upgrade that about every, we add to it almost every year just to make it better. We're always looking for ways to improve that program. So that's $500 there. And then for like the TVs that we have in here, the conference room TV um, is, is uh, we bought back in 2012, which is hard to believe we've had for it in there for yeah. that long. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's getting close to replacement as well. And if it gets to the point where it doesn't need it, again, we could push that out a little bit, but we're trying to plan for some of these expenses coming forward. So again, we always try to do some AV equipment replacement every year um, just to make sure we have the, the best use of equipment for the boardroom and for all the stuff Sean does. Um, HVAC maintenance, light maintenance, window caulking, I mean, just some annual maintenance we have to do, and then just some contingency. So there's not a lot of big things this year, but uh, we did spend almost, I was like, nine how much did we spend last year on the building price because we did the roof and then the whole remodel of the lighting upgrade the lighting upgrade we did the welcome office we spent a ton of money on the building last year yeah it was uh in the car in the yeah so i think we did it was like one hundred thirty thousand yeah, dollars yeah yeah one hundred forty thousand dollars just the building so those are really our big ticket items and i took those off the list since they're already done but like the next biggest one coming up on the list we have, uh, it's like replace these windows. Um, usually a couple times a year, I go out on the outside and I caulk around all the windows because when it rains hard from the north, it rains on the inside too. And so uh, the state patrol was not a huge fan when I destroyed a whole bunch of evidence sitting in that window well. Why, why was there evidence in the window well? Long story. Okay. There is now an evidence there locker in there. So that has been fixed. You, you can see water damage on the inside of every yeah, yeah, the windows broke. <laughs> yeah. There are 35 plus years old. So, so that's a, the big ticket one. And then honestly, I mean, that's slowly coming up, but it's not a huge need. If the revenue is not there, it's not even something we really will even talk about because it's just somewhat of an upgraded building that we're looking at. And then the other big ones on the list is the, the HVAC replacement, but we replaced that, that back in 2013. And so that has a ways out. So our really our big ticket items are quite a ways out, but uh, we usually range from like 13, 10,000 to about 25,000 based on, on the year. Um, but if you go to the next, uh, the next page, Sean, that that's kind of down the right side. There's a breakdown by year where we have planned. Um, you'll see that big one in 2025 of 132,000. That's those windows. windows. Yeah. So that's where we had those thrown. In. And then HVAC. Yeah, exactly. So those are those big ticket items. And we do have the availability. These aren't uh, like a must do. Like the dishwashers next year, it's a really exciting thing to replace. But again, if it doesn't need replaced, we'll push it off. But again, we're planning for money on replacing some of these assets that the division owns, just so we're not getting so far behind. And the biggest thing that actually pushed this whole thing was uh, who knew you had to work, you had to do maintenance on plumbing every few years. There hadn't been maintenance on the plumbing in our office yet. And then all of a sudden things weren't working. And all is of a sudden this, all this, our toilets needed to replace. Is this septic or is this is wastewater to the an SIB funded wastewater I was let facility? You, that, it all goes to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it was just a bunch of random things that happened at once that were like, we need to get ahead of this stuff and actually come up with a maintenance plan for the division. And so this is this is what we do, and we're just yeah, back to having great. a maintenance actual on me to make sure this building will last us as we continue to stay out here. So so what I'm trying to remember this one. <laughs> memory, which is not very good. So, the, the state statute says that we could we do we can take five percent of budget for administrative costs. Yeah, and we're really like three point six or three point eight or something. Three point seven last year. Now okay. we did starting this year. This yep. was all approved and notified you guys in December of last year, and then in January yeah. we approved it. We broke out instead of just having all of our salaries. Kidding the admin cost center. We were the only division in CDOT doing that and one of very few across the state. So we've split it out where there's the admin cost center, which is the director, business manager, program director, and account tech. Yeah. And then so that's the admin cost center now. And then the program delivery is part of the statewide initiatives, and that has the three planners, uh, the communications manager, and the education coordinator, things like that, and doing that. Now, I'm not lying and say the reason we did that now was not driven by, oh crap, we're looking at $12 million of revenue this year, and that ain't gonna fit within that. 
Uh, so that was definitely the start of that concept uh, of realigning with that. Um, we went through the division of finance uh, at CDOT, uh, went through the subject matter expert there, uh, and their recommendation was the idea is. I've always wondered why you didn't do it. It's never been needed to be fixed before. He's like, yeah, you should absolutely be allocating your salaries differently. The, the building maintenance and the things that we're talking about are within that 3.7. They are. Which we, we report them separate from our salary line, but yes, that rolls up into the overall yeah. administration budget. Yeah. Yeah. You weren't careful. I mean, no, I know you are. That's. I think that's where I'm going with this. Just, you know, there, there's a, a commitment and an efficiency and that part of the the budget that you know in the short time I've been here, you know, it's clear, right? So um, so it's easier for me to say this. I worry a little bit about penny wise pound foolish, you know. So having a good facility that the staff can work in, of course it's a little bit different on the working remote, but but you know if, um, that that we're, you know, we're not in any so let me ask another question. So if you did the windows, how is how is that accounted for? Is it is it capitalized over over a period of time, or how does that reflect in the numbers? As far as our numbers are concerned, it's just it's, it's just an part expense. Of that year's budget. It's just an expense. As, yes, as far as depreciation, so it's not capitalized that's, that's at all. See that thing is okay. not that hits our books. Yeah. Now I will add on here, and we just had the situation with the roof. As we get closer to 2025, finances are good and things like that. I'm probably going to tell them in 2024. Let's bump this up. Let's okay. do it. I don't know what next. And, is and thank you, because because I agree. Because again, that, that's that's where I'm was, was kind of going with with my thought, which is and we you know, as, as you know as things are ahead of time, as we look what happened with COVID. Yeah. So it, it worked out well in that case. It was hey, if, yeah, it's going to need done. We've got the money. Let's, let's if, if you it. have room in a budget, you're always better to advance it because yeah. you get more bang for the buck. So. So, so I, what I'm suggesting is that you know that if you need a new dishwasher, you know, go replace the damn thing. Right. <laughs> you know, let, let's you know, let's you know, let's you know, you've already proven that you're thoughtful and careful with the money, but you know, if you have to kick kick the thing to get it started every time, whatever it is, yeah, you know, like new new TVs and that kind of stuff. So the way yeah. I imagine that this. Um, is used not you know very just frequently and not just by you guys, right? So, you know, it's when you come in and, and you spend time trying to fix the equipment, or uh, I mean, you're, you know, that's that's the thing. Why it's fun for these things. So it was, it was again, this was one of those things we didn't have an asset management plan when I got here, and you know, so now when you all know why are you asking for 122.5 and that, we can tell you this is why. It's, it's you know, another thing that I'd like to see as you are developing this is, how about um, wellness? How about workout equipment? Not gonna happen to the CDOT policy on that kind of thing. Well, you well. said we were gonna get a hot tub, so. I mean, I got a hot tub surge is a dishwasher. We have full talk about things like that, and unfortunately, workout rooms are a broader state. Thing that have to be managed under a perk and yeah. something, and there's equity issues with other facilities that may not have it. And so we've talked about it, we've loved it. Um, we have actually talked, and I we have to visit with the airport about it, but we've talked about one of the things has been a ton of hail out here, and we've had a couple of our cars get wrecked with hail. Yeah, yeah having a cardboard. Um, we talked about a cardboard, and we actually talked about a cardboard with maybe some solar on it that would maybe help offset the cost of our building. Um, and we'd obviously have to talk to the airport about that. There's a cost, but who knows? Maybe that's something to partner with and do something cool there. Or some mini DIA tent cardboards. Exactly. Ooh, yeah, I love it. Thank you. Well, you guys are going to be able to tent roof, I think. So maybe we can get the scraps. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and I'm not trying to say these are $100,000. I'm just saying if you had, you know, something like a stationary, you know, I don't know. I mean, it, it's up to you guys to do that. But I, I got to say, every facility I've ever been at, it's well worth the investment. It's I not that expensive. Wouldn't disagree more, but that's a that's a sword that takes a lot of falling off of the larger state. You know, they, we don't even get access to the CDOT gym at headquarters. Right. That's true. No, they won't let they us have there. a gym at CDOT. Yeah. yeah. And you can't have one here. No, there's not. And we can't access there. Yeah. Which is I don't understand that. That's really mm -hmm. I don't understand that. I mean, it's Why? wellness. Yeah. Wellness is very. Lots it's him. bad. We're we're it's actually so when we say headquarters. When we it's say it. headquarters. That's not only a facility, it's also a functional division within CDOT, headquarters, and then there's five regions. We're actually assigned to headquarters. 
but we, we should have access to the gym. Mm -hmm. you absolutely. I'm not going to worry about it. We should have access to the garage. We should have access to the garage. Because I'm trying to get in and I can. I will find out about that. That's fine. I should say anyway, that. that that would be a nice. I mean, yeah. obviously, because you are so remote, well, however, you're and you're coming back to the office a little more. I think, I hope, but it's one of those things that I think that should be looked at, or if you have that opportunity. Sean, Sean was just bring so in his fellow officer, and then I want to. <laughs> say, <laughs> sorry, if you're a federal, you just you get solar because they throw money at federal. Look at look at the size of the solar panels down at the Air Force Academy. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, that's it on that, and that's good. So it's uh, trying to be smart with that. So it's good. Come cool. Good plans. Uh, and the last thing is, uh, I will brief you real quickly. Speaking of um, asset management, so one of the things we did do with the office um, remodel is we did uh, make a new office for the position we have. It's not filled right now. That was the education grant manager and outreach coordinator. That was the position we added uh, last year. Ended up we were, had three finalists that we were getting ready to interview. And then COVID hit, and thankfully it was we had not hired somebody yet. They quit their job, and then I had to let it go because I didn't have any grants to manage. But it came close. So, long story short, that position has been on hold. But as we come back to doing maybe potentially some more education, workforce development grants, I had a long conversation with Chick about more outreach and you know doing things like that. And Sean's only got limited bandwidth, same with all of us. That kind of position would get to do all of that. Um, we will likely. I don't mean to sound this, this arrogant. I don't need your approval to fill it because it's already approved. Uh, but I would certainly bet that with all of you before we probably advertise to see that, which I would imagine might happen early next year before we post that position. Um, do some of that. So uh, that sounds good. And Sean has got a lot on his plate, and he's uh, he's got a lot going on. He gets a little overwhelmed sometimes, and uh, it would be cool to have some extra support on some of those outreach. In the grant management, these folks have their own batch of airport grants to manage. And somebody out there who knows education, we're not educators, we're we'll find somebody out there that can do that. We'll work with the Wings Museum, work with uh, Boeing, and all these great people that are doing really cool stuff. The, the uh, Blue Skies Charter Academy um, out there, and off the entities like that. The one we're going to hear from tomorrow, the, the pre flight camp that I know you got Chick's daughter turned on to, they're going to brief us tomorrow. I've never even heard of that. You know, those are the kinds of entities that we would love to get engaged with and help support. So um, that person would help do that. That's great. So, anyway, that I will turn it over to Sean to talk about what's coming up in the next year uh, with our communications efforts, charts, directories, stuff like that. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, so where to start? I guess I'll just start with basically, I think probably give you a good, good idea of. of what my job description is, what my what my goal is to do for the division. And, and it really is, I always say it, the easiest job in the place because I get to report the good, positive, cool stuff that these guys work so hard to accomplish. And so I mean I just I just go out tooting horns and showing how awesome we are. And so uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, um, now they have to live up to it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so, you know, the question is, I always ask, like, what, what do you communicate? What is, what is, what are you trying to, you know, as a, you know, I kind of look at myself as a marketing kind of guy too, but you know, like, it is kind of hard to say, what do you sell? And what I, what we sell by us communicating is an idea. And I think the first and foremost thing is to basically, uh, is stay away from our tax funds. And, you know, because over the years, I've been here 20 years, um, is, you know, in the early days, the United won, you know, like we shouldn't have to pay tax to look what happened in Utah and all these different things. And so our my main goal is to to show why, you know, what are we doing with the money and are we being good stewards with it? And and it all focuses back to our mission and our vision. And basically, like I said, is that we are our, our, our goal here is to um to to uh, have a, a safe and efficient um aviation system in Colorado. You know, you all know that the, in that everything we we communicate points right back to that mission statement, and that's how I kind of try to um, do everything uh, with how we communicate. How do we communicate? So there are many different ways. When I came to the division, we had zero communications. Everything that came out of this building was a typical rubber stamp government document. You know, I mean, it was just pretty, and 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 there was no there. Were, still today, it's really hard to. Uh, get people to understand there is a division of aeronautics, you see that. So um, I think we're getting better at that. We're getting it's it's uh 
but I, again, like Dave said, I'm a one man show here. So, um, and we communicate in a lot of different ways. And, you know, we have our website. Um, we uh, have, what's great now is, you know, with, with the advancement of social media and, and digital technology, a lot of stuff that was really hard to do and really expensive to do, I can do on my phone. And that includes video, uh, taking video. So we have our Facebook channel, we have our Twitter channel. Um, we don't have anything on LinkedIn per se that's connected right to CDOT. Uh, they have CDOT, but we share quite a bit of stuff through LinkedIn as well, just on our own personal uh, feeds. Um, so, and then we have, uh, I think, two of the most popular things that we put out right now is our board director and our aeronautical chart, especially the airport director. There's a huge demand for it. Um, it so much so, it's, it's seen all around the world. And, um, uh, you know, and it's it's actually uh, wanting to be emulated by the country of Indonesia, which I'm actually kind of helping out with. Right now. So um, I'm cool. really proud of that. And so it's kind of cool to, to be able to do that. But again, um, and then, uh, so we have the airport directory, the website. Now there's a lot of stuff that I think we can improve on. And this is the problem that I have. It's like, I feel like I'm the master of all these, I'm the jack of all these little things, but master of zero of it. And I just, I, what I say is everything that you, you see, I MacGyver it. I make it happen, smoke and mirrors. Um, but one of my biggest weaknesses is web development because the technology changes on a constant basis and it's all code driven. And, and, and I'm not that smart to do all that stuff. So that I think is our probably our biggest weakness right now is our website, especially with the um, uh, keeping it updated and that kind of thing. So that is a big resource, I think, for people. And we try to keep that updated as possible, as much as possible. But we're not doing it dynamically. Everything's updated manually. So let's say a, an airport changes their three-letter identifier. Now I got to figure out where the hell that three-letter identifier shows up in all of our and so that's a challenge so um so those are so some of the things now the other ways we get this uh information out is not only in printed form so we have and, and the other thing with, with my focus is to make the stuff that we that goes out looks good it looks sexy it's it's somebody wants to look at it, they want to look at it up. and so that's really important that was one of my biggest goals starting here was to make what we put out to the public look good because it it shows, it represents who you are and what kind of business you're doing. And so I think that is, and it's the first thing that people see. So I think it's really important to make sure that what we put out looks nice. And so um, I try to make that representative in the documents like our economic impact study, um, the, the system plan, the annual report. Again, that's a perfect uh, tool if you're ever going to go talk and do numbers quick. Um, it just kind of hits the peaks of everything that we do, and it's a great tool um, for you. And I'm kind of bouncing around and digressing here. But the other way that we do things, not only just the printed things, but is um, uh, this video. And that's the one of the, I think, one of the most, uh, it's, it's probably one, it's becoming one of the most used ways to communicate to people. Um, and it's easy to do. A lot of it can be just done on your phone. It can be quick and short, but it is time consuming. And it, you know, when you do a video, typically you have a director and then you have a guy that holds the microphones and then you got a guy that's, all he does is sound the editing and the other guy does the editing and storyboarding and all these different people work together to make one video. Well, that is me. And so it's hard to, you know, really hammer out videos quickly, you know, and then you have to kind of travel and all this other thing. But I think it's one of the best ways that we get our message out there. And, you know, and I'll show you, and I, you know, on top of the economic impact study, but if any of you are out doing a talk anywhere else, I highly, highly recommend that you visit our webpage uh, or our uh, YouTube page. And uh, I'm going to show that in a minute, but uh, um, anyway, without supposed to be honest. So there's, you know, this is a list of every single video that we've ever produced that goes out. And, 
Um, it talks about everything. And again, they go straight back to that mission statement. Um, we have some great stories about what our grant money did to save lives, let's say in Del Nor, or you know, just the basics. Here's, you know, if you just want to go kick off your talk to somebody and say, what are what is the division of aeronautics? We got a three minute, 30 second video that tells you everything you need to know that you can expand on some other things. Um, we also go out to um, we go out to airport functions, uh, airport events, the uh, the women in aviation events, anywhere we can get in front of the face of young people, especially, and talk about what I love to talk about is most kids when they get into this industry is they think that all they can do is fly airplanes and aviation. And I'm a perfect example of that. A guy that found out he was colorblind the day he was supposed to go to boot camp for the Air Force to go fly jets. And I thought everything was done, but here I am doing really cool things with an awesome team. Um, so that's fun is to communicate that message of aviation, keep this industry vibrant. Dude. If, we, if we need people in this industry constantly uh, to keep it vibrant, and so it starts young. And so getting those kids excited about aviation is really important. So going to those events is really important. Now, COVID comes. We don't go to any events anymore. And it's really hard to communicate to what are we doing? And it was really hard to adjust to this new working environment. So, you know, what I did was like, one of my focuses, and I, I don't know how they promote hashtags anymore these days, but I tried to promote a hashtag, you know, GA is essential, airports are essential. That was my hashtag. It didn't take off. I tried. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I tried, but that was an important thing too, was like, okay, let's find opportunities here that are out there. So when they did that flyover with all those aircraft, GA pilots from all over the, uh, the state, coming together to raise money for, for to get PPE uh, and into the right places, I filmed that and, and documented that and showed people how important this airport was and how important the people um, that fly those airplanes are. And then the other thing was to show the volunteer airlifts with uh, Angel Flight was doing an incredible amount of movement of PPE from different places around the state, small communities that don't typically get overlooked. And I wanted to show people what GA is really boring. We are essential. And you know what happened when, when when the day we shut down, it was parking airplanes. And you know, we needed to tell people that aviation is so important. And so that was kind of what I tried to do there. Um, so um, yeah, so um, oh, so as far as like what we're going to do, what we have coming up, um, we have the, this is what I call the heavy year. So we do the airport directory every, we produce that every year now on an annual basis. Um, and then we, every other year, biannually, we put the chart out. So this is the, happens to be the year where we put out both the charts and directory. So, um, so this, you'll see the update for the airport directory and the aeronautical chart. And again, that airport directory, you know, uh, we've made a lot of improvements over the years and really listen to the pilots and what they need. You know, I'm not a pilot. I fly up in airplanes a lot, but I'm not a pilot. And so it, it's good to ask the pilots what's important. Um, sitting down with Bill Standifer on a chart saying, hey, let's go over the chart. Is there anything on here? We need to change these recommended mountain flying routes on the chart and really get here from the pilots. And that's that's important. So um, so what you see going out in those two doc documents is really kind of pilot driven. <clears throat> and I take that advice and put it into the print. So you'll see those two things. Um, our social media presence, I think, is pretty good. I'm not an expert at any of it, um, but anytime we get a really good article, or you know, if you seriously do, uh, so we used to have a guy at CDOT that he, I don't know how he aggregated all these different articles, and uh, he would find different topics of articles and put them together, and it made my job easy. We always had an aviation section. And it's just every morning I wake up with a cup of coffee and go through there and go, oh yeah, that one's shareable. So I would share that that stuff. He just retired after working for CDOT for 30 years and no one's doing it now. So um, so it, yeah, so now I have to figure out how to be how to aggregate. You're gonna have to be that old guy now. I guess I don't need it. <laughs> but that being said, if you see something cool or an article yeah. that you pops up and it seems really interesting and relevant for what we're trying to communicate, please send it to me because that's uh, that's how I put that stuff out. Um, so we're doing that. Twitter is one of those things like 
I'm a Facebook guy. He's a Twitter guy. Not um, you know, yeah, that's what good for you. But uh, I don't understand Twitter at all. I just I don't get it. I mean, I push out those articles in, on Twitter just to have them out there. But our followers are very low. I don't really. That, that's the one thing. I, again, it's like getting followers on the Twitter land. I, it's hard. Twitter um, land. One of the things he doesn't know yet. We're working on. We're going to have a bunch of teenagers come in and show them how to use TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> But one of the best things I think that really helped out with our with our audience when whenever you get an email a blast from me an action call or the board member uh, the board reports uh, 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 you know the, the public notices any time of type of those those emails uh, are sent out at Mailchimp and so I figured out and it's it's great because I always figured, I'm trying to figure out how to get people to sign up for our newsletter and how to get that done and so I put the uh, the we have a sign up form on our website and so i don't know why i didn't think about this sooner but i put a checkbox on there if you want to stay informed with uh relevant colorado uh, aviation positive news click here to get our information and it really has boosted our audience tremendously um, probably 30 to 35 new audience members a month that might not seem a lot but we were getting none before and people I always get pissed off when I look at my reports to see people that are unsubscribed. And, you know, and so we were losing people. We weren't getting any new ones in. So I had to figure out a way to do it. And, and, and this it's worked out great. Um, it's on our website. Uh, on our website. Oh, our website. Yeah, we have a, oh, okay. yeah, we have a, we have a, a, a form. Oh, yeah. And the website, I keep read the strategic plan. That was identified as one of our big weaknesses. One of the challenges we have we're also bound, I know what you what you're probably not, but you know, bound by the structure that CDOT dictates for all yeah, of the right. state requires. We would love to have our own website. One of the things that is unique, we are the only group in CDOT other than CDOT that has our own Facebook group. Oh, no, yeah. 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 So uh, we have a little variance from our social media policy, which does not allow for any other Facebook feed except for the official CDOT feed, except for us. For us we're successfully yes. navigating back and it's done a good job. Of yeah, it works pretty good. It's yeah. our information. I'm kind of curious. I'm looking maybe at Trimby and maybe at George. I mean, you know, you hear these other platforms that if we have somebody else come on, we may have some additional bandwidth on like Instagram. I mean, where are you seeing, you know, like your constituents are coming in? What are they paying for? Well, they're looking at Instagram. Okay. It's mainly Instagram. Yeah. Instagram is the new Facebook. Yeah. Way more popular. So maybe that's where we search that. But so if y'all have any ideas of ways that we can better engage, you know, I'm not a social media expert. In fact, I hate Facebook. Don't have a Facebook account. Yeah. I don't really use my Facebook. My Facebook is for puppies. Use my wife. My wife uses it. So I I retweet you when you read when you do. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. No, but but uh, I I think he's been doing a great job, and I think Instagram tends to be where 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 people are and, and there's a great i mean you know it's the benefit of being in colorado I mean, if you're traveling around taking a really cool picture it's, it's a, yeah a great space to be doing that i also was just curious because i've been thinking about you and the and the cameras that you're setting up i have no idea if this is how it, the first already happening or but i always think about the news when when the weather's coming in, they're tapping into different, you know, yeah. Eisenhower tunnel cameras. But it, you, you know, we're putting in these really cool cameras if there would be some way to brand them as. So they are on the FA's website, and again, they've got some restrictions. It doesn't have our logo, but when you click on one of our cameras, it will say right on top of the camera feed yeah. hosted by C dot arrow, and then when you click on that, it takes us to your website. What frustrates me, and Channel 9 did this the other day, they said, well, weather camera on top of Earth that Pass. I guess, I guess these weather cameras on top of Earth that Pass. <laughs> that's on that's on us. Like, so they are using them. Right? Yeah, yeah, and they are. And one of the cool things was, and I'll probably reach out to them, um, and again, the stuff can kind of go stale, but when we first announced the weather camera program, Corey Revenig, one of the meteorologists with, with Channel 9, did an uh, interview with me at CDOT and ran a story. That's right. And then 5280 Magazine did a story about it, too, which is yeah. kind of cool. It's out and more mainstream. Yeah. Kind of a thing, so I would ask you, you know, if any of you have contacts yeah. with the non because we all know aviation rocks, aviators know cameras are cool, and you know, but it's these other folks outside of aviation that don't know. So, if you all have opportunities, I look to you, George, I've done through media before to say, Yeah, hey, this guy would be interested in telling a story to a broader population, I'd love to do that more often because I don't have those contacts. 
yeah. as well. So, but no, I, I think that Sean, what you have made of your position, because I remember in the early days it was kind of part time. Yeah, it was. And then it just sort of evolved, and then you actually, I think, learned a lot when you really were working for a while out of the CDOT C -dot. offices. Yeah. And you would go to the flood, uh, yeah. what was the? The, the 2013 the, flood. The 13 or, flood. So, yeah. I mean, your skills have grown tremendously, exponentially. So, yeah, so that's, that's a testament to you. But I think we're at a phase of, yes, I think the answer is adding additional uh, talent on, on the staff and you know, somebody that can continue to expand. But I think what you need, we're at a stage now where I think you need to look at everything that you're doing and saying, okay, is it, is it really necessary um, to have all these social media connections? What are we really doing? I mean, like you said, Twitter is kind of weak. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, and that's, and a lot of government entities have tried Twitter and then they give up on it. Yeah. But like where I'm at in San Miguel County, the sheriff uses it for its updates on things. There might be a search and rescue or whatever. So it's fascinating. Facebook to me has just kind of been so far outdated. And, you know, so that's what I mean is where, where are you spending? I think you have to manage now because you have so many different, so many arrows, if you will. Okay, which ones do I really need to spend my time? Because your time is very valuable. Yeah. And so, so it's better instead of doing things, you know, sort of, try to spread yourself as thin as possible, maybe kind of start narrowing and focusing on a few platforms or social media forms and just be really good at it. Mm -hmm. And then you only have to worry about one or two different things. And, right. and considering we are a entity, a government entity, you know, it does it really need to be a Facebook thing? I mean, I don't yeah. know, you know what I mean? But I, I just, I, right. I think, you know, like my kids say that Facebook is really for old people. <laughs> You know? So, I mean, it's just kind of how it is. Right. The old people like, yeah, well, that's true. Uh, it's on, you know, my grandmother's on there or something like yeah, that. Yeah. So, so yeah, they're just, those, those, those kids are getting up to, up to date and they're on to the next thing. And yeah. So you're trying to chase it. Yeah. But I would rather say, okay, as those social media platforms evolve, and they do yeah. kind of evolve with it, but just kind of narrow your focus. Yeah. Um, because what's your audience, right? You're not trying to hit the the teenagers in high school, yeah. but like you said, having all these platforms and the YouTube channel and everything else, it really does a lot in terms of inspiring youth to get into aviation. Yes. And whether it's flying, what I mean, you, you hit everything yeah. in management to oh my God, there's I didn't know there was this many airports in Colorado, yeah. those kinds of things. Yeah. So it does get there is a balance there, but I think if you you know you just need to figure out over time as and as you get help to really narrow that focus on let's let's get good at this let's do instagram and let's just commit to it enough of this other nonsense yeah and then the other thing i i was asking because i think it takes a lot of time you spend a lot of time on those uh updates to the uh to the directory oh, yeah. and the question i have is do we really need to update that every year are there that many changes going on where yeah. it needs to happen so it, you would it know. Actually does. I yeah. just asked that yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. it's an example like that is okay, because of your time and you are just yeah. one person and hopefully you'll have another person helping. But again, it's okay, do we really need to do this every yeah. I'm not necessarily saying the airport director, maybe it's the map. I don't know. Yeah. But but you, you really need to ask yourself because you spend an incredible amount of time. Yeah. You know? Well, most of the time and what we've done to try to uh, or what I've decided to do to is I think one of the most important things that's in there, obviously the data is really, really important, but the aerial image of that airport is super important. And it's good for, you know, for, for just, you know, so basically what I'm saying here is every other year I do. So when I, when we're not producing the chart that year, I, I photograph every airport regardless. And, and then on a year like this year, I, I will reach out to the planners and say, hey, what airports have seen significant development where the airport's going to look different from here. So right. So we're trying to always keep it uh, updated, but that is, that is the most time consuming part right there. But I also think it's one of the most important things. And then also I'm kind of a history nerd, but it's really cool to keep those on archive and be able yeah. to kind of see the, 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 the development of an airport. And it's, uh, you know, right now there's, there's a, there, we have a, I'm, I'm just, 
fully honored, but there is a permanent exhibit down at the Wings of the Rockies Museum on the second floor mm -hmm. mezzanine that shows every airport in the state of Colorado. So that's his, that's history. That's kind of cool. And so, well, um, you know, so we're anyway. That's we could, yeah. We, it, it, yeah. It's yeah, and I, I just think that that it's it's a I mean, it's a great example. I always say when somebody new works for me, I always say you yeah. can make this position special. Yeah. You know, your goal should be, it, it should, it can be tailored to you and your set of skills. Mm -hmm. And, and this find a gap in the industry. Where, right. Where's the help needed? Right. No one's filling in this gap. Right. And then figure out a way to fill that gap with, and learning some new skills and talents to make the, to get the right message out. And that's, I, you know, we keep trying to, you know, every time I try to make a project or a new video or anything, one of the things I just try to do is challenge myself to make one change or one improvement or anything and sometimes you don't even notice it but over time that product becomes better so we're trying to do that i think you know i love being able to talk about with these um very talented planners and and, and scott man manages a great team and i get to go tell these awesome stories you know and one of the things that um you know and, and another way we communicate not just the airport um airport events but we had uh for 10 years we had a presence at EAA auction and the yeah. main focus there, and it was done through a partnership with the Maseo. And so every state that had an airport directory or a chart available for free, some states would charge for them, would send all this stuff to uh, to Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and we would put it in a tent. And we kept improving it. We had nice little racks where people really made a point to go to that tent to get their latest and greatest books and charts of every state. And the biggest focus for me was also hooking up with Bill Stanifer or some other people from the Colorado Pilots Association and talk to people from Oklahoma, these flatland states. They're like, yeah, I want to fly my Cherokee to Colorado. <laughs> and every single year here in Colorado, you see it. It happened in Telluride. People crash in the mountains. And why? Because, and they're good pilots. They're, they are airline pilots. They're good seasoned pilots. But those, those mountains will, will eat you. And if you don't know what you're doing. And so that was the big focus there was safety. Yeah. Was get these pilot, get people to come. Yeah, we want your fuel sales to fill up your plane, eat some, you know, eat food, you know, help our economy, come in, have fun, enjoy our beautiful state, but do it safe. And talk to Colorado Pilots, he's standing right here. He's going to do a seminar over at that billion today. Um, you know, and and uh, and here's our chart, but, but do it safely and really hammer that. That was my big focus there. Well, well, do we get from, that from a sales standpoint? We didn't, we haven't done a 10. I think you all know I'm going to be the incoming vice chair on executive committee for sale in September. So that's kind of cool. We're going to look at going back again with more states. Obviously, they didn't hold it last year. We're still trying to regroup this year with new CEO that we hired. Uh, but I think you'll probably see a budget request in FY23 for us to go to the sale in partnership uh, with them. And the cool thing is, they will hook us up with a house. You know, a lot of us will stick one place, saves money. Uh, and uh, the registration fee, we get better. Exposure to the one by ourselves without the glitch of some obscure corner. Yeah, I've never been, so I'm going to go. So. Yeah, the the tent's right now. Can you believe it? Power, so, yeah. Anyway, yeah. But we're, we're looking forward. We're looking forward to that. And the other thing we did too, and it, I think, you know, for a number of different reasons, we don't do it anymore, but I really think it was effective, and Kenny can attest to this, is when our presence at NBAA and where we came so back that. Had, I mean, I'm not saying we should go back there. No, no, but, no, but what I will say, it was a cool way that, that we came together to come up with a plan to try to give airports a platform. Kayla just you know. about fell out of the I know, she's like, oh. <laughs> so no, I don't, I'm not suggesting what we do, but I'm just saying that was another way that we helped. We not, didn't necessarily communicate to, we helped, we allowed airports to have a platform to communicate with airports. Yeah, it was a huge success. It was, it, but it was it a lot of work. And it was for a small staff, it was a lot of work. Was um, yeah, it was definitely a lot of work. I'm not sure. But I will tell you, you know, to, along the communication side, I'm sorry not to, oh, but to tie it back in with the uh, strategic plan. One of the carryover objectives was this Colorado Aviation Conference. And so the CPA has their own conference, whether in aviation has theirs. Uh, the Pilots Association does one. CABA does one. Is um, states like Montana and North Dakota, uh, a couple others. They do a statewide conference. They get all the associations together. So the pilots are talking, airports talking, mm -hmm. mechanics, and they do flight instructor rules. All this cool stuff that Aaron Alvin or um, Montana does a great one. And the reason theirs is great, they've been doing it for 50 years because their division runs it. It's not done by a volunteer group. They have a 
person on staff that handles the registration, makes the hotels, mm -hmm. sets up the agenda, so it's consistent year over year. Um, we would love, I see that as a great thing for this new position to take on to do that here, maybe not every year necessarily. Um, we know that the associations use those conferences to generate revenue for themselves. We don't want to take that away, but maybe every other year we do a Colorado Aviation Conference and have everybody come together for three or four days and get them in the same room. They all could have their little breakouts, but then we do a common session, you know, that's of interest to everybody. So I'm really excited about pursuing that. All the associations seem intrigued about that, which is cool. Uh, so that's one communication tool that we're, I think we're excited about moving forward with that. Hopefully that's good. Well, you, you've done you've done you've done fantastic work, Sean, and, and I think it's great that uh, gets you some help and continue lets you continue to grow. And I think that's real important. Um, and I will say, as kind of a side note, you know, I can't believe I even asked the question about the directory because I'm just as guilty as any other airport. I think I call you almost every year. Hey, could you? Uh, Hey, we just did a fog seal on our runway. I really would like a fresh shot, you know, or something like that. You know, I'll and you it. always have. You always uh, accommodate. He has photo so shots. You can make every I can make <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just it's real cheap too. No, it's yeah. it's yeah. Yeah. Instagram. And I will say the directory is really a team lift because the planners are really instrumental in oh, sure. all the updated yeah. info. That is really uh, great. It's good to see everybody come together. It's, it's, really it's awesome. also a wonderful intern project. Yes, exactly. Yes, yeah. it is. It's a really cool way for them to know the state. Yeah, it yeah. Really, really is. And we are uh, one of the things we've talked about that we're going to do is maybe like a statewide directory app on your phone, Idaho. Yeah. Uh, yeah, doing something like that. That's cool. Maybe come tips in there. Well, you kind of started with this directory, though. You started doing it. You're not printing as many. You're doing it basically online. Well, we 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 have them available. So I do have it available in PDF format. It's not it's not it's not a you know it's not a four format by any means. But it is yeah, a yeah. great resource there, and I can add in. I can add in. Links to like, for instance, the next one that's going to go out will have a link, but the electronic version will have a link to the weather cameras and yeah. um, those kind of things. Okay. Um, so to go to to make a, a really good apple um, costs a lot of money. So just just the first lift, and then from there, it's maintenance. not too it's maintenance. maintenance, and that's but just to get the backbone. Oh, but man, how much money? When you say a lot of money, I'm just I have the last time I looked at it, we were we were toying around with about three hundred fifty. Thousand dollars. Hey, so, do you want to do anything about that round this year? Yeah, yeah. You know, I think you could do it cheaper. I, I, yeah. but I guess so. Having been part of a company that went from printing two and a half billion shirts <laughs> really? yeah, a year to no chart, yeah, no. Yeah. Billion. But the, the one thing about the that the directory having it in your hand, and, yes. And I mean, it's not really being used as much in the airplane. Yes, yes, it's being used in the airplane. But there's other sources of the, of the information, but the pre planning and, and uh, promotion about the state. I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a piece of art. Yeah, I mean, it's a really beautiful publication. I think, you know, this is one place where paper still, I, I, I don't think, I don't, you know, personally, I don't think it's um, as an advantageous to do a, a, a Colorado State app as it would be to work with. Uh, the Tyson yeah. and, the, and, and the four flights and integrate into that. And, yeah, and, and, they, and, and they would do it. You know, yeah, yeah, it would be great. I yeah. think that was always been in the back of my mind. Yeah, that was interesting. Because you had the photographs and you have. I mean, yeah. so that's a that's a, that's a better way to look. Don't stop printing the. Yeah, I think and the that director just love the book, and I think it's also kind of a collector's thing too. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. People go, I've got every single year. You can go back all the way. It's fun to go back and look at an airport and how much developments occurred at these airports. And so it's, it's I love that part of it. Um, I want to close. So one of the other things that, um, you know, like I said, we do video, but I think one of the biggest and most important um, things that we put out from a perspective of really proving to the community, especially people that don't understand airports, is our economic impact study. I think that's a super important uh, tool that I pull out of my pocket every time I talk to somebody that hates an airport and they're like, we should close the damn airport. Well, do you realize how important it is for your community from an economic standpoint for the best? And especially a safety, uh, safety um, uh, side of things too. So I don't usually do this, but I just want to go ahead and do, I've, so, um, I, I've been working on a video um, for the economic impact study. I know it's one year in the making, you know, or actually, 
actually two years now. It, it still needs to be produced and it needs to, and I, um, so I interviewed Kenny and I tried to find three different airports uh, that have different aspects of their business, Colorado Springs being one, Telluride, and then we forget about these airports out on the plains. And so um, I interviewed uh, uh, Randy Hayes at Akron, who has a booming operation for maintenance and, and uh, retrofits and all kinds of stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, so my life kind of got a little bit complicated. I'm a caregiver for my mom now, so, and I don't have any help doing that. So my home, that's really, really, yeah. it's hard. And so a lot of stuff is kind of gone to the wayside and that's slow. Video is really hard to develop in a normal environment. So, um, but I do have something, I think that you're gonna see at the sale um, in your rooms. Um, I'm working on a reel of videos that just constantly run a, a welcome and then, uh, oh, that's cool. And then tap into this, but I just wanted to show, Ken, uh, we'll, we'll show Kenny here what, what he, what he uh, did, and, you know, just a really quick, this is just a teaser for what's to come. Colorado is known for its majestic beauty, its wide open spaces, and places to play. But Colorado is also known for its dynamic system of 76 public use airports, each providing critical aviation services. We also operate the FBO and all the FBO operations. So we sell the fuel, provide all the pilot services, specialized jobs. It provides a lot of quality jobs that are better paying for most small communities. And gateways for Colorado's visitors. More people are discovering Telluride and the Colorado mountains and they want to come back. All of which greatly support and contribute to our local and state economies. People fly in through Colorado Springs Airport, then they stay in local hotels, they rent a car, they eat at our restaurants, they go to the shops downtown. So all that has you know, tremendous economic benefit, not just for the airport itself, but for the larger community too. So that's the teaser there. So oh, really nice. I don't know why it was jagged up there, but uh, so anyway, that's that kind of gives you an idea of really what we're trying to hammer into people's heads when it comes to economic impact of Colorado airports and what they do for our communities. And it's really important to, to tell that story because airports are always seem to be on the chopping block. There, you know, there's always like, some communities are love their airports, but there's a lot like, you know, Boulder has a community that does not like their airport very much. But I love going to those airport those airport events like the Boulder Airport Expo, talking to somebody who's Furious about the airport, and then I get to say, "You remember the 2013 floods? This airport was the, yeah. the location of the largest human airlift since Katrina, and it saved a lot of people um, their butts because of that. This airport right here, and they you tell them that, and they're like, oh, sorry, and then they walk away. Um, but, uh, so, but well, I think I think that's what that's what I like about it, Sean, is that it's almost anymore, and the vision is very much like this today. Is it's kind of you actually, I love talking to people like that because yeah. I look at it as challenge accepted. Exactly. I'm going to make this person love us. Yep. <laughs> Sometimes not really love us, but at least like us. Hate us less. And yeah, they hate, hate us less. less. <laughs> and at least know who we are. Yeah, exactly. So, so I think that's really great. And, and you give us a lot of tools to let us do our job. So very nice work. So that'll dig in. So that'll lead into three different se uh, other segments that dig into each one of those airports of economic. Um, the backgrounds. And what's so cool is that they're all driven by different things. And so that's what's pretty cool. It's not just one thing that drives one airport uh, or all the airports. If they're very, they're very uh, specialized in their, in their communities. And, and, what they do. and three very different parts of Colorado. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So, that's cool. That's really so cool. that's uh, stay tuned and that will be a polished up teaser uh, that you'll see in the sale uh, on your television. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, so. Nice work. 
but thank you. And as long as you're not on that one channel, that's what. This yeah, is. yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that. So that's the other channel. I worked at a hotel in uh, in Orlando when I was like I was 19 years old, and they asked they were doing a commercial for the they were for the hotel they wanted like a well hotel kind of thing, and I'm like, would you mind uh, being in this in this commercial? I'm like, sure. And so I was, I, so I, you know, I, I was the guy that got out of the pool and put the towel on the girl and I was sitting at my desk and typing, you know, this thing was playing in everybody's rooms. And I was also a bellman at that hotel. So I would get all these people, they, they'd walk and they'd see me standing there and be like, are you, you're the guy, are you that guy on the TV? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Everybody was here. <laughs> so, anyway, but yeah, we got fun here. Uh, we like doing what we do. I think every single one of us loves what we do, and I think it shows. And and we love telling that story to people. It's so important. With that, I'm done. Unless you have any questions for me. Anybody have any questions? Good work. Well, all right. Well, before we go to the last one, do you want to hit up the uh, board terms? Yeah. So just real quickly, uh, you know, 40 board members joined us this year. Uh, Chad House being in Old Street's in March and took Amy Miller's spot as Eastern Plains rep. We have two that term out uh, this December. You, Mr. Rampa, and you, Mr. Myers. Uh, you're both in your first term. Chick fulfilled, uh, uh, it's technically his, he's in his first full term, but your previous term was half of uh, uh, no, it was the gentleman that got appointed that passed away before you could oh. serve. Um, Steve, it was going to no. Thanks, yeah. Steve Dukoff. So anyway, uh, you're both eligible for a second term. The governor's policy is continued to say in the sake of the governor's before his two consecutive terms. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, so if you want to pull that up. So we are on a, a three two two rotation. So we had three expired last year. There will be two this year and two the next year. So. Uh, assuming if you're both interested in re-upping and the governor agrees, we'll have some continuity with the board going on the I don't know, man. The pay pays, pays pretty good. I know, right? Where do I get my Corvette? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> That's what you Are you retire. looking for the Hot Wheels version? Yeah. 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 You're always um, asking. Yeah. Dave, I was going to say, are you saying that is, okay, so he's finishing out, Chaz is finishing out the term. No, so uh, so he's so, done it just next year. Yeah, so because um, he'll finish Amy's turn first. Yeah. Yeah. Again, Chick uh, Chick uh, took Steve Dukoff uh, was appointed in December. Yeah, I think yeah, he passed yeah. away in January or February of the subsequent year, and then you were appointed for a partial term. And as far as I know, and I'll confirm this, the governor's office that says two full terms, a partial term doesn't necessarily count. So I will verify that with the boards and commissions office. Chick, if you're interested in re-upping, I see a thumbs up. I love it. Does that go to a vote? I guess. It was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I try to remember, I should know this, if uh, reappointments go back to Senate and confirmation. Yes. Yeah, 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 very sure. Yeah, okay. So. Do we have to, assuming Chick and I are interested, um, do we have to? Do another application. I don't think you have to do okay. another application. You'll just probably have to just line it up. Of interest. So I'll, I'll confirm that with both of you because we'll start getting into that at the end of September is when we start doing that with the board's office to have the curve. So I'm glad to know you're both interested in continuing. So uh, with that, the other thing I think that kind of goes with it is always we've always talked about is uh, the governor's office is really, really inclusive uh, with involving me and the board chair and other people as we select the board members. And that's been great. Uh, they've continued the philosophy of, well, we appoint them, but you've got to work with them. And I'll be honest with you, we've had applicants that have an agenda, that have an axe to grind. And um, I'm pretty frank about what I know about that and say, here's my feedback. But um, Governor Polis's administration has been fantastic about including that. And so um, with that, I would say, you know, we do occasionally have people move on or they take a job that disqualifies them from being uh, in their position. You know, like if Kenny moved to the Eastern Plains, he got the he does a, a word. Um, so that's I not happening. All, I know, good. Oh, good. <laughs> but I ask all of you to think about people out there that in aviation, not aviation, it would be great candidates because I'd like to have folks throw their application in and keep them on file. And if we do have a uh, have a resignation or a midterm vacancy, we have some people to go to and somebody out more quickly. But uh, we've been blessed, at least in my tenure, and I think even before my engagement with the board, awesome board members without usually without fail. Okay.
engaged, broad based, smart, you know, innovative, you know, got a great thing. So maybe think about people you know out there in your respective worlds that would be great. You know, send them to me. I can meet with them, talk to them about the you can talk with them about the commitment, you know, better than I do. And I'll send them the link to apply. It's very nonpartisan, not one like some boards of the state. This one is uh, it's not, not appointed based on that, at least under the current governor, and that's fantastic too. So that's well, it's nice that the uh, governor really should allow you to help develop your own board. It's great. I mean, you know, support you and your input, I should say. We've only had one instance when a new governor came in, kicked anyone that had the wrong letter behind their name off the board, and reappointed. And that was in 2008. Really? Yep. That wasn't just with aeronautics, though. That was with. No, yeah, that was. Is that racist? Yeah. No kidding. There's not been one decision made on this board that's been ever. Seriously, there's no. Yeah, that's why. You know what? Honestly, that's what I think. It just says aviation is very much a. It's kind of the Switzerland. It's a nonpartisan. Everybody, transportation to me, and and aviation in particular. You know. Very fine. good. Well, challenge. Okay, cool. so should we hit the uh, final, uh, just an open cab staff discussion, uh, thoughts of board members or staff? Uh, do you all find this anything that we is, can do? Is the format okay? Yeah. I mean, we kind of created this a few years ago and we've been modifying a little bit, but is this valuable? Is it too much, too little? No, uh, it breaks, wrong format. I, I just say, as a new board member, I, you know, this is hugely valuable to me. It's, I, 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 uh, Boy, am I going to talk a lot more than I have in other places. <laughs> uh, it, no, it's, it's really, um, you know, as you come on, you try to read everything you can and get, get some background, but it's really good to get in a room with the team and, uh, and do this. So I'm grateful for it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm feeling the excitement and it's very entertaining. <laughs> you know, being my first, almost pretty much my first, well, aside from being a Telluride with you guys. Yeah. Um, is very entertaining, very, like you said, educational. Um, and like he said, like I've been to board meetings where I do all the talking. It's nice to just sit here and go, okay, I'm soaking it all in. I'm getting it. Yep. You're doing great. We're a very yeah. boring group of people. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, this is fun. Yeah. Well, this is the first year we did it in this format. Last year we tried, to, we did the, the workshop and then the board meeting after, and we ended up cramming too much in. It was too rushed. It's too long of a day. So I appreciate y'all coming back tomorrow. Yep. And, Doing a regular board meeting. Um, Jazz will be remote and here tomorrow. Like so he's Kent Ch to Chaz will yeah. be remote so tomorrow? Be okay. Which is cool. So I uh, can't look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I don't expect tomorrow's meeting will take very long. We cover a lot of ground today. Um, and we have three action items, but we'll probably be getting out an hour and a half with that tomorrow. Bill Payne is not giving his report. I'm doing it. Okay, okay. we'll be done. So, <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's our chance. <laughs> um, Kent, did you have anything you'd like to add or any concerns or anything else? I saw your clapping earlier. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. No, it's, uh, it's just been a, a great day, terrific discussion, uh, very productive um, start to finish. And uh, I'll just look forward to hearing more about the hot tub. <laughs> hot tub slash this one. Thanks, man. <laughs> Appreciate we'll it. have to come up with a very clever euphemism. <laughs> Mark? Yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I really enjoyed the, I enjoyed, enjoyed the day, but I enjoyed talk, hearing what you're doing, John. I think the communication side is, um, it's challenging because it's a both, um, it's where quantity and quality align, and that's usually hard to do. So I kind of fall back in that same comment about head about the facilities, which is, um, and you made a great comment about doing those things that are value add and the mundane things, trying to find somebody else to do them or, or, or not do them at all. But um, it's a place not to be penny wise and pound foolish as it relates to tools and outside expertise. You know, so um, that's why Sean's finally getting new fancy camera set up this year to replace yeah. his 10 year old can. Yeah, that's <laughs> old, yeah. I, I do, I do think that you know, part of our audience, um, are, um, is the public and and officials in communities uh, that don't really understand the value of airports and the importance of the contribution uh, that aviation has to uh, to their community and uh, the videos are kind of timeless if you know if they're done that way and you have them and so that's a that's a great tool because uh, 
you know, the world where the world is becoming visual and visual learners. Um, and so, you know, doing those um, is really important. But, um, but as we, you know, and that's why, again, I think the, in some cases, the paper publication um, is really important, the economic impact study and, and, and making that visual and, um, and electronic and digital um, is, is a really useful tool, especially to the, to the press. I think we have a lot of work still to do to educate um, the state and, and those around the state or outside the state too uh, about what a great system we have and, and a great division, a nice division that's, uh, that's proactive. And then the last thing I'll say is that I think that as we talked about leaning over the tips of our skis a bit and things like um, um, elect, uh, electric aviation and hydrogen and, and what's coming um, is uh, benefits everybody and it's yeah. and this is a place as you said Chip, that we we lead the country and, and, uh, and, and we have a division and staff that really gets that and so there's some real opportunities um, and some you know not all those things will come to fruition but there's a whole bunch of it that we do know. And we need to help um, our constituents be ready for that, and um, and we can be, you know, the test bed for for some of that. And I think that, and everybody, yeah, everybody, not everybody, but I think lots of people like, you know, love want want to come to Colorado. So, yeah. um, as I said, I've spent time here just recently with AOPA and Gamma and um, and MBAA and others, and and uh, get to talk about the great things that are happening here, um, and so I'm. Proud to be a part of this board and part of the state. So thank you. It was a great, great day, by the way. Great to get meeting for Mark to come through during one of our board meetings. I know they're busy folks. And Pete would there. love to do it, yeah, and, and Mark would too. That'd be great. Uh, but Pete would do get an RV. So get an RV. Yeah, yeah. Fun. yeah. You can get everywhere in his gamma credit card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that hot tub and a keg. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said. Well said. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, Chick. This is a very comprehensive and an excellent format because it gave, first of all, you gave us a thorough document to evaluate and proceed. It also gave us the ability to interact like we do not normally have. You know, most meetings are, yep, check, 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 and we're done. Uh, this one has been very, you know, comprehensive and you've gotten a lot of feedback, but you've also given us a lot. Yeah don't normally get and I appreciate that very much I think this is valuable I would commend to you that we continue this one is a mid-year check-in I don't want to add more work to anybody's plate but if, is there a mid-year like smaller version of a mini check-in like this worthwhile six months from now <clears throat> you have my, to answer that now but well yeah I mean my, my opinion is, is I think you know because we're all investing a lot of time for this all-day workshop and you know I'm George I'm always a, amazed that you're here so because you're very busy i'm sure at a big organization like that but i mean nice all of us but, but all of us to, to to do this i think we're all in and and we'll, we'll put everything we can into this and i think we can we're, we're kind of cruising along here we can have a little check-ins in our regular board meetings and what have you so uh, or uh, you you always make yourself available to us for phone calls or questions and the staff is you're all marching to the same beat so and I echo everything that, that the board said, as I think it's uh, wonderful. Um, I, I'm very proud to be on this board. It's, it's just an extreme honor for me and my career. Um, and um, I, I will echo what Mark said, too. It's, I, I really believe that the core of our job is to make sure that you guys have the tools to do your job. Yes. And um, other than that, and how that's managed every day, I think you have a fantastic director that uh, helps, yeah. helps filter that through. And, and, um, and I think you're also in an environment where, um, and I'm guilty of this, is you, come, you have that ability to come up with some creative ideas and sometimes they might get some good laughs, but I think that's how you really uh, spawn discussion, mm -hmm. plant that seed. And, and, uh, and I think it's something that this board has had uh, remarkable for probably well over 20 years now and really looking and being a leader you know, I always say I want to be the best. I want to be the first. That's how it is where I'm at my airport. I always say that I want to be the first to do it. I want to be the first to get SAF. You know, I didn't care what it took, but I was going to do it. 
So we believe in it and you're all in and we're all kind of supportive of you. And I would just encourage you to, to uh, I think you're amongst friends and supportive colleagues that you should be able to uh, express those ideas and you shouldn't be stepped on by somebody else. Now we might give you a hard time, but just be prepared for that. And I think that's a good, healthy environment to be in. So, so last question I would say um, is uh, what can we do to serve you better? Y'all are great. I mean, uh, you know, you're engaged. I'll be honest with you. We have had board members that have not been consistent attendees in the past. You're not among any of those, but you know, we, we only have six meetings, and I think you know, y'all play a valuable role. So showing up, weighing in, and even if it's remotely, that's cool. We get it today's day and age, but you know, um, that's been fantastic. Keep that up. We really look forward to that. And I also love the fact that I, you know, there's only been one time since I've been here where a board member came on. With some sort of agenda to get some kind of an axe to grind. And I've ever, ever, and that person didn't last very long for the obvious reason. But that's the cool thing about this board and every board that I've seen is that everybody is, we're all on the same team here. We're all here trying to make Colorado uh, aviation and our airport system awesome and try new things. And we're, that's what's so cool about this. I love being a part of this team and, and a director who also allows you to be creatively. You know, go out there and try some stuff, and then uh, allows you to work just out of your, your way, and then you can just get your stuff done. So, yeah, and you all are just that's yeah, great. As long as we're all focused on making Colorado uh, aviation amazing, we're going to do completely awesome things. So, I have, I have one question. So, when you were all new to the board, we attempted, and I don't know how much did we get everybody this last year with the with all the COVID stuff, but we usually attempt after you're appointed to. Have you come in and we do an aeronautics 101 so we, we try to yeah, teach everybody yeah. about what we do and then you have six months till we have this meeting yeah so you've got your boots on the ground for a while before we can throw you into this whole day is that still is that beneficial yes to do the 101 at first to kind of get you up to speed and then give you some time to formulate your questions before you, okay especially around you know the, the financial side of that which yeah. Is, yeah. so you know, today was a great reinforcement to, to that. I mean, we got to, you know, really see, because, uh, you know, about the same time we got the 101, we voted on some, so, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so, you know, at least for me, it was kind of like, well, I'm not, you know, I'm still looking at my cheat sheet to figure out what, yep. you know, those different categories today. But this would have been very overwhelming for your first meeting, too. You would oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. no, 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 it's, it, you know, so. Okay. Yeah, you have but a few meetings under your belt. You know, okay. I think that's great. And just kind of ease into it so everybody can hit the ground running Perfect. on a day like today. So yeah. a very productive. So, well, I think with that, does yeah. anybody else have anything they no, want to say? No, just one thing we didn't cover. And if you look at it in your packet, we do a division calendar that kind of reminds us of things we have to do every month. It's everything from fire extinguisher inspections to uh, board meetings. And so if you want to see what's going on, kind of how we track it, <laughs> one thing I will plan to see with you, mostly, Mr. Chair, is October is when you'll be my annual performance review and then we get uh, one from CDOT director in April. So okay. that informs that. So we have some standard forms that Jeff Boris put together that I'll send to you and you can modify those or you better do it however you choose. Do I need to send something out probably in the next month or so? I would say for the October. So we're ready for the October. Typically how Jeff did it, but maybe reach out to Robert. I'm really not sure what the behind the scenes. I'm trying to remember. It seemed like it was about now. Yeah, but you were on some of those. So anyway, that yeah. that's usually an executive session at the end of the October. Okay, very good. And you know the thing that put the the day over the top was ice cream at two o'clock. Yeah, that was yeah that's that's right. Right. there's some left. Cream. There's Time. more ice cream. So I will tell you the last year. Thank you for lunch. For yeah. those of you that weren't here last year, we did my back issues and the turn of the boxes. Well, Hey, all I can say is keep it coming, all right? Yeah. You gotta keep this guy sharp. Yeah, no, that's it's, 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 Oh, that's great. Well, I think we're done.